units. We do understand that the report projects development only to 2040. However, the issues we are concerned about go well beyond 2040 and need to be addressed. I want to start by acknowledging that the report provides a significant step forward by, in fact, outlining a plan that includes many of the components advanced by the Strata Leaseholder Society, representing over 70% of leasehold owners. Use it, for example, by using infill to populate open spaces, maintaining the income mix of the neighborhood, maintaining the character of the neighborhood, particularly by avoiding high towers, with one notable exception. We also appreciate the city's commitment to enter into discussions around lease extensions. Other speakers, more knowledgeable than I am, have spoken eloquently about alternative approaches to the development plan, as well as pointing out some of its major deficiencies. So I'll stick to what I know best, which is the Lagoons Complex. First of all, it is a highly attractive destination for thousands of visitors every day. They enjoy the attractive landscaping and the low setback buildings that keep things on a human scale. Nearby restaurants are available for coffee or lunch, and visitors can enjoy it on the seawall seating or nearby parks. Why would the city want to substantially change or even eliminate an area that has become a, a major tourist attraction year-round? Some of our owners have lived here since our complex was first opened 36 years ago, and many more have lived here for 20 to 30 years. Owners have invested heavily in maintaining their buildings and grounds. They want to stay here for the long term and have approved strata budgets that will ensure a viable future for their homes. As an example, the lagoons were, uh, consist of 89 units of both freestanding three-story townhouses and condos and two four-story buildings. We include in our annual budget close to $300,000 in building and grounds maintenance expenditures and another 200000 annually as installments towards capital projects such as roof renewal, building envelope upgrading, and elevator replacement. <clears throat> Just recently, we completed a $350,000 project to modernize and upgrade all of our common spaces. Many owners have upgraded and modernized their own individual units in the expectation that they will continue to live here. But in order to continue to invest, owners need assurances from the city that there is a future for the Lagoons Complex and that leases will be renewed. Some owners, as you know, uh, have encountered significant hardships in renewing mortgages, too short a period left on the lease, and where necessary, selling their properties. Owners accept a proposal of more densification using the many open spaces that are currently available. This provides opportunities to accommodate more young people, lower income families, and supportive housing for seniors. What the city needs to understand is that strata leaseholders see a future for this area and the current strata within it that goes well beyond 2040. We want the city to understand and agree that this is a neighborhood worth keeping. I believe the city knows that there's been deep frustration with the, with the process of, of obtaining a commitment regarding lease renewal. The Strata Leaseholder Society Bargaining Agency and its parent organization, Replan, have been meeting with city politicians and staff on this issue for over 10 years. Tremendous efforts have been taken by Replan and SLS to advance facts, ideas, principles, and options that will work for both the city and the owners. And today there's been little progress towards a solution. So we're pleased to learn that there are talks scheduled to negotiate these extensions, and we look forward to seeing concrete and measurable outcomes. Thanks very much for giving me the time to speak. Uh, and thank you very much. Um, you were very clear in your comments, um, and I don't see any questions for you, but thank you so much for, for um, joining us here. Moving on to speaker 49, Evan Alderson. Uh, can you hear me? Yes. Is Thank you. Yeah, uh, we can hear you. Go ahead up to five minutes. Thank you. Uh, uh, Councillor Carr and Councillors, uh, uh, thank you for this opportunity to speak to you today from the unceded territory of the Squamish, Musqueam, and Tsleil-Waututh peoples. My name is Evan Alderson. I'm a longtime resident of Vancouver. <clears throat> 
And in recent years, my, my wife and I have lived on freehold land in Falls Creek South. I think you should hear more than you have so far from a neighboring freehold perspective. My position on the conceptual plan before you is really a plea. Please do not let this conceptual plan become a prescriptive template for the community planning process to come. Instead, establish a genuinely open and collaborative process that allows for creative approaches and more imaginative solutions. I should explain just a little bit more about my own situation. Close to a decade ago, Vancouver's real estate gods made it possible for my wife and I to move into a very nice condo along Spyglass. I soon discovered that much of its value for me lies in the fact that it is really part of a thriving community, which includes the leasehold properties next door. Over time, I came to appreciate how much the remarkable social cohesion of this neighborhood depends upon its easy mix of varied age, ages and income levels, and further to understand how much of that spirit of community arises from its initial design. So I feel myself to be very much a part of this vibrant community and have tried to contribute to it, even though I remain something of an outsider in that I don't share the immediate anxieties around lease ends and possible dislocation that burden many of my friends. When I first looked at the conceptual plan, my heart sank a little. So that's the future, I thought. I wasn't shocked by the proposed density because I agree with my neighbors that a sharp increase in density is both needed and appropriate. But so much of what makes this, plan spe this place special seemed somehow to be missing. Then as I read the plan more closely, and as especially as I listened to the very able staff presentation on Thursday, I began to understand it a little better. I think it is a serious and responsible attempt to solve the Rubik's Cube of competing pressures the city faces. I also appreciate assurances that it would be just the beginning of an extensive planning process. To be sure, there are some eerie silences on some matters, some disputable facts, and an understandable but frustrating reticence about the financial drivers be be behind the whole puzzle. But on its own terms and within its own framework, it makes good sense. And that's the problem. It is so full of good sense that it lacks vision. It is so determined to put the pieces together in a way that could work within the confines of how development usually works in Vancouver that it misses the spirit of place. And in so doing, it narrows the real opportunity before council, both to carry forward and to reinvent. I learned a lot on Thursday and trust that you did too. I'm glad now that I missed my chance to speak then because it gave me an opportunity to reflect and even develop a little hope. But I have still struggled to express my sense of what's now at stake for council this year. Then a neighbor offered help. As one part of my community involvement, I helped to edit our little community newsletter between the bridges. Along with current news, we publish occasional historical pieces about how this neighborhood came to be and what was here before, including the indigenous presence. On Saturday, my good friend and freehold neighbor, Wes Knapp, sent me a draft of his submission for, for the coming issue. It will come out on Friday. You might want to take a look at it. His story is about False Creek and a former mayor who was appalled at the stinking mess it had become from its industrial use. And if and you could, I'm sorry, idea. Evan, if you could just wrap up. Yes. Yeah, I'm sorry, that you're, you're just running over time sorry. right now. If Although I, I, okay, I, will, okay. I will read the article. Okay, thank you. Uh, 
So my plan is this. Please do not, I will, I will, I will skip that point. Yes. Please yeah. remain open to the possibility that stepping back and opening the process to genuinely collaboration with my amazing neighbors, you will take, please take leadership in carrying forward the legacy of False Creek South and into thank a better future. You. Thank you so much. Yes, you've, you've made your, your points very clearly. Thank you so much. Speaker 50, council has withdrawn. Speaker 51 is Robin, Robin for members. Can you hear me? Just a second, there's Hello. a bit of noise on the line. Just one second. I think a speaker was just leaving. Uh, clerks, okay. is that what's happening there? Okay, did you wanna try again, Robin, for Matt? Okay, can you hear me now? Yes, that's good and clear. You have up to five minutes, okay. go ahead. Great, thank you very much. Good afternoon, counselors. I'm just gonna close this, sorry. So, thank you for your time today. Uh, my name, as you introduced me, is Robin Vermette. I'll begin by saying I've appreciated hearing council's responses and questions to the speakers from the previous meeting, and thank the city staff for their work that went into the report. And, of course, I'm grateful to the endless work, replan, and the False Creek South Neighborhood Association has contributed over the years to future of False Creek South. I've lived in Creekview Co-op, situated in False Creek, on the traditional territory of the Muslim Squamish and Tulewitos people for many years. I've raised my children in this neighborhood. They went to school, played, and developed lifelong friendships in this neighborhood. Today, Robin, we have excuse over me, Robin. Yeah. Yes, I'm sorry. It's yeah. um, it's Chair Carr here. If you, if there are any papers or anything that you're fiddling with on your desk, or you know, there's some, there's some other oh. sound that's coming through that's making it hard to hard to hear you. Okay, can you hear me now? Oh, that's so much better. Go ahead. Okay. All right. Sorry. I was outside. <clears throat> I've stepped inside. All right. Um, I'll just start with the previous paragraph. I've raised my children in this neighborhood. They went to school, played, and developed lifelong friendships in this neighborhood. Today, we have over 230 people living at Creekview, including over 40 children who we hope will have the opportunity to develop and experience relationships and connections that our stable and cohesive neighborhood has provided over the years. Just over a week ago, I received the report presented October 21st by the Real Estate and Facilities Management, GM and DCM, and I was left with an absurdly short amount of time to thoroughly review and respond to the report by your meeting of October 21st. Whereas I understand there were a number of in-camera sessions prior to the release of the report. And to add to my concern, Creekview received an email October 18th, near days before the council meeting, from the manager of arts, culture, and community services stating that they'd like to meet with co-ops who have leases expiring, quote, in and around the contemplated first phase of this redevelopment, unquote. Do we meet? Knowing the department manager would be entering lease negotiations on an assumption our building will be history in the near future? So where do I begin? I'll just say, state a few of my points. Would this council support demolishing viable co-op and nonprofit housing and unsettling, displacing and segregating residents, upwards of a thousand people, from their current locations in order to accommodate those who can afford to pay much higher amounts for their housing? How is this equitable? How would this fit with the Housing Vancouver strategy? The city's provisional resident protection and retention plan is purported to be a safety net in the event of displacement. As the plan states, it is provisional, subject to clarity of the False Creek South planning program and lease negotiations. No safety net guarantees there. The report states that replacing well-maintained existing co-op and other non-market homes is dependent on securing provincial or federal funding. This begs the question, what is the REFM backup plan if senior, man senior government funding does not come through? Shouldn't we know in advance? More uncertainty. This report raises many questions and to be sure is vague in many areas. In view of this, I suggest council pause here receive the information and take the time necessary to consider the questions asked here today and last meeting. 
actively engage the stakeholders, community, and Musqueam, Squamish, and Tsleil-Waututh nations on whose traditional lands we reside. Explore options and alternatives. Include planning, urban design, and sustainability. Strike a working group. Balance the process. Collaborate. Will a colonial system response to community consultation be the approach? Ask us what we want and tell us what we'll have? I hope not. In what way will council and the city come to this work? I'm looking forward to a bright future of False Creek South neighborhood. Thank you. And thank you very much. Um, those, those points were well made. Thank you. Um, have a good evening. Uh, speaker 52, Keith Jones. Hello. Hello, yes, we can hear you clearly, go Hi. ahead. Hi, my name is Keith Jones. I live in Alder Bay Co-op in False Creek South, and I'm speaking against this report as it stands now. Uh, first, I'd like to thank the council and staff for all their hard work during these difficult times, uh, and for this opportunity to speak to the future of False Creek South. I am a kindergarten teacher who is very grateful that I can live and work in Vancouver, and in particular, the False Creek South neighborhood. In my classroom, we often talk about co-creating community. Um, community is more than a collection of people in a place, just as it's more than the number of students in the classroom. Community doesn't automatically happen in the classroom, and it does not just happen in the neighborhood. It is created intentionally. It is created by the design of the classroom and the attention, intention of the members of the classroom. It is the conscious creation of a group of people where everyone feels valued. I am concerned about my community in Falls Creek. When it was created, it was a dream, a hope, an idea by a group of people. And while many thought it was foolish and not very practical, others envisioned the use of city-owned land to create a mix of incomes that would create a robust neighborhood. And that vision led to a community that is internationally recognized and visited by planners from all over the world and people. What is interesting and unique is how the design drives the creation of the community. The planning is intentional in creating community. The buildings, the pathways, the lack of automobiles, and the conscious mix of income levels is designed to help build community. And it is that mix built into our community that is part of the glue. Let me be clear, I am in favor of development, especially from a housing cooperative perspective. But I'm concerned that this development comes solely on, on the backs of the nonprofits and the cooperative housing by solely choosing social housing and cooperative housing to be demolished and moved to the edges of Falls Creek South. Intentional community is destroyed. It will create a segregation of community which values one part over the other and leads to have and have nots. We need to do better better in how we build with the intention of mixing classes, and better in design with an intention to create community. Just as my classroom is a mix of students from various households, different backgrounds, different incomes, our classroom community is created when we start with the intention to build community together. So please receive this report for information only while you continue with the lease extension and you direct the planning department to seek a transparent community planning process envisioning a future that includes a true integrated mix of co-ops, nonprofits, and market housing. Thank you for your time. Uh, thank you for your presentation. Very clear. Um, there are no questions, so thank you so much again. Speaker 53, Cynthia Crampton. Ha Hello, thank you for the opportunity to speak to uh, the Mayor, you and the Council. Um, my name is Cynthia Crampton, and I moved in on December the 1st, 1979, along with uh, my two sons, and we were so happy to be here and to know that the, the councillor and um, uh, mayor of the time, Mayor Art Phillips, so supported South Falls Creek, so much so that um, Mayor Phillips act and his family actually lived in South uh, Falls Creek. It was always great to see him on the seawall. And many of us didn't know anything much about um, South Falls Creek, and, um, but we cer certainly learned how to um, negotiate 
and to become a community, which we are. We are in a very close-knit community here. And like the previous speaker, I'm not against density. I don't think anybody is. But at the expense of having to bulldoze our, our homes down is just unthinkable. Uh, we lived through the, um, the leaky condo situation. We had to completely do a renovation then. Um, and uh, we lived under tops for two years. And I never heard anybody moaning and groaning about it. And we, nobody moved out during that time. It was not easy living at that time, as you can imagine. And um, nobody faulted on their um, housing charges. We just thought this was something that had to be done, and we went along with it. Uh, I remember one day uh, we were going to have somebody to come and see how many of the units needed to be remedied, remedied and they, they were going to put green uh, marks on each of the walls that needed to be remedied. I went to work, I came home, and it looked as though it was a St. Patrick's Day here. There were green marks over every building. Everything had to be taken down and, and uh, rain screened properly. But we lived through it. And during the pandemic, many of us have uh, roofs that we can go up on, and I do. And I would go up on the roof, and one of my neighbors would come up on the, um, on the fire escape so that we could have a socially distanced visit. So it was lovely to feel connected with our neighbors all through this pan pandemic. And for me, I know it's really helped my mental health during this time. So not against density, but please don't do it at the expense of bulldozing our houses. They are not slums. They are well maintained. Thank you again for the opportunity to, uh, to speak to you. And thank you for taking the time to speak to us. Um, that was very clear. Um, there are no questions, but uh, thank you again. Speaker 54, Sean Douglas Simpson. Hello. Yes, we can hear you. Go ahead, up to five minutes. Hello, Council. Thank you for your time. My name is Sean Sorensen, and I'm the chair of Creekview Housing Cooperative in False Creek South, and I reside on the unceded land of the Musqueam, Squamish, and Tsleil-Waututh peoples. I would like to state that I oppose the plan. With upwards of 53 people speaking before me and 100 speaking after, I've been pondering what can I say today that will stick with you? What can I say that is worth five minutes of everyone's time? and will help False Creek South move forward to create more density and opportunity for other residents of this city so they can access this community. So here it is. I'm requesting that we have someone at the table for this planning. This conceptual planning has already gone too far without someone representing the residents of the people who reside on the land. After Tom Armstrong spoke on Thursday, councillors were able to ask him questions of which he provided sound and educated responses. This can no longer be led by real estate. The foundation of a city plan should not be led by real estate. The real estate industry has brought the residents of this city to its knees. You know, my gut is, is pro projecting to me that the city staff have a feeling that the members of this community just don't quite understand how real estate works and how assets work and, and that certain land will need to be sold to ensure that fiscal responsibility is upheld as landowners. Firstly, it's really hard for the citizens of Vancouver to understand it when everything is happening in camera. We elect public officials as representatives of us to ensure our best interests are taken care of in all decisions. And here we are today advocating for our community, telling you, the public officials that we elected, exactly what our best interests are. Secondly, let us have that professional at the table that, that does understand most of us volunteer to run our cooperatives and stratas, and we are professionals in our own vocations and industries. We do not know how the inner workings of real estate and city development work in the city, but we can recognize the dismantling of False Creek South in this conceptual plan. Receive this plan as a report for the information while not delaying lease extensions. I spoke to Council in July as you made amendments and a decision that you were proud of regarding the framework of cooperative housing leases. I spoke that day as an emotional father with fear about where my family would live in the future. Today, I'm returning as a frustrated father who honestly feels betrayed by the staff of the city. 
It is shown with this report that there is no priority on community and truly affordable housing in Vancouver. Placed nicely within that framework in July was the language around phased large site redevelopment, such as False Creek South. Co-ops on leased city land within the area will have a renewal and redevelopment schedule determined when the city's large site redevelopment plan proposes to redevelop the city-owned sites. As a community, we expect that when a report says the city will proactively engage the co-op a potential partner in the redevelopment process, that they mean it, not afterwards. This pre-plan should be a thorough city plan, which is developed in collaboration with the people who currently live on the land. I want to quickly bring you back to the impactful speeches of residents of Three Sisters Cooperative who spoke in July about how colonial these imposed decisions on city-owned land feel to them. How has the city, which prides itself on being a partner in reconciliation, continued the same patterns of behavior? How can the self-proclaimed greenest city even consider premature demolition of viable and well-maintained housing? To base a plan on near-term lease ending over environmentally-based planning is an absurd approach. We're in a climate crisis. There's undeveloped land on the east side of Canby, which has never had any plan shown past 2040. And I feel it's fair to say that we are under the impression that empty land will remain empty while our homes will be demolished. There are more glaring omissions from the real estate plan. I don't even have time to cover them all. Education, our child is on a wait list for Falls Creek Elementary this year. This year, And this plan speaks on doubling the density and then starts considering what to do about schools after 2036. It also has schools moving to a, the school moving to a major roadway. It talks about increasing car access to the neighborhood. I don't know what Green City is talking about increasing car access. Add lights to the existing road if the justification is just more traffic control. He's engaged with the residents here. The power is in the people of the city. This plan shows exactly what happens when a city can dictate to its residents what is happening. This plan is colonialism. Please break the cycle. Thank you. And um, thank you very much. Um, that was very clear. Uh, there are no questions for you, but thank you again for speaking to council. Um, next, oh, the next speaker, 55, has withdrawn. So uh, we are on to speaker 56, Graham Garba, who is here in person. Welcome, Mr. Gar uh, Garba. This opportunity to speak in person. I'm Graham McGarver, longtime resident of False Creek South and chair of Replan's Community Planning Group. We would love to recommend that Council receive this long awaited report as the basis for initiating community planning and the refinement of the business plan and governance model for these lands. But first, I need to give you a, a poem. The property development process always comes down to which promises are you having to break? We can see the good points in your plan. Among the crowd thronging the dockside, your considerate handkerchief is waving farewell in its embrace of a new world closer to the cruelty the market imposes upon those who venture to seek its favor. But we see other ways to safe harbor, and we see these not because we are superior, but because we live this every day while you have other things to do with your time and family. The fog is starting to clear. This is a good time to call a truce while we can still bridge trenches whose mud we wish we did not know so well. We envision something better than this, but we are not waving the white flag of surrender. Instead, we are fighting hard to save your promises. Consider that our manifesto of assertive collaboration. In front of us is an asset management proposition developed in camera. It is inevitably incomplete despite any best efforts. That is a fact, not a problem. Flexibility is essential for this outline plan to mature into deliverable implementation, particularly one charged to put public objectives beyond financial gain. The severance of these lands from the honey trap of the private market is a singular opportunity. 
The leverage of the existing community's embedded affordability and not-for-profit development models are not to be overlooked, as emphasized by Tom Armstrong. You saw from the start in Richard Evans' presentation that on our side of the wall, Replan has been working hard also. If we squint hard, there is much here we could accept as a starting point for meaningful regeneration and expansion of our community. But the devil is in the clarity of that squint past the waving red flags. It is clear the city is in charge, has ultimate power. How to exercise that power is what is most important. The city is a two-headed beast here, and each must speak to the other and the community out loud, clear, and transparent. Innovative leadership is needed, respectfully open, not tightly bound with sec secrecy and control. Top of mind are the lives lived here and to be lived here in community. Their mornings, noons, and nights for decades to come in its light and shade and shared with the people in its pathways. That is the purpose of this place. It is not a pigeonhole for numbers. Beyond the dry wording of this or any other council motion is the spirit of will that shapes the ongoing work. We can work together, but a reset is required. Outreach is needed to rebuild the trust the last decade of churn has sadly eroded. Trust is the asset you must empower to dismantle the walls of fear. This is your challenge. So receive this report as valuable information and open it up fully to the questions you are hearing, especially the tough ones. We are all fighting hard to save the promises. Be the flag bearers who deliver a legacy that will make us all proud. Thank you. That was well-timed. And if you want to stay at the podium, there are councillors with questions for you. Uh, first, Councillor... Weep, go ahead, Councillor Weep, up to three minutes. Yeah, thanks for coming, Graham. And we've sat on a board together. So I'm wondering why you think we should receive it for information instead of embedding the spirit of the community into the report. The, um, the fact is we can debate the definite meanings of words, advance, refine, receive for information. I think the clear point, as was made, um, by uh, the staff and, and consultant is that this is something now to be refined to, refined, to be pulled apart, and it will inevitably look different. And I think I'm dealing, and we're all hearing a lot of the concern from people who don't have the advantage, perhaps I have, of having been through some of these processes and known some of the sometimes seemingly illogical steps and, and blind alleys one goes down. So. I don't want to diminish the hard work that's in this report, and uh, it has a, a basis of, of why everything is where it is, and we should now debate that. The concern is that it be seen as adopted and that everything then only rushes through to approve this plan. In other words, the planning department is basically given, here's the developer's position and this is what it must be. So that's why we want to, to receive it from information. Very respectfully, it's a lot of hard and complex work. Appreciate that answer, thank you. Great, thank you, Councillor Weeb. Uh, Councillor Hardwick, up to three minutes. I had the same question, but I'm gonna come at it from a little bit of a different direction. Um, I think what you're saying is the starting point, the reason to receive as opposed to adopt it at this stage is because it requires a reset in its vision. And uh, because as we know, perception becomes reality. This is adopted, then we can, it continues, it continues to emerge as a, almost a self-organizing system going in that direction. Um, I'm trying to get to the heart of, of really what the issue is here with this report and how we're going forward. Am I heading in the right direction in my interpretation? 
I believe you are, as long as you're also remembering what we saw from Richard Evans and heard from Tom Armstrong about this loss of valuable ammunition to propel this thing forward that hasn't had a chance to come to the table yet. And that is part of what we are, we are asking. But is it a cart, versus, a cart before the horse situation? I, I think it's important that people be really able to wrap their heads around the semantics of this. And, and that's why you have to receive a poem. Because it is in that very difficult thing, and, and you know, in these modes of, of debate, it's hard to get to, to the finessing of it. That's why my personal focus there is on, let's create a climate of trust around this discussion. I personally know something of why things have to be in camera, and it seems like a long time and irrational to people. You know, and, and those are the people I am accountable to. I'm responsible to them. So I'm, I'm at that. What do you see in just short form as the legacy that needs to be uh, built on here? I see it a bit like when we were trying to figure out if children could live in eight-story buildings when we were planning International Village. So what we actually did is picked up Old Bay Co-op and stuck it on top of what's now Tinseltown and said, there, that's an eight-story building, and it became family housing. So we can look at a denser version of something that has people feeling the social connection they have to this place. We have to deal with the form of buildings, courtyards, overlook, entrances, thresholds, how sunlight plays into a place and shade. And it will be whatever the numbers are. I mean, we gulp at the density numbers, but yes, they're recognizable. So, you know, with good spirit, we will go forward with that. That's the legacy, that it will feel quite intensively the same. The things to be the same, they have to change. And that is the pivot point that we're at now. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, uh, Councillor Hardwick, and thank you very much. Um, those are, oh, wait, you actually don't leave the podium. Someone, Councillor Fry, just jumped on the list. Councillor Fry, over to you for up to three minutes of questions. Yeah, and, and thanks for joining us in person, Mr. McGarva. I appreciate it. Um, I'm, I'm trying to unpack because I, I think that, you know, I, I think what I'm hearing is you appreciate this sort of general direction, but but it needs more intentional planning. And and I'm I'm curious if you see this current kind of REFM construct as as actually presupposing the ability to do that planning. And if, if you're worried at all that sort of kicking this farther down the road may lead to outcomes that are perhaps less desirable by the community. We're certainly hearing all sorts of different opinions kind of in, in different constructs and letters. And again, people who are objecting to developing along the berm at all and want to keep that limited, thereby presumably forcing the development potential back into the kind of interior part of it. I'm just curious if you worry at all about... The... Um the REFM plan seems to bear out a lot of the things from where we left off the discussions with city planning early in 2018, where we had started to say, let's bring the roads through, let's consider use the very eastern edge of, of the berm, maybe where uh, Mobley comes in, in a very 1970s move in between the two blocks, we could open Heather and Willow and have better move, uh, Heather and, and Ash and have better movement, and then that carried on to Willow. So with the exception, the very strong exception of the Creekview 50-story, you know, Creekview Co-op 50-story redevelopment, which took us totally by surprise, we have to digest. It seemed a recognizable urban design proposition that had been in a lot of the discussions within uh, replan and presentations to the community. We had focused on the campus of care. So basically we had focused up to the existing bus loop entrance to the east. And there been little discussion about the berm. We have sent out clarification that some people believe the berm's completely gone in, in plan. And the consultant assured us that the land bridge and the berm and that essential character was there. So now the concern becomes, can you fit a school? I mean, I've been down and looked at it again, you know, on the, on the western end. Can we fit things like the campus of care and co-op expansion 
on, on the eastern part of Willow. We did not want to go too far because we didn't want to presume too much, waiting always for when is the city going to come forward with an outline, either framework for discussion or an outline plan. So some people be very concerned about the extent of change, but a lot of people are relieved that it's going in that sense, the physical plan is going in the direction that we had talked about and some of the ideas about replacement of infill housing first and being able to move people into right sizing of units and so on over the long term. It's just a shock to look at a plan and see your home gone in 2036. And, sure. you know. I'd have more questions, but I'm out yeah, of time. So. You are. Sorry. I'm sorry to say no, you are. And that, that is your question. So thank you. thank you very much for coming. And it was great to have you here in person. Um, we are now on to 50, uh, speaker 57, Sarah Jameson. Speaker 57 is not on the line. Thank you. Um, speaker 58, um, councillors is uh, coming, I believe, by phone, not in person. Is speaker 58, Gavin Grandish, on the line? Yes, good afternoon. Can you hear me? Yes, perfectly. You have up to five minutes. Yes, thank you. Good afternoon, councillors. It's my uh, privilege to speak with you today. I'm a teacher for the Vancouver School Board. I also work for the Vancouver Public Library. My spouse is an RN. We have two daughters in, in their teens. We've lived in Falls Creek South for most of the last 18 years. Over that time, we have lost many friends who have left the city because they couldn't find affordable family-sized housing, even rental housing. More recently, we are losing more friends who managed to get into real estate early and are now selling and leaving with their windfall. Losing our friends one by one to the housing crisis is really hard. If we were not fortunate enough to live in a co-op surrounded by the friends we have made there, we would have had to have leave, left the city a long time ago as well because it was just unaffordable. It was unaffordable then and it's still unaffordable now. So I welcome the redevelopment of my neighborhood and wish for much more affordable housing because I want more neighbors and more friends. But I'm really alarmed at what I read in this proposal prepared by the Real Estate Department, or REFM. It demolishes existing, well-maintained, perfectly viable, affordable housing, relocates it to a poor wall along 6th Avenue, greatly reduces the proportion of affordable housing in the neighborhood going forward, and does some irreversible damage to Charleston Park. So during staff presentations on Thursday, I heard opponents of the proposal lump market rental housing in with affordable housing. And let's just make one thing clear. Market rental housing is still market housing. And just because it's for rent does not mean it is affordable. So for example, a studio apartment or several of them at 1142 Granville were constructed under a city program in which the developer received a large incentive from the city because the city considered the units affordable. These 300 and 320 square foot units, which rented for $960 a decade ago, rent for $1,750 a month now. This is higher than what CMHC reports as the median monthly rent for a larger one bedroom apartment in the same neighborhood. In other buildings constructed under the city incentive, it's the same story elsewhere in the city. So, given this record, I really have no faith that any of the market rental housing to be built under this proposal will be truly affordable. So if the city is serious about having affordable housing in Vancouver and about keeping carbon emissions low, that starts with protecting what affordable housing is already here. It's wasteful and unethical to demolish perfectly viable affordable housing and rebuild it where a thousand trees used to be. And when I say a thousand trees, that is not an exaggeration. It's not clear how much of the Charleston Park berm is set to be demolished, but I counted 890 trees on it last week. I counted a further 735 trees along the railroad tracks between Ash and Alder Crossing, also gone under this proposal. The berm is one of the few forested areas in the city. It's used by wildlife and residents citywide. I've seen owls in the berm. The forest will only become more important to the health of the whole city as temperatures increase. It's essential that it, along with any remaining forested areas in the city, be protected. So I'd, I'd like to read out REFM's mandate, which was hard to find in a public place, but I was able to find it on CityWire. It is, and I quote, to lead the safe, sustainable, and innovative stewardship of the city's properties and facilities, to protect and enhance Vancouver's environment, 
and to advance the city's mission, goals, and services. Well, is this proposal innovative? Ms. Levitt admitted to Councillor Fry that the project did not explore innovative funding options. Is it protecting and enhancing Vancouver's environment? Well, not when cutting a thousand trees down. And is it sustainable? Well, the, the existing one-third, one-third, one-third model is proven and recognized around the world as sustainable. But when Councillor Hardwick asked about the viability of maintaining that model while adding infill, Mr. Brooks' response was that, quote, we haven't tested it, unquote. So instead of considering what we all know works, REF's proposal is to instead take the currently integrated neighborhood where everyone lives side by side and segregate it by pushing the lower and middle income residents out to the periphery and increasing the proportion of housing for high income people going forward. This proposal really falls short, even by REFM's own mandate. It will be a very sad day for the city if it becomes reality. So I urge council members to tell REFM, thank you for your hard work on this project. It's a very interesting proposal with some good ideas. We will take it under consideration. And then hand the, the False Creek South redevelopment file back to the planning department where it belongs. We will be happy for them to re-engage us and all city residents in advancing a real redevelopment plan that meets all of the city's goals and priorities. Thank you. Thank you very much. Um, and uh, you were very clear. <clears throat> there are no questions for you, but again, very much appreciate you taking the time to talk to us. Thank you. Speaker 59, Connie Volkofinger. Hello, can you hear me? You, yes, very clearly. Go ahead. Okay. <laughs> Thank you very much. My name is Connie Vogelfänger. I'm an active member of the Creekview Housing Co-op and live here with my husband and my 8- and 11-year-old children. Um, we try to teach our children respect, integrity, and to be honest as much as they can. Um, I'm speaking to those how, who are with us, the residents of Falls Creek South, who believe in a model and a vision of community, sustainability, and safety who know that a green and greener future is not made out of profit, who have a strong belief in our children. I know that you understand the values of community living, and I know that you will fight with us from the bottom of your heart. Thank you so much. And to those who already up, made up their mind, who don't believe in a 40-year grown neighborhood, who don't see any value and sense in something which cannot be right because it's city land who only think progress and most beneficial profitable change is good for the future, who don't read between the lines. For those who don't know the true statistics about the Falls Creek South leasehold community, saying that 15% of the Falls Creek South leasehold residents are children, compared to 11% of the FCS freehold and 16% citywide. And that 17.5% of the Falls Creek South family households are single parents, compared to 10.9% of freehold and 15.9% citywide. The source is from Falls Creek South population data, portrait of a model community. Let's say it's the 15% kids growing up in the Falls Creek South neighborhood. They are lucky, no question. They live on a wonderful piece of land surrounded by parks, playgrounds, and gardens. But they also live in a beautiful grown community where adults are role models showing how a community work. Our kids see when their parents go to community meetings and spend their volunteer time to make their home a better place. Our kids see how we care for each other, especially in pandemic hit times. We care in heat dome affected summers, which will become more, and we care in ice cold winters where water pipes just break and elevators don't work. Our children observe grown-ups carrying water up to the seniors. Our kids observe how members of the community go from door to door, asking if they are safe in hot times. Our kids observe how we grown-ups are worried and scared about the upcoming future. And our kids will remember every little thing, good, bad, or worse. Do you know what our children will become in the future? They will become future citizens and taxpayers and they will become voters, voting for their future and the future of their children. Maybe they become doctors, teachers, sales clerks, or they volunteer in community centers or city attractions. They will build the future of the city. Our kids are the future of the city. 
They see how worried their parents, grandparents, neighbors, and friends are if they need to leave their home because the city wants to relocate them. Or even worse, if they move away, what will be left? What if Vancouver is just not a place to live anymore? Not only because people cannot afford it, but mostly because it's not the city who makes you feel home. What if our kids need the light and ocean breeze instead of power? Oh my God, I'm sorry. <laughs> Congestions and cars. What if our kids want to enjoy a vibrant city and not stare at empty homes with no lights on at night? I don't see any far-sighted action in any of the plans provided. The neighborhood will change for sure. And if it's a good change, we will embrace it. If you want to have a second Coal Harbor, please go ahead. Future-wise, there will be not a lot of people left, young or old, families or seniors, workers, students, teachers. If you want to live in a city like this, go ahead. Otherwise, please vote against this shocking action plan. Thank you so much for listening. Um, and thank you. I don't see any questions, but I just uh, want to acknowledge that um, that you spoke very clearly and uh, and your emotion very much came through to us. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, speaker 60, Roberta J. Burks. Good afternoon, Madam Chair, Mayor Kennedy, and Council members. My name is Roberta Burks, and I live in Alder Bay Co-op. I just want to make a few brief comments on things that have been touched on um, both last Thursday and today, um, but not fully clarified. Um, one of the, uh, uh, I'm not sure who it was, someone said last Thursday that one of the complaints about Salt Creek South is its aging population. But there's a lot of, there's important background to that. Um, I'm one of about 25% of original members still living in Alder Bay Co-op. I moved in in 1979. So I've been contentedly aging in place. Another 15% of our original members have passed away during their tenure here. My 95-year-old mother lives independently in Twain Rainbow's Co-op and has for over 30 years. We've aged because we've lived our lives and raised our families here. We don't live here because it's near the water. We live here because it's our community. One of the things not clear to me then is what sort of co-ops the city is proposing. As you know, we are currently autonomous. We subsidize our lower income members ourselves. We care for the physical, financial, and social well-being of the co-op on our own. I worry about whether the proposed co-ops, if they get funding, would be consistent with what we have now, both in size and autonomy. Regarding the approaching end of lease, several speakers were asked last week what they expected to happen at the end of their leases. It's been an important issue at Alder Bay Co-op's meetings for years. We were expecting a probably expensive renewal of our lease. We knew density must increase. We worked with the city for several years through replan, proposing, among other things, that additional buildings be built as infill on our current ground, which is perhaps still an option. Finally, we need to house Vancouver's essential workers. We hear that employers have faced difficulty recruiting employees since COVID. At the very least, 10% of Alder Bay Co-op members are teachers. I listened to the teachers from other co-ops who called in last week explain that if they weren't living in co-ops, they couldn't afford to house their families in Vancouver because of the high cost and small size of apartments. But we need teachers and nurses and firefighters and the other professions who have made their homes in Salt Creek co-ops to be able to live right here in the city they work in, in co-ops consistent in unit size and cost with what we have now. Thank you very much. And thank you very much. That was very clear. Um, there are no questions for you, but thank you for, for addressing council. Uh, speaker 61, Richard Campbell. Hi, can you hear me? Yes, perfectly. Up to five minutes. Go ahead. Hi. Well, th thank you for the opportunity to address you uh, this afternoon. Uh, following up on the email, I had a long email I, I sent you last week. And, and since 
since then, I've actually seen a study from uh, UBC that of 30,000 uh, children that really highlights the importance of uh, access to nature and not being exposed to air, air pollution and noise. So, you know, I think it's critical uh, that as we move forward, we find ways to not only enable more people to live in areas that are less impacted by uh, uh, noise and pollution, but we also take uh, strong measures to uh, uh, lessen the impact on people that are already living there. And, and sadly, way too many people in our city are, are exposed to uh, un, unhealthy levels of, of noise and, and pollution. Uh, there was a proposal to add a few traffic lights to Sixth Avenue, and, and that may reduce noise, noise a bit. But if you wander around the city, there's tons of streets with uh, pedestrian signals everywhere. Uh, you know, Broadway, for example, and there's still a lot of traffic going way too fast, especially noisy in in the rain. So, as I detailed in that email, uh, I think there's a huge opportunity with the both the city-owned land and the road corridors on either side of the rail tracks to take a really uh, transformational approach, uh, burying the needed uh, traffic uh, below the surface, uh, protecting people from, from the noise and actually creating more space uh, you know, for greenery on, on the surface. So this is something that's starting to be done in cities around the world. There's going to be, no matter how many people we get cycling using transit, there is going to be still some essential truck traffic and some people have to drive in their city and we need to obviously accommodate that, but it's our, our duty to reduce the, that impact on the people living nearby and there's going to be more and more people living by busy noises and, and roads. So, uh, you know, I encourage you to strongly look at that. It will address a lot of the issues that people are rightly bringing up, uh, you know, with both current residents perhaps being uh, a move towards busy Sixth Avenue, and also more homes uh, uh, for, for people that are, are, are new residents. They would be created uh, near that noisy road as well. So I think that's a, a chance to at least uh, address a huge number of these issues, especially if you have lower parking. It's possible if you integrate this roadway into the construction of new buildings, which you're going to need some parking for and ramps and loading docks, you may actually be able to do it for a similar or even a lower cost if people really uh, kind of put their heads together and be creative about it. And there might be also uh, other uh, sources of funding that. I, I did uh, look into, uh, you know, some of the, the cost of uh, being near noise. And I, I looked at 12th versus 13th Avenue uh, east of Maine. And the uh, homes along 12th, the, 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 the value of the land is about 30% less than on 13th. So people with money are going to spend more to live away from noise. The people with less money, whether it's, uh, you know, a strata or a, a market rental, people with less income are going to be stuck on, on, the, uh, on the arterials, regardless of whether it's market or not. So I think we have a duty to lower traffic, lower speed, lower noise, lower vehicle volume, and then for essential traffic, uh, you know, let's put it underground. Obviously, this is a complicated uh, uh, solution. Oh, yeah, and the other thing, as I detailed, it could also free up uh, space for a lot more homes, uh, you know, along there where we're not using so much uh, surface space, uh, you know, for, for these roads. And that's kind of the other issue. They take up surface space. There's a heat island effect. There's light pollution from traffic lights and, and vehicles. Uh, there's a whole so sorts of uh, problems associated with traffic and, and roads that simply aren't going to go away, even with uh, the electric vehicles that we will uh, transition to. Uh, so uh, again, uh, you know, I, I, it's a complicated proposal. So I welcome the opportunity to meet with you, staff, and, and the residents to discuss these ideas further, and also to get more people and more ideas in, in the room to, uh, to discuss this and other uh, you know possibilities going forward to make it both much better for current uh, residents and create a really great space there for a lot more families to move in and experience the nature and, and the wonderful neighborhood that, that's uh, around South Falls Creek. Uh, thank, thank you very much. Thank you, that was well-timed um, and, uh, and very clear. No questions to you, but thank you for very, very much for coming. Okay, and I'll, I'll forward you on the, the UBC study. It's really oh, quite great. interesting. I think Council would okay, appreciate great. that. Okay. Thank you. Okay, thank, thank you very much. Speaker 62, Brooke Hooglum. Hi, can you hear me? 
Uh, yes, very clear. Go ahead, up to five minutes. Okay, great. Thank you. Mayor Stewart, Chair Carr, Councillors, thank you for the opportunity to speak. My name is Brooke Hoaglum, and I'm calling in from the traditional unceded territories of the Musqueam, Squamish, and Tsleil-Waututh peoples in what is now the second most expensive city in the world. I've lived in the False Creek Co-op for 15 years with my husband and now our two elementary-aged children. I do not support the conceptual development plan, the demo evictions, the segregation of tenure types, the ratio of market to non-market housing, and the planned displacement of non-market housing without secure funding to replace it. I also question the planned cutting down of trees on the berm, a small but important urban forest, and the bulldozing of co-ops to provide most of the what's called open space, a part of the recommended option titled New Sites and Open Space. As an aside, the cloaked process that developed this plan had a likely unintended effect, much alarm and anxiety among many who live in South Falls Creek, including children. Our children are listening and are worried. My 11-year-old son came in after hearing people talk outside recently and said, Mama, are they going to tear it all down? As you have heard, residents of Falls Creek South support increased density for more affordable housing. Our objection is to the current process and to the outcome of this process, the proposed plan with only one recommended option. My main question for you here today is, what can you do to ensure that the False Creek South planning process led by the planning department going forward is robust, creative, and not constricted by the parameters of the current plan? Can you receive the conceptual development plan as information and proceed with the full community plan process? A transparent, comprehensive planning process that doesn't have to take the current plan as what was called the starting point in the presentation the other day will lead to a more innovative plan in terms of design, alternate funding models for affordable housing, and in terms of environmental and social sustainability. In terms of social sustainability, I'm especially concerned with the development plan's inversion of the current 55% non-market housing in Falls Creek South to the idea of two-thirds market rental in strata and one-third non-market housing. As I'm sure you're aware, and others have spoken about, rental, market rental and market strata housing are not affordable for many, many families in Vancouver. Uh, we all have anecdotes of the 11 kids in my eldest son's preschool class in East Van. Six renting families moved to other cities before kindergarten and one to a co-op. This kind of attrition and losing friends and coworkers to other municipalities is a familiar refrain for many Vancouverites. Um, the City of Vancouver's own City Social Indicators profile from fall 2020 reports on, quote, a decline in families and children, likely in response to affordability pressures, uh, that, quote, high housing costs are continuing to exceed affordability benchmarks, and that there are, quote, inequities in health, well-being, belonging, and social connections. Uh, a three-bedroom in a neighboring, the neighboring Olympic Village neighborhood, for example, rents for $4,645 a month, a price that many families, including mine, a two-income household of teachers, could simply not afford. As you're no doubt also aware, the 2016 census data shows that the population of children and school-aged children has been in continual decline since the 70s. Um, VSB data shows that this decline has continued to the present day. What we need in Vancouver is more affordable housing for families, many of whom are the essential workers that the city has often noted need centrally located housing. We also need to build communities that address the health and social connection inequities that the city report found. Falls Creek South is an internationally renowned model of social sustainability in Vancouver and should be thoughtfully expanded while retaining the higher levels of non-market homes that enable families to live here. What an opportunity. In addition, as the UN Climate Conference begins in Glasgow next week and in the context of BC's new roadmap to 2030, I would advocate for environmentally sustainable design options in False Creek South that preserve existing well-maintained buildings, that preserve urban forests, that focus on car-free transportation options rather than on extending streets, and that actively reduce carbon emissions in addition to the mitigation measures in the report like planning for sea level rise and soil remediation. We welcome new affordable housing, new families, and deepened diversity in South Falls Creek. We welcome the mixture of tenure types that build strong, involved communities that make Vancouver a better city. I ask that in your leadership capacity, you ensure that the process going forward is transparent and innovative and looks at many options, many possible funding structures, tenure models, and design options and integrates the best ideas that make the greatest impact in terms of public land use and social and environmental sustainability. Thank you. And thank you. Um, that was very clear and perfectly timed. No questions for you, um, but uh, have a good evening. 
Thank you very much. Speaker 63, Patrick Condon. Speaker uh, 63 is not on the line. Okay, um, Speaker 64, Lisa, Lisa Levitt Bradshaw. Hello there. Hello, yes. Hello. Yes, we can hear you. Oh, hi. Go ahead. Hi. Um, thank you, Chair Carr and Council Members. I appreciate the opportunity to talk with you today about this issue that's very important to me. Thank you. I was raised in Falls Creek Co-op. My husband and I are raising our daughter here. I know firsthand what a caring and committed community means because of it. I wish everyone had this hat, sorry, I wish everyone had that opportunity. I am concerned about three things. First, I am concerned about the process. Secondly, I am concerned about the proposal. And thirdly, I am concerned about the loss of the essential nature of Falls Creek and what that means for Vancouverites if this plan goes forward. My concern about this process, uh, my con sorry, my concerns about this process are that it appears to be driven by developers and those who do not live in the community. And there has been very little community consultation, although I do appreciate this time to speak to Council. This process is being headed by the real estate department and it is unclear who is considering the community. The focus has been on the land that underlies buildings, but to do so is to miss the people who live here and the community that's grown on this land. I would implore the council to slow down for a moment and engage meaningfully with the community organizations like RePlan who know what this community is and how we can grow and enhance it. My concerns about this proposal is that it doesn't protect the great ones of this place. To start, I want to say that I agree we need more housing and I agree that Falls Creek should grow, but I want that growth to be thoughtful and not remove the uniqueness of this place. As an example, the berm, is not just an empty space on a map to fill with condos. When I was a kid, it's where, we're, it's where we explored, where we escaped. We would play up there for hours going blackberry picking. It was our collective backyard. No one owned it, we all did. I don't want the things that make False Creek amazing to be lost in this process and in this proposal. My fear, is that the current plan does not take into account the intangibles that make False Creek such a jewel. Finally, I am concerned about the future of my community and what that means for Vancouver. I know how special and unique False Creek is. My parents have lived here for over 40 years. That was made possible by co-op housing and a vision for a community that is broader than land value and city property tax revenue. It's my dream that my young family lived here for 40 more years alongside my parents. My husband and I are two well-paid professionals who cannot afford to buy housing and afford even market rent and affording even market rental housing in this city is a stretch. Many of my friends have had to choose between being house poor or moving away, and these are professionals and longtime Vancouverites who are making this choice. Sadly, many are choosing to leave. So many people want co-op housing, but the wait lists are long and closed. Any plan for False Creek has to try and grow the number of co-op units to help those of us who want to be here stay. In summary, I would ask Council to engage in a meaningful way with community organizations like RePlan, consider the role of other departments like planning, increase the availability and desirability of co-op housing, and thoughtfully plan a way to expand Falls Creek that is in line with the glory of this place and the community that calls it home. Thank you so much. Great. Thank you very much. It's very clear. Um, and there are no questions. Thanks for being here. Thank um, you. So, uh, Speaker 65, Michael Briggs. Um, Chair Carr, we, we just have an issue with the uh, 
telesystem, so we need to just check something quickly. Hello, can okay, you hear yes, me? Yes, Michael Briggs, if you could just hold on for a minute. Um, our staff can you hear me? Just, yes, well, maybe not. Hello, can you hear me? Can you, hello, can you hear me? Is this Michael Briggs? Yes, can you okay. hear me? Okay, just one second. I'm just uh, staff asked me to check that. I'm I'm just going to ask staff if it's okay to proceed. Great. Okay, Michael Briggs, go ahead. Up to five minutes. Uh, thank you. You can you can hear me now. Yes, we can Hello? hear you. Yes, we can hear you perfectly. Okay. Yes. Uh, good evening. My name is Michael Briggs. I'm a resident of Falls Creek Co-op and am opposed to the conceptual development plan's recommendations. Uh, briefly. Uh, about myself, my wife and I moved to Vancouver in 2007 and felt fortunate to find a rental unit in the Fairview neighborhood. Shortly afterwards, we welcomed our daughter and our journey as parents and our little family began. However, after living in Vancouver for a short time, we learned about the horror of rent evictions, but also learned about housing co-ops. My wife and I realized that co-ops are the key to affordable housing for families and our desire to stay in the city outranked our ability to buy a home or condo. Today, I would categorize our family as middle income, living in a co-op in Falls Creek South. Like many people who move to the city from somewhere else, we don't have any family in the, in the region, but joining the co-op provided us not just essential social support and a sense of community, it allowed, it allowed us to stay in the city. Friends and coworkers suggested we move to the outer suburbs when our daughter was born, but our quality of life is much higher by staying in Vancouver proper and joining our co-op is still the only way we can afford to do so. I appreciate that the future of Falls Creek South is complicated. There are a lot of disparate interests at play and that these types of de decisions may not have been top of mind when you decided to enter local government. But if successful, secure, mixed income mixed age communities as a goal, then it would be a tragedy to pursue more market rate housing, resulting in a proportional decline in security of tenure and housing for the families that work and live in Vancouver. The aren't you lucky perception of co-op members has everything to do with the demand for co-ops and non-market housing. Just four years ago, Heritage Co-op at 8th and Heather accidentally sent up invitations to their entire wait list for a viewing and orientation meeting, and according to news reports of the time, more than 200 hopeful families and 500 people showed up to view a single apartment. I think we can all agree that the demand for true <coughs> non-market housing for families has only gotten stronger since 2017. Co-ops are non-profit housing ventures where members buy a share and are considered equal owners. We share in maintenance costs and responsibilities, which combined help to keep housing costs down. Members and families of co-ops connect and care. And believe me, we do feel fortunate, but then we aren't treating the housing market like an ATM or trying to avoid tax liabilities. If finding affordable housing below the impossible market rates is the equivalent to winning a lottery, then who are you shaping this city for? None of the speakers opposing this report are categorically against any change or densification in Falls Creek South. However, just as illogical as it would be to bulldoze healthy, mature trees to plant sapins, it is equally absurd to bulldoze the well-maintained, affordable housing already in place based exclusively on lease expiry dates. You've learned, you've heard a lot about how special life in False Creek South is. Please do not displace the residents here in favor of more towers. Filling in the unused parcels makes more sense than bulldozing historic and viable communities so we are 300 yards from where the buildings currently sit. I respectfully ask you today to preserve and enhance the False Creek South community beyond lease end and enable the community to evolve and diversify in a way that is sustainable for existing residents. I also ask that Council include the City's Planning Department and representatives from the Falls Creek South Neighborhood Association for changes to the Real, Estate's, Real Estate Department's conceptual plan presented last week. Thank you. And thank you. That was um, well-timed and, uh, and very clear. Appreciate you coming to speak to Council. We are on to Speaker 66, Hannah Hermanick. 
Hi there. Hi, we can hear you clearly. Can you? Go ahead. Yes, we hear you. Go oh, ahead. perfect. Thank you. Hi, yeah, I'm just calling in, um, and I, I feel very much the same as the last couple of speakers that I've had a chance to hear. Um, and I do oppose the development plans that are currently set out, um, mainly because they don't seem to have consulted con consulted sorry the planning department of of the city of Vancouver. And I think the planning department has some really uh, progressive plans for the city in terms of climate change and green space and uh, just making this city a vibrant, uh, beautiful place to live. Um, so I think that really needs to be taken into consideration. Um, I moved to Vancouver in 2008 uh, for work in the environmental field. I am a teacher, um, you know, and on a teacher's salary, uh, the market um, affordable living costs are really not uh, that affordable for many people in Vancouver. And, um, you know, tearing down these buildings to to create sky rises that uh, have um, a lot smaller living space that might not accommodate families and um, are a lot more expensive is going to push out a lot of people that would love to partake in this community. Um, and they're gonna, it's going to push them out into uh, rural areas. And, you know, I fear that this city is going to lose a lot in that regard. Um, and also, it'll lose a lot of green space, uh, which is important, you know, considering the the, um, the value that has to mental health. Um, you know, and with climate change and the sea level rising issues, I think we really need to take those into consideration before we start building um, right next to the ocean. So those are sort of my, my main concerns. I've looked into co-op housing because after living here for a few years, I was rent evicted and I now live in a, in a fairly affordable place in East Vancouver, which I lucked out on, but this may not last forever. And um, so I did look into co-op housing and the lists are so long, I haven't heard back. I applied to about eight or nine different uh, co-ops and um, to no avail. So I'm not um, I'm not quite sure what will happen if I get renovicted and I'm worried about that. I really want to support more co-op housing in the city. I think um, they're just a wonderful way for people to connect and make living affordable here in this beautiful city. So um, thank you for your time and I hope the uh, the city councillors make a good decision. Thank you. Uh, thank you for your time in speaking to us. That was very clear. Uh, on to speaker 67, Jan Carley. Uh, hello, Chair Carr and Council. Can you hear me fine? Yes, we can hear you perfectly. Go ahead. Great, thank you. Hi, uh, my name is Jan Carley. I've been a resident of False Creek Five. I am opposed to the acceptance of this staff report and its plans for the future of False Creek South. I hope it's okay if I speak here today from the heart. Um, to be honest, since this report has come out, I have been overwhelmed with anxiety and have not been able to sleep through the night. On a deeply personal level, the idea of one day being demo evicted from my co-op home that I've lived in for 36 years makes me feel like someone has punched me in the gut. But this is much more than me losing my home. This is about a process gone wrong. I am filled with fear at the alarming way this report has been prepared behind closed doors. I am filled with fear that somehow the real estate arm of the city is operating independently. And I am now feel, filled with fear and doubt about the whole integrity of the planning process for False Creek South that had previously been very consultative and open to the community. I am filled with fear for the future of Vancouver. I fear for the senior citizen with her walker who just the other day I assisted getting back to her apartment near Leganboot Square after she got overtired walking to the water. She said she just wanted to see the sunset. Will there be a home for her to age in place in this new plan? I fear for the co-op children joyfully running around screaming and laughing as they play outdoors together 
no pre-scheduled fabricated play dates, just a safe place to let their wonderful child imaginations drive their play. In this plan that proposes moving the co-ops to high-rise apartments bordering the busy 6th Avenue, where will the children play safely together in the future? I fear for the hundreds from all over the city who come to Falls Creek daily to walk through the tall trees on the berm for a momentary respite from the concrete world around them. With this plan to flatten the berm and remove over a thousand trees, where will they go for that much needed mental health break? You've already heard many eloquent speakers before me talk about numbers and ratios and the nuts and bolts impacts. I would like to draw the lens out a bit and talk about vision, and I mean the city's vision. In preparation for a town hall meeting last February 25th with Karen Levitt and others, I checked the city website to understand the vision for the city of Vancouver. Oddly, there didn't appear to be a vision for the city on the city website, and perhaps that in itself speaks volumes. Though I didn't find a city vision, I did uncover a provisional vision for Falls Creek South. That 2018 vision and the extensive guiding principles for Falls Creek South were arrived at with years of consultation between city planning and Falls Creek South stakeholders, and to me they seemed to be clear and cogent. I was curious then as to why we were having a town hall meeting in February to ostensibly discuss the same thing. Suddenly the alarm bells started going off in my head when I heard Karen Levitt state that there's a commercial aspect that was not part of that 2018 provisional vision, and that those commercial aspects will become part of a long-term landowner's vision that City Council would be discussing and adopting that will then become the real vision. So here we are, eight months later. Here we are with that real vision before us. And I have to ask, is this really a vision? A vision speaks to the question, what are we building? This plan speaks to the heart. To me, that direction is a direct contradiction to the advertising now out for the Vancouver plan that aims to be a process of soliciting input from all Vancouverites to, and I quote from the advertising mail dropped through my door this week, this Vancouver plan is our opportunity to meet key challenges and create a city with more equitable housing and neighborhoods. And I also might add that flyer shows a graphic of three low-rise homes. No, they're not six to 50-story tall high-rises. So how can these two pieces be happening at the same time? On one hand, the admirable openness and will of the city to embark on a public planning and consultation process to create a Vancouver plan that actively invites input and is shaped by the city of Vancouver, people of Vancouver, and at the same time, have a real estate department operating behind closed doors, creating a plan that would erode a fully functional neighborhood community that already contains this equitable mixed housing. Council, I urge you to reject this report and get back to a transparent planning process that involves both City Planning Department and the Falls Creek South community, and together continue to co-create a plan that is truly aligned with the provisional vision for Falls Creek South created in 2018. Please, let's not tear this community apart. Let's build on what we have and, yes, add density incrementally in a phased approach that is transparent and collaborative so that Vancouver remains a livable, sustainable, and innovative city well into the future. Thank you And that much. is it. That's great. That's <laughs> um, it for your time. Thank you for, for wrapping up. And um, it, you were very clear. No, no questions to you. Thanks so much for coming. Thank you. Speaker 68. <clears throat> Kirsten Mikkelsen. Hi there. Can you hear me okay? Yes, we can. Go ahead, up to five minutes. Awesome. Thank you. Awesome. Thank you. My name is Kirsten Mikkelsen. I'm a resident of Falls Creek South and live in Alder Bay Co-op. Thank you to the councillors and staff for hearing me today. I'm a bit of a reluctant speaker. I'm pretty weary these days that my input makes little difference to the future plans of my neighbourhood. But I've been encouraged and told by community that the city councillors actually value hearing from us. So today I'm sharing my voice in hopes that it adds to the collective weigh-in on what could be a win-win for everyone. I am asking councillors either oppose this current plan for the future of Falls Creek South or seek out recommendations from the replan committee and heed the voices from the current residents of our community. Because as it stands now, the current plan, well, I'll be honest, I felt angry after reading it. And since anger is a secondary emotion, I took a minute and sat with that anger. 
What's under it? It's fear. I'm afraid. I'm afraid that the existing co-ops like mine will be unnecessarily demolished. The definition of affordable housing will once again be so skewed that I will not be able to afford the dignity of living in my beloved city. My opinion isn't an isolated one either. In fact, only this morning, two headlines grabbed my attention from both the Vancouver's Awesome and the Daily Hive website, referencing a recent publication of the housing affordability indices by Oxford Economics, stating that Vancouver was the least affordable of all Northern American housing markets, and it's only deteriorating as we speak. I first first felt this affordability sting almost 11 years ago when I found myself in an unbearable housing crisis that almost sunk my ship for good. I was a new single mom who was clawing her way back to health from a very serious case of postpartum depression. My team of psychiatrists and therapists at the time referred to a study that the single most important thing for struggling single moms is affordable housing. And if that can be secured, her family will start to thrive in ways that they simply couldn't before. So there began a deep dive into affordable housing options in Vancouver. A research binder was created. I sought an advocate to help me. I contacted Metro Vancouver Housing Corporation. I looked at government-sponsored low-income options, and I started collecting data on the co-ops of Vancouver. Over two years' worth of constant research and reaching out brought me to an undeniable conclusion. Co-ops were unbelievably the least expensive, the most sustainable, and the safest place for me and my young son to find housing. Needless to say, my son Koa and I entered the co-op, our lives changed dramatically. Kids roaming around free and unencumbered from traffic. Neighbors that really cared and looked out for us. Huge trees and nature surrounding us that created a safe haven for my nervous system. I felt like I finally had been given the chance I desperately needed. I'm very concerned about this proposal for the future of False Creek South. I mean, no disrespect to the work the staff has done on this plan. However, I can't help but notice that it reads as being wasteful, putting profit above all else, and creating even more non-affordable market housing. Is this the legacy we want to create for our future? Single parents like me being faced with impossible rents and having nowhere to go. Communities so rich in diversity, learning to live, work, and play together becoming extinct. Communities who have learned to navigate difference of opinion and yet peacefully coexist with each other and who collectively and democratically make decisions while being fully self-sufficient has to have a value equal or larger than sheer profit, does it not? I remember a handful of years ago when I was creating a business plan, we were taught that the investors of the future would expect to see what they call the triple bottom line. Is it profitable? Is it sustainable? And is it good for the environment? Well, here in Falls Creek, we already have a triple bottom line. The current co-ops are well established, the buildings are still sustainable, and they create revenue. Perhaps not in ways if intemperance is the only lens we are willing to look through. But if we are willing to actually see the amazing success of the bigger picture that already exists at our window, we would see a richness that we could build upon and expand together for future generations. I ask you today to help protect the future of False Creek and strive to use what we already have to build on already empty available land to maintain the style and flavor of False Creek South in the expansion and to support a more cooperative, transparent partnering with the community that already lives here. We are a talented, diverse bunch and we have been conditioned for many years in the democratic ideal where everyone's heard, everyone's valuable and everyone's needs are important. It is an imperfect ideal, and we have been failing upwards at it for so long. There's such priceless wisdom the city would be remiss not to take advantage of. I will leave you with this. In my most humble opinion, one of the greatest achievements of the co-op model is affordable community. And I don't mean that from a financial aspect. I mean it from the aspect that is deeper and wider than money. One that actually makes life worth living and frees our citizens from backbreaking financial burdens so they can instead build up their energetic savings account and spend it on their families and communities. Now, isn't this the true bottom line we should be striving for? Thank you. Thank you um, very much. That was very clear. Um, so we're moving on. Council Speaker 69, John Keith. President of Vancouver. I speak against the recommendations in the report from the real estate department, as the plan, if accepted, would destroy the unique character of False Creek South. 
Co-op and non-market housing at, are at the heart of the community, yet their proportion would be drastically reduced, and there would be a loss of the current balance of mixed income and mixed 10-year residency. My home for the past 30 years has been False Creek Housing Co-op, which would be demolished and replaced by market housing. My co-op and others and almost all non-market housing would be uprooted and shunted to the, perim to the pre per um, perimeter of the area, not, not exactly on the wrong side of the tracks, but right on top of them. There is no provision for my co-op survival. The report just suggests other levels of government come in and pick up the pieces and try to put Humpty Dumpty together again. Housing co-ops are vital, organic communities. As members, we come together to do our bit in various committees to manage our finances, maintain our buildings, tend our grounds, organize shared events in our communal spaces, and keep the ideal mix of incomes in our, in our membership. Our buildings are designed with shared outdoor spaces and communal walkways where we constantly see and talk with our neighbors, our fellow co-op members. It's a wonderful community to live in. I would even say it's priceless. The real estate department's miserly report, however, puts monetary value first. The situation, I think, is not unlike what Charles Dickens, the great social advocate, described in A Christmas Carol. So I say, let the ghost of Art Phillips show you the renowned past and present of the False Creek South neighborhood and hear him as he pleads with you to reject the Scrooge-like vision of False Creek future that is tendered in this report. Bah humbug. Thank you. That was very evocative. Um, and thank you. Appreciate There's no um, questions for you, but appreciate you taking the time with us. Thank you. Uh, this uh, now speaker 70, Nathan Davidovich. Hello, do you hear me? Yes, uh, yes, we can hear you, Nathan. Go ahead. Oh, okay, thank you very much, uh, Chair and, uh, and members of Council. Uh, I'm speaking uh, uh, because I was a member of the Champlain Heights Planning Advisory Committee in the 1970s and 80s, and uh, I'm worried that what, uh, what will, what's going to happen in South Falls Creek will likely be duplicated in Champlain Heights that has the most housing co-ops in the city and probably in the country in such a small area. Um, the main problem is the process. Former Director of Planning, Ray Sparksman, allow us to have community planning. And this was all changed when Vision Council took over and brought in new managers at City Hall that were not familiar with the history of the city and the way planning, development, rezoning is done in this here and in other cities in BC. Vancouver is the only city that has different process for planning and rezoning in BC. You can watch other city council meetings and find out for yourself how they do their business. For, uh, Falls Creek South is a special area, and uh, and former councillors, uh, you know, dealt with it with a, with a TLC uh, hands, and that's the way it should be. Uh, I mean, the mayor has written books on cities across Canada, and he knows that Vancouver is way behind other cities. And I'm not sure why he supports the staff recommendations when he knows so much about the problems cities face across Canada. And, you know, one way is to have the proper process done before you make decisions. Why create confrontation with so many people? Uh, we need cooperation. The city could hold an in-person meeting now that you're allowed to do that. There's no limit on gathering. Invite everybody to a proper public meeting where many questions and answers could be answered before council discuss this issue and so forth, 
and then the staff can rewrite the whole report, bring you all the concerns of everybody, and then you're not going to have 171 delegations speaking against, uh, you know, this recommendation. Uh, the, uh, I mean, uh, look, I mean, I, I was talking about Champlain Heights. Well, you know, the same thing. You can see the difference between Champlain Heights planning and the River District planning. You know, the, the River District was planned by staff with no input from the community. And now we're going to have a new city of 15,000 people with very little services because we didn't have a proper community planning. So, uh, you know, uh, there's just so many things that, uh, that should have been done long time ago, or it still could be done now. I mean, uh, there's no, no big rush uh, to, to do anything like this, this year or even next year, uh, you know. So, uh, so take your time and, and try to uh, uh, get uh, the community more involved. Thank you very much for your listening to me. Um, and thank you very much, Nathan. Um, if you could just hold on the line, you do have questions. Um, Councillor Hardwick, go ahead. Uh, thank you, Nathan, for speaking with us today. Um, I recognize you as, as someone who's passionate about uh, transit and transportation. You didn't really uh, talk about this plan through that lens. Any insights into what is included in this this concept plan in terms of its approach to transit and transportation? Well, I mean, there is really hardly anything in the staff report at all uh, about it. I mean, the population or the density is proposed to be triple. Uh, how, you know, how are we going to handle all these uh, people uh, to to, to uh, go to their job downtown and so forth. I mean, we already have two million cars in Metro Vancouver, and the projection is for three million cars by 2035. Uh, you know, I mean, we can. Uh, you know, we 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 are reducing the the Granville Bridge to six lanes. The Campbell Bridge has been reduced to five lanes now. Two, uh, two and three, which doesn't make any sense. And, uh, you know, we, we, we need a proper pedestrian and, and bicycle bridge like other cities instead of uh, spending all this money on gravel bridge. Uh, you know, the, uh, look at the, at, the, at, the, at the water transit. We have the Falls Creek ferries and Aquabus. There are private companies where in other cities they are part of the transit system so you can get a free transit. People have to pay twice here in Falls Creek to take the ferry and then take the bus. It's not fair, you know. And, uh, and, then, the, and then the rail service, the rail is there. Why can't we have a rail service from Science World, you know, to Falls Creek South, to Granville Island, then to the Burrard Bridge, over the bridge, and then under uh, Burrard Street all the way to Waterfront Station? That would help get the people to where they want to go. But, you know, there is nothing mentioned about it in the report, and uh, so I don't know. I mean, not even mentioning of the traffic light for 6th Avenue and Oak Street. How are you supposed to get across, you know, in such a busy street? Thank you. That about covers it. I, I, I am interested because there were some... some is another question? Yeah. Is he still there? Nathan? Yes. Are you still... Yes, did I'm show here. road yeah. incursion into False Creek in what I looked at. It, it appeared that uh, there was, in fact, road incursion going into False Creek in a way that we don't have currently, but it's, I'm just at the end of my time, so I'll, I'll just park it. But thank you very much, Nathan. Thank you, Councillor thank you. Hardwick, and thank you, Nathan. Um, that's it for questions. I, I Council, um, the clerk have asked me if I could uh, take a five minute break as they check something with the TELUS line. Um, so uh, I know we're close to dinner time, but uh, in order for that to happen, um, uh, for them to do the checking, we have to just recess for five minutes.
Thanks. Welcome back, everyone. Um, thank you uh, for your patience in that break. Um, so we um, are now on speaker 71, by the way, council has withdrawn. Um, and I believe I've been informed that we have three speakers on the line right now. Um, and uh, uh, if we could just ex uh, see a motion to extend to hear those three speakers, that would be helpful. I'm happy to move that, Chair Carr. Okay, I think that was um, Councillor uh, Boyle. Councillor Boyle and seconded by okay. Councillor DiGenova. Great, okay, all those in favor say aye. 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 Any opposed say nay. Great, thanks so much. So speaker 72, Laura Stannard. Hi. Um, yeah, we can hear you, go ahead. Up <laughs> yep. Okay, good. I'm very grateful to speak to you from the unceded lands of the Squamish, Tsleil-Waututh and Musqueam peoples. I've never lived in False Creek South, but I value it so much because it's the only example I can give to people who say economic mixes fail because low-income populations are always displaced by wealthier residents. Sadly, that's exactly what will occur if this plan proceeds. As the 72nd listed speaker, I don't want to lose your ears by repeating previous criticisms, but I can't remain silent while a 20th century land developer mentality skewers and spin the facts to destroy my hope for the future. Combining the profiles of the residents living on city lease land with the newer, wealthier private landholders is a disingenuous basis for destroying a community and convincing our mayor that the so-called experiment of Falls Creek South is a failure. And lessons from Little Mountain still haven't been learned. Don't tear down viable co-op and nonprofit housing. Don't even allow the possibility. We all know that when senior government financing falls short, the units for the lowest income people are the first to go. At the very best, if this plan is followed, we'll end up with the, and this is at the very best, we'll end up with the same old 80-20 market, non-market formula that does nothing to alleviate the housing crisis. The success of mixed economic communities lies in their equal access to amenities and natural surroundings. In Falls Creek South, no one has to go through a poor door, and there aren't welfare floors or a bad area. The plan to push, to, to push non-market units to Sixth Avenue destroys the very basic concept of equity that is central to Falls Creek South. Frankly, I can't understand why all 11 of you aren't dancing for joy at this opportunity to leave a powerful housing legacy. Here's a chance to work with the most inventive experts, some of whom are speaking on this issue, and you can showcase a complete array of non-market housing forms and governance models. We could partner with First Nations representatives before a plan is taken to council. Right here in Vancouver, we have an opportunity to decommodify a basic human right that is currently an unsurmountable barrier to healthy children and communities. As a potential exhibit project, and with the mayor's connection, CMHC's interest in dollars could be leveraged much more easily than the same old 80-20% formula that everyone knows doesn't work. I've often said False Creek South should apply for UNESCO heritage status because it's so significant in the history of urban planning. At the very least, the city should recognize its unique characteristics and award civic heritage status. Instead of destroying it, Strathcona and our heritage-protected Chinatown were saved by people who valued neighborhoods over freeways. Falls Creek South needs to be saved from those who treat housing as a commodity and land as the city's primary income generator. I urge you to reject the real estate and dep deputy city manager's recommendations to immediately extend all land leases for a period long enough to ensure residents the security of tenure and the ability to borrow funds to maintain their buildings. Zone the publicly owned lands in False Creek South to develop leading examples of market-free housing forms and governance models. And finally, work with Replan, please, to ensure the future housing mix remains affordable and equally distributed among low, middle, and upper income earning residents. Thank you very much for this opportunity to speak. 
And thank you for your clarity and, uh, and taking the time to speak to Council on this. Um, speaker, and there are no questions. Uh, speaker 74, Robert Renger. Speaker 74 is not on the line. Thank you. Uh, speaker 76, Jill Atke. Hi there. Good evening, Mayor and Council. Uh, thank you for the opportunity to speak with you about the future of Falls Creek South. My name is Jill Atke, as you said, and I'm the CEO of BC Nonprofit Housing Association. So much has already been said on this issue, so I'm going to focus my own comments on the potential of the community housing sector in False Creek South, and I'll also offer my own perspective on where we might go from here. So I just want to start off by saying that there's been a tremendous amount of work done on this proposal already, um, and there are some good things to come out of it. So there's a recognition that False Creek South can handle many more homes than currently exist on the site. That's good news. Uh, recognizing the many stakeholders involved in South, uh, South Creek South, that's also uh, been a remarkable part of the plan. And then recognizing the need for a campus of care to ensure that residents can age in place. But as you've heard, there are some challenges with the proposal. And I'll touch on a big one of them here, uh, which, as I see it, is a fairly dramatic shift away from community housing to a reliance on market housing. I'll start with what many perceive as a diminishing role for nonprofits and co-ops in the area. Um, and that seems to be a central feature of this plan. And I think that probably just represents a misunderstanding of, our, of the role that our sector plays in providing a broad range of housing types. Uh, so in the 1970s, in order to achieve a one-third, one-third, one-third income mix, the city determined that 56% of all housing should be nonprofit and co-op. Now, 50 years later, in the midst of an affordability crisis, we see a plan before us that wants to maintain that same one-third, one-third, one-third income mix. That's a good thing. But through a reduction in the nonprofit and co op share to 34% of all housing, that's a 40% reduction in the share, uh, which will make it very difficult to achieve both councils and the community's affordability goals. And that has a lot of people nervous, and I would include myself uh, amongst those. In the public polling done as part of this uh, process and uh, as part of the community consultation for the process, Residents were asked what types of housing were important to them, and these were their priorities. They said purpose-built rental housing, family housing, accessible and adaptable housing, seniors housing, workforce housing, missing middle housing, first-time homeowners housing, social housing, co-op housing, and Indigenous housing. Those are a lot of priorities. Uh, the problem with ranking these in the way that um, that the report has is that they they're not mutually exclusive types of housing. All of these types can exist in a single building, and what the survey doesn't ask is who should own them, and that's the bigger question to me in this process. And that's because through the survey, people also said that their priority concerns were affordability and other social concerns. The city has the mechanism to apply that same affordability lens to all of these housing types. And I'm going to illustrate that through an example of a building run by a nonprofit housing provider in Falls Creek South, and that is Vancouver Den Court. So in one building, you have purpose-built rental, family housing, accessible housing, seniors housing, workforce housing, missing middle housing, and social housing. That one building ticks almost all of the housing types in the list from the survey. And if the city were to classify it, it would likely just stick it under social housing uh, without understanding that it can be a solution to a broad range of those housing types. So today that building runs completely without any subsidy from senior levels of government. A one-bedroom market rental home currently rents for uh, somewhere between $758 and $1,250 per month. This is affordable to people earning between $30,000 and $50,000 annually. 
These are break-even rents in the community housing sector. That's what we call market rents. They're break-even. The median household income for renters in Vancouver is $50,000 annually. So New Chelsea Society offers, in addition to those market or break-even rents, internal rent subsidies for about 20% of the units. That's the social housing component. And they, through those internal subsidies, bring rents down to $320 a month. They are running shelter rate housing without government subsidy. So while this might be just one example, I want to assure you that nonprofits throughout the city are running similar models. So there's no question that we need to build more housing in Falls Creek South. And I think most people agree that that's a good thing. The community engagement work done to date says that citizens want the housing in Falls Creek South to be affordable. We can achieve those goals if we prioritize community-owned assets on community-owned land. So by providing that direction to staff and by setting a minimum share council wishes to see, I think with this proposal, we could see a path forward. Okay, thank you so much. Um, you have, that's the end of your time. However, you have uh, a number of councillors with questions, so could you please stay on the line to um, answer them? That would be good. Sure, happy to. Councillor Hardwick, first, to you for up to three minutes. Thank you. Jill, as, as you know, going back to the 1970s, the, the federal government had a significant role in the financing of housing in Falls Creek. Um, you may know more about why this funding was discontinued by the federal government, and uh, I just wondered if you could add any color to what you think we might need to get it back from a nonprofit yeah, housing a, perspective. Yeah, an excellent question, and, and there's no question that, that the funding back in the day outweighs anything that we've got, even under the national housing strategy as it stands right now. So it used to be that 10% of all housing supply in the country was nonprofit and co-op housing. So we're not back to those levels yet. Um, but it's funny, just, uh, just before speaking to council, I saw a, a tweet from Power and Politics, Deputy Prime Minister, uh, Christian Freeland says the federal government is going to quote unquote lean in and work with provinces and municipalities to build more affordable housing in Canada. And I think what we've seen through this last federal election is a recognition uh, that the, the national housing strategy has been a vast improvement from having nothing for 25 years. Um, but it has and in particular in some parts of, of the country has has failed to achieve its full potential. And so they have doubled their commitment to the co-investment fund, which is the main fund where we're seeing affordable housing built. Uh, and they've signed deals with um, Toronto Community Housing. They've signed deals with Ottawa Community Housing. Now that's because they've got a portfolio. So they the, the total amount is between those two, about $2 billion. <laughs> They've got a complete portfolio, but if through False Creek South, we could present this as a portfolio of housing opportunities, I do think that there would be interest there from the federal government. I don't know if that's been tried yet. I haven't um, been a part of those municipal conversations, but I do think there's some potential there. So building on the existing legacy um, and trying to engage further with the federal government to make up the, the role that they used to play, play or at least step up more. Yes, I think I think there's absolutely room for them to do that. Um, and and one of our challenges with their program has been um, that in order to to get a significant number of dollars, uh, you need a portfolio. But there is a willingness, so it, so a significant number of assets. Uh, to bring to them for investment. Um, but but I think what uh, False Creek South strikes me as is exactly that opportunity to, to bring forward a portfolio. I can't guarantee that it's going to work, but I also don't know that it hasn't been tried, that it's been tried. That's it. Thank you very much, Councillor Hardwick. Uh, on to you, Councillor Fry. Yeah, thanks, Chair. <clears throat> and thanks, Jill. And may I add that I've really... Uh, Appreciated some of your comments on Twitter, the threads that you've been posting about some of this issue. It's been been good to read. Um, so okay, I, thanks. Yeah, no, you're welcome. Um, 
so I just want to sort of look at the, the process and the decision we have before us. And, and I'm wondering, do you, are you, how do you think we should proceed? Should we send this back to real estate and facilities management and have them look to shift from a market approach to a nonprofit kind of approach? Or do you think we should proceed along and go straight to planning process? With yeah, I mean, I, I think what what's being learned through this is is that planners have uh, some some very specific and and maybe even some unique skill sets in terms of public uh, consultation and and um, land use and and built form, uh, and so there's there's absolutely no question that planning needs to be involved uh, in the process. I would say the sooner the better. Um, but in terms of, of the decision before you, um, it's very difficult for me to say, you know, should we just sort of accept this uh, for information or, or send it back? Um, because I don't actually know a lot about what the assumptions um, what the assumptions were that went into the plan. What I see in the plan is that there was no model considered um, that included a greater share for non-market housing. Um, and, and within that, I include the ability of nonprofits and co-ops to run market rental housing. So I don't know that that was considered. I know that there are a lot of costs related to soil remediation, um, uh, sea, sea level rise. So, so those are some real challenges. I don't know that all of those costs need to be borne by the 80 acres. Um, there, there may be other opportunities there. So I, I would suggest maybe a revisiting of that. Um, but I think if council were to set some um, minimum thresholds for the share of community housing and what income ranges you want to see within that community housing, I think we could probably come up with a workable solution together. Okay, I really appreciate that. So back uh, in the 1970s, it was the False Creek Development Corporation that the city set up to develop this land. Should the redevelopment of this land similarly involve the city in some kind of new structure like that as a developer? You know, I think it's probably too early to to say, and it, and that could maybe even come through uh, the conversations with senior levels of government. Um, you know, if if it is that, as I mentioned to Councillor Hardwick, that you're presenting this as a portfolio of development opportunities, it could be that a development corporation needs to be to be structured, or it could be that you bring your nonprofit and co-op partners to the table um, to see to see what could be worked through. Um, but I I don't know enough about the the development corporation in the 1970s to to really say whether or not that would be the right model at this point. I think it might be a bit too early. Okay, that I'm sorry, but that is Councillor Fry's time, well over. Um, but you do have other questions too. So Councillor Wee, on to you. Yeah, thanks, Joe. You talked about the community portfolio of housing um, being on community land. Um, do you think it can still work, um, recognizing that? part of this report talks about this land continuing to be owned by the city. Do you think it can still work if the city retains the ownership of the land and not the community housing provider? Oh, absolutely. And there's there's a lot of examples of that um, all around the city where, where uh, nonprofits and co-ops have uh, very good leasehold uh, relationships and arrangements with the city, um, and, and when I say community-owned land, um, I, I really do mean community broadly, um, and, and that's the city-owned land. So the citizens own that land. Um, so that was my intent there. Okay, thanks for that clarification. Great, thanks. Thank you, and uh, Jill, those are your questions now. Appreciate you very, uh, very much, you coming to, uh, or being on the line to speak to council. Great, thank you so much. Have a good evening. You too, bye-bye. Okay. Um, Speaker 77, uh, Darnia Tarner, Tamer? Tamer. Speaker 77 is not on the line. Thank you. Speaker 78, Zofia Jasrebis. Uh, not on the line. Speaker 80, Shira Stanfield. Hello, can you hear me? Yes, we can hear you. Go ahead to speak to council up to five minutes. Okay. Good afternoon, Mayor and Council. 
My name is Shara Stanfield, and I've lived at Twin Rainbows Housing Co-op in South Falls Creek for the last 20 years. I use a wheelchair and feel lucky to have moved into a wheelchair accessible suite while I was still a landscape architecture student at UBC while learning how to design sustainable, livable, and accessible places. I realized that my own neighborhood was one of the best examples of great urban design in the world. South Falls Creek was designed thoughtfully with people at the forefront, with human scale buildings, with public and semi-public outdoor spaces, and a seamless integration of people with various backgrounds, abilities, incomes, education, and cultures. Good urban design enabled the creation of a strong and connected community. My co-op consists of two seven-story buildings with townhouse units on the first and second floors. There are 86 units in total. We have a vibrant community, including a number of new families who've just moved into two and three bedroom units vacated by older members downsizing into smaller units. The seven-story height is human scaled with people feeling connected to the activities on the ground level, as well as to each other via external walkways on each floor. I know every single person in both buildings by name and have many close friends in the community. In contrast, most people I know who live in tall towers, whether rental or strata, do not know one single person in their building and don't feel safe or welcome where they live. Let's build housing that works for people, especially on city land. I've been on the membership committee at Twin Rainbows for the last 15 years. Whenever we open our wait list, we are absolutely flooded with applications of people desperately wanting to be part of our co-op community. The applications are from all sorts of people who want to build connections, live in community, and have housing security. Many people who apply are living in shared accommodation, are being run evicted, commute hours a day, etc. These people are teachers, artists, writers, nurses, planning professionals, project managers, and business owners. These are the average people that add vibrancy and drive the economy of our city, and we need to house them. These are people with good jobs, but still can't afford market rental or strata units, let alone family housing. We also receive hundreds of applications from people in even more desperate situations that need housing now. The city has an opportunity, and I would say an obligation, to ensure that city land is used to house all of these people. This city council has an opportunity to build on the thoughtful planning that was done 40 years ago and leave a legacy of affordable, livable, and well-run co-ops and other non-market housing. We don't need more unaffordable rental units and luxury condos. We do need more places where people want to live and can afford. New co-ops can be built affordably and financed with innovative loan instruments if the city provides the land. New market units should be built on market land and not on this scarce public land resource. I just have a few asks of council. First of all, South Falls Creek still sets a precedent for great urban design. It deserves to have a precedent setting planning process that puts people first. The creation of livable and cherished places, places are not created by starting with an asset management plan. I ask that this tape report be tabled as information only. Secondly, members of this community are some of the most engaged and knowledgeable designers, planners, and thinkers who have put countless hours into replan, and their efforts should not be dismissed. Listen to them and plan with them. Thirdly, existing, well-maintained housing offers the most affordable and immediate housing and should not be destroyed while still viable. Needless demolition further exacerbates greenhouse gas emissions. Extend South Falls Creek co-op leases and offer the 40 plus 20 that other co-ops have been offered. Let's work on adding affordable and well-designed housing while only replacing buildings at the end of their viability. Respected council members, you have an historic opportunity to change the course of unaffordable development in Vancouver and to create a legacy for generations to come. Please recommit to building places that are for people. Let's create a South Falls Creek that will be recognized around the world, uh, recognized around the world as a model for creating livable and affordable communities. Thanks for your thoughtful and care, thoughtful care and attention on making your decision. Um, I thank you for speaking to us. Very timely and uh, very much appreciated. Great. 
Um, so that's that's it for questions. We have those were the three speakers. Um, it's five eighteen. I suggest we um, we actually reconvene at six twenty. Uh, that gives us our one hour dinner break. And um, yeah, have a good dinner, everyone. Hi, this is City Moderator. Uh, the meeting has recessed and will be convened at 6.20. Uh, if you haven't spoken to Council yet, please call back at 6.20 to, to speak to Council. Uh, a 30-minute reminder email will also be sent uh, prior to the start of the meeting. Thank you. Have a good night. See you then. Bye. Yeah.
I hear shuffling on the line. Would that be Elise or David? Are you able to hear me? Yep, we can. Thanks. Perfect. I'm in the I can hear you. Great. Thank you. I'm going to mute you for now until after uh, the council portion of the standing committee. We're just going to deal with a couple um, leave of absences requests. So um, I'll let you know through Jabber when we're uh, when I've unmuted the line. Okay. Thank you.
thanks very much. Thanks very much. Um, so we're going to reconvene in council to deal with uh, urgent business. Can we have the roll call, please, uh, Deputy City Clerk? Uh, Mayor Stewart in the chair. Mm -hmm. Councillor Carr. Here. Councillor DiGenova. Councillor Fry. Councillor Swanson. Here. Councillor Hardwick. Present. Councillor Weeb. Present. Councillor Boyle. Present. Councillor Dominato. Councillor Dominato. Not here at the moment. Councillor Bly. Present. And Councillor Kirby Young. Present. You have quorum, Mayor Stewart. Thanks very much. So we just have some uh, urgent business to get through regarding some LOAs, and I think there are five. Uh, so we'll start with. Um, Councillor Bly, for personal reasons between 3 and 5 p.m. on Wednesday, October 27th. Do we have a mover for that? So moved, Councillor Kirby. Thanks. A seconder? Councillor Carr. Second. Councillor Carr is a second. Uh, all in favor, yay. 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 All those nay. Thanks very much. That passes. The second is for me uh, from 3 to 5 today for personal reasons. A mover, please. So moved, Councillor Bly. Second, Councillor Dijanova. Uh, Councillor Bly, seconded by Councillor Dijanova. Thank you. All in favor, yay. 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 Opposed, nay. That passes. Thank you. Uh, next is Councillor Dijanova for personal reasons from 5 p.m. to 11 p.m. on Thursday, October 28th. Uh, do we have a mover, please? Move. Councillor Bly. Councillor Hardwick, uh, seconded by Councillor Bly. Thanks. All in favor, yay. 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 <laughs> Opposed, nay. Passes. Thank you. Leave for absence for Councillor Dominato for personal reasons 3 to 4 p.m. on Thursday, October 28th. Can we have a mover, please? Moved. Uh, moved. Second. Uh, Dejanova. Right. Thanks. Councillor Hardwick moved by Councillor Dejanova. All in favor, yay. Yay. Opposed, nay. Great. Okay, Council, we'll recess oh, now until the conclusion of the uh, standing committee. Point of privilege, Mayor. Um, okay, go ahead. Uh, just one second. Dejanova. I'm going to advance, advance around the queue. Go ahead. Thanks. Um, Mayor Stewart, I think one of my LOA requests um, was was actually for civic business um, had not uh, made it on to here, although I left it with the clerk last meeting. It was for November okay. the 3rd. And it was, um, okay. it, I, I understand it's from 530, 530 um, onwards. Okay. So you have a mover for that, please? Move. Councilor Kirby. Second. Uh, uh, Councillor Hark Hardwick, seconded by Councillor Kirby Young. All in favor, yay. 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 Opposed, nay. Great. Okay, so now we're going to recess until the conclusion of the standing committee. And I'm going to hand it back to Councillor Carr. Thank you, Mayor. Okay. You. Um, we are um, uh, now on to speaker, <clears throat> sorry, 81 on our list, Derek O'Keefe. Derek O'Keefe on the line. Hear me now? Yeah, is that Derek O'Keefe? Yes, this is Derek O'Keefe. Thank you um, for the opportunity to speak to Council today. And thank you to the residents of False Creek South who have maintained such an organized and engaged community, even as they must have felt over the past 10 years, and especially over the past two weeks, that a sword of Damocles of sorts has been hanging over them and their home. Um, I've had the good fortune to live in co-op housing. Uh, when our first child was born just over a decade ago, um, my partner and I lived in a 450 square foot one bedroom unit at one of the only newish co-ops in the downtown area. This one was built around the turn of this century, um, but this co-op building unfortunately did not include family with children sized units, uh, with the largest units being a small two bedrooms. Uh, as I remember it, there was only one other family with a small child in that whole building. Um, so we and others looked elsewhere, hoping to stay on the downtown peninsula or near the downtown east side where my partner worked as a frontline uh, worker. Uh, so we applied for co-ops all over the place, including near the waters of False Creek, and we never got in. Uh, our experience is that of countless others, many thousands and tens of thousands of young families, and it speaks to the scarcity of co-op housing in the city. So obviously I'm eager to see and plans everywhere that have a lot more co-op housing in Vancouver, uh, there are ways to do that, but this real estate asset management plan before you now, uh, this isn't it. 
um, a plan that starts by displacing existing co-op residents and then demolish, demolishing their existing housing without guarantees of retaining affordable housing fees or family-sized units, and all of it dependent on higher levels of government kicking in, is a plan that deserves to be sent back to the drawing table. Uh, more specifically, it should be sent back to the drawing table in the planning department. Uh, this plan and the meetings and deliberations underway that seem to take the real estate asset management plan as a fait accompli uh, isn't a plan, but rather an assessment that quantifies a lot of things that really require qualitative assessment uh, and dialogue. Um, so some have invited the rest of the city's residents suffering housing precarity to sympathize with this plan by sowing resentment about those who have achieved housing security uh, in this part of the city. Uh, to this race to the bottom argument, we should think about these sentiments uh, once expressed by J.S. Woodsworth who was a dock worker who went on to be a member of parliament of some renown a long time ago. And he said, what we desire for ourselves, we wish for all. So rather than snuffing out this model of planning and land use that was based on one third, one third, one third, uh, with the first one third being low income, uh, including for them waterfront views and seawall adjacent front doors in many cases, uh, we should improve and expand on the model at False Creek South and spread it to more areas of the city. The highest and best use of our city is precisely to build inclusive, affordable communities, not to maximize profit and accumulation of capital. Um, I was surprised when I saw the slides for this plan, and I can only imagine what the residents in the co-op felt when they saw them for the first time. Uh, I looked to see that many of the co-ops built between the mid-70s and 1985, perfectly situated, near Granville Island and the water uh, were slated to be wiped out and replaced with private market housing. Um, I thought back to being at the 90th birthday party of a great civil rights leader, um, the late great Jack Liddell, um, who had his party uh, eight, nine years ago at one of these beautiful co-ops in, in the generous courtyards they had in the middle. Um, and so at some point on that day, um, my partner and I looked at each other and said like, wouldn't it be an amazing place to, to raise a family? Like, I hope we can get in uh, somewhere down here. We're fortunate to live up on the Fairview slopes now in the same general neighborhood. Uh, but when we walk down there, we still think uh, and say to each other the same thing. Um, there's been a lot of talk about equity and climate of late in the city and at this council. Uh, so I don't understand why a plan that projects demolishing buildings based on their lease expiry dates and not on their conditions um, and that starts by moving the lowest income people in the area out of their homes uh, is even, uh, should be a non-starter uh, next to their homes on the water. Uh, if we're talking about equity and climate considerations, uh, this should be a non-starter. Uh, it feels upside down. I think you should send it back and bring something back that is worthy of discussion. Profit maximization should not come before justice and the human right to housing, uh, which is really at the heart of the whole right to the city. Uh, what we desire for ourselves, we should wish for all. Uh, thank you very much for, for your time. And thank you for your time and speaking to council. There are no questions for you. You were very clear. So thank you very much. Have a good evening. Thanks. Speaker 82, Navjeet Tuana. Yeah. Yes. Here. Go ahead. We can hear you clearly. That's great. Thank you. My name is Navjeet Tuana. I'm a resident of 6th Avenue and West and Spruce. I just want to take this opportunity to thank you guys because I know there's a lot of time that you guys have spent on hearing all of our voices. I also wanted to thank all the speakers that have come through and I think they've brought up very good points in the past. I'm going to be talking about a little bit of a different topic, but that doesn't take away from the previous conversations and concerns that other speakers have raised. Um, while listening to the uh, staff, I think one of the things they referred to on 6th Avenue, our unit, basically faces Sixth Avenue, is they called it a rat race. I don't know if I appreciate being called a rat race area, but at the same time, I do realize that Sixth Avenue does need a lot of work, uh, including traffic um, calming measures, which I'm sure will be coming through when this stuff goes through planning. One of the things I did want to flag, though, was that we bought our place a year ago, and when we bought it, as you can imagine, buying any place in Vancouver, there's a lot of equity that goes into the purchase of the place. Um, at that point, we didn't realize that the front of our lot, which is a city-owned lot, and there's Falls Creek there, which we get to enjoy quite a bit of, 
would then suddenly be turned or there will be talk to turning it into a six story building and i think that's what the uh, current plan talks of um, my concern really is that that a six story building doesn't really fit the zoning for the other areas um, that the lots along fairview have as requirements i think it's not fair to have it so that you get a six story building right in front which is on um, public property that said, I do agree that there has to be the one-third rules that have to be applied. Uh, I think that's a very good opportunity. But I also think that we should consider mixing them up between everywhere, and then that way there is more conversations and more growth of the the one-third rule and the concept behind it between the different type of um, um, building types that are going to be there. Having them all in one specific zone and then not having a blend of it doesn't really give the opportunity for the intermingling. I think that's the whole concept behind it. Um, yeah, that's really it from my side. Um, my main ask would be to have it so that, if possible, uh, this be sent back to see if there could be things put in so that uh, it meets the zoning of the area, because it just would not fit into Fairview slopes. Um, our story, our building is only two-story. This is going to be a six-story right across the street. I don't know how you can say that on the private side you can have only two or three stories, but on the public side we're going to go ahead and put a six-story up. I think the units have to be there, but that might mean, you know, spreading it out a little more or coming up with more innovative plans on how we need to do that. Because I do agree that, you know, there needs to be a higher density that needs to come in. And I think everyone's in a good path of getting there. I think there needs to be just more communication in that. And part of that might be is that we need to have planning more involved with this and having them review. My ask would be to have an amendment added that uh, the area along 6th Avenue match what the existing zoning is on the other side of 6th Avenue. I'm not saying another block, I'm just saying across the street. And that way it all works better. That's all my comments. I'll take any questions if there are any. Um, there are no questions. I, you were very clear in, in your statement, so thank you very much for coming to speak yeah, to us. Thank you. Have a good day. Yep, okay. you too. Bye. Sweet speaker 83, Landon Gilmer. Speaker 83 is not on the line. Okay, thank you. Speaker 84, Jennifer Reed. Um, not on the line. Speaker 85, Marjolaine Visser. Speaker 85 is not on the line. Okay. Speaker 86 has withdrawn. Speaker 87, Louise Huygeman. Um, just one moment and we're checking with the staff. No problem. Uh, no, not on the line. Okay, um, Speaker 88, Patricia Lewis. No, not on the line. Yes, one moment, please. Okay, we're just, just uh, yes. Council, they're just checking to see if the person is here in person. It'll just be a moment for her to come into chambers. Can I take my mask off to speak? Hello, thank you for allowing me to speak today. My name is Patricia Lewis and I live at 456 Moberly Road where I have resided for the past eight and a half years. 
I was also born in Vancouver and have lived in several different areas of the city. I want to tell you a little bit about my experience living in False Creek South. I live in a freehold condo building in a horseshoe-shaped enclave that includes condos, rentals, a co-op, and a family rental housing property. In front of the co-op is a courtyard, and it connects to our strata property, which includes garden ponds and a walkway through to the seawall. We invite all the neighboring res residents to enjoy our grounds, in which we, as strata owners, pay for the upkeep of. Kids play out there, families picnic, and passerbys lounge on the grass and enjoy their takeout food from the local restaurants. I can go out for, with a coffee in the morning. Before long, another neighbor will come out for a visit and to chat about what's going on in the neighborhood. Together, we clear the seawall of debris, we look after the public planter garden, we make sure the raised bench area on city property is cleared of needles and other hazards, so that when the ladies from the daycares bring the toddlers to play and draw a chalk there, they can be safe. We are a community. We look out for each other. A young teenage boy in my building helps some of the older ladies walking their small dogs for them when they're not well or carrying out the recycling or garbage for them. A lady who rents in a neighboring building helps me with the public garden, but you will also see her out in the walkway between our buildings, helping another neighbor relearn to walk after a devastating car accident. In front of the co-op and family housing is an open area where the children learn to ride their bikes and play, surrounded by neighbors who help look out for them. Seniors enjoy an outdoor chair exercise class here. Another small group practices playing music. We meet, we get to know each other. I am paying for dental work for an older gentleman who lives in the co-op because it was at a point where he had difficulty chewing food and neither his assistance nor his meager dental plan would cover the repairs. I'm not looking for kudos. I only mention this to show what happens in these small enclaves along the creek. This is exactly why this area was developed the way it was. Further down the creek, you'll see people meeting and talking at the Charleston Dog Park and watching their dogs run around freely. The next enclave is the school and the brilliant new playground where parents meet each other, exchange childcare and other ways to help each other. An amazing community garden is also there where you can talk to your neighbor gardeners and learn about what they're growing. Everyone loves to stop at the boat co-op and wonder what life would be like to live on a boat. I met a man who has lived there for over 20 years and he was quite proud of the fact that he required very little resources to live aboard. It is so interesting to see how this little community lives together on the water. Some of the other little enclaves are not as visible from the seawall. I recently walked into one closer to Granville Island to meet with a master gardener who offered me free advice and then showed me the gardens and play areas she and her neighbors had created in the central common areas of the buildings. What I have observed in my wanderings and experience around the creek is that it is the original beautiful vision that they had for this community development so long ago that makes it work so well. This model of mixed communities living together without distinction. It is the layout of the buildings and central common areas that allow and promote the communities coming together to connect with each other. Even the guy living alone with his dog cherishes the moments when someone who has to pass by will stop and say hello. It may be his only human contact all day and it is important. Isn't this the kind of community we want to cherish and not break? We all know we have to add density. If we must, can we not do it more gently? Can we not refurbish co-ops in their current locations? Can we not block out the sun from the south with such giant towers? We are not asking to save this just for ourselves, although it may see it sound so. I think you should save it for the whole city. People travel from all over to enjoy the side of False Creek. They bring their bikes, dogs to the dog park, kids to the playground at the school, stop in at the pubs and restaurants. When the tourists visit, they love to see the diversity in different areas. How boring it would be to tour around the creek in an aqua ferry shaded by a continuous perimeter of skyscrapers. A friend from California visited me recently and as she looked out my window, she exclaimed, what happened to BC Place? I replied, it's still there, they just hid it. You see, she used to live here and had orchestrated the very first halftime entertainment for the 86 for soccer game in BC Place. When she returns to visit, she always loves to see BC Place lit up with all the colors, depending on which event was going on inside. BC Place, lit up or not, used to be in every tourist photo. Please, let's not hide another one of Vancouver's jewels. Let's work together to make it better, not just bigger. We, hear, we all hear promises every week without adding more about adding more affordable housing to Vancouver. 
What if we actually did it and only added more co-ops to Falls Creek South and added them in the same model of the existing ones with common areas in the centre? Try to imagine what a legacy you would leave. Thank you. Well, thank you. Um, there are no questions for you, but uh, you were very clear in your presentation. Thank you so much for coming and coming in person. Speaker 89, uh, Stefan Vogelfinger. Yeah, very well pronounced. Thank you very much. Good evening. I hope you can hear me well. Yes, we can hear you perfectly. Go ahead. Great. Thank you. Thank you for the opportunity to speak. So my name is Stefan Vogelfinger. I'm a resident of Creepy Co-op and I am um, opposed to the plan. I want to state that, you know, as we heard before, that co-ops co have been proven to work very well, not just for seniors, but also for young families, people of diverse backgrounds and different income levels. And while being vastly different models, I believe that this there's room for both self-governed co-ops as well as the city's own affordable housing programs to coexist. I'm concerned that the recommended option of the proposal reduces the currently 56% non-market and, uh, and co-op housing to 34%. I'm a family uh, father of two children, and um, I have concerns with um, the city um, proposing to demolish existing housing, in our case, Creek Creek Co-op, which, which has one of the highest density or higher densities in the area. And it has been third party assessed to be in good condition replacing it with a 500 foot strata tower. And that, in my opinion, is going against the Vancouver's ambition, ambitions, ambitious sustainability targets to become one of the greenest cities in North America. Then, as we heard before from other speakers, redeveloping lands should be um, considered. It doesn't make, it doesn't make really any sense to me in an affordability crisis where my friends and neighbors who may be part of Vancouver's maybe lesser privileged working middle class I'm moving away from Vancouver. Speaking for my own family, we did not own a car for the last 13 years and simply cannot afford um, market rent in this area for you know, ourselves and the two children. Um, I wonder um, why really a non-for-profit housing provider should be terminated and left with uncertain funding to build a new co-op building in a time of substantially complete um, es escalating construction costs. So I know that from my work that three bedroom units are not really feasible to build for rental or profitable, I guess. And I'm wondering what support we can expect from the city if provincial funding may not work out or mortgage providers will turn us down. I guess that ha has happened before in uh, other developments. I'm a great supporter of the city's infrastructure projects, such as the Canada Line, the Broadway um, subway, and similar public transportation pro projects. And these hubs, to me, are um, key to a function identification, and they help limiting the ever-increasing vehicular traffic, jamming local streets on a daily basis right to the Trans-Canada uh, Highway. Um, I don't understand really how this plan intends to improve the infrastructure, in particular the public, public transportation, along with the proposed densification. As parents, we are very concerned about the proposed plan, which moves corps to the south edge of the land acting as a sound barrier to what will be an ever more traffic congested West 6th Avenue. Should this neighborhood not instead be really truly mixed as it, as it is now, uh, with high density of course, and with co-ops not being integrated in the urban design, this, this model has a lot in common with the quote-unquote poor door concept being taken to the next level. The proposed plan, in my mind, is, is really, at this stage at least, a missed opportunity and is lacking of a true vision or expansion of the original idea of the founders of this neighborhood, which made South Falls Creek truly unique and successful. This is something that is worth to maintain, protect, and enhance. And as I have spoken before, I guess I can lie myself uh, up there that, you know, this, that this has been drafted behind closed doors, or that's the appearance. It comes as a shocking surprise to us, as we were led to believe that our community associations would be involved in a productive and open and more, most importantly, transparent process. So I hope this will, you know, be improved before and, and, and reconsidered before um, it becomes a reality that um, we 
we might not, you know, as a, for my family, we may not uh, may not be around um, if this gets um, if this this proceeds as proposed. So thank you for listening and your consideration. I understand it's very late. Thank you very much. And thank you very much for um, speaking to council and speaking very, very clearly in terms of, of, of your, your um, input. Uh, there are no questions for you. Have a good evening. Thank you. You have a good evening too. Thank you. Bye-bye. Speaker 90, Evan Kligman. Uh, Speaker 90 is not on the line. Thank you. Speaker 91, Michael Farrell. Good uh, evening, Mayor and Councillors. Uh, my name's Michael Farrell. I'm opposed to this plan. I just got a couple of points to make. The building of any new car passing on 6th Avenue relies on funding from federal and provincial governments, which has not been agreed. The plan states all co-ops will be demolished with new buildings built in their place. This leaves many families and elderly people in a very stressful position of not knowing for sure if they will have a place to call home in the years ahead. Also, the moving of all co-ops housing to 6th Avenue and most of the new market housing along the seawall means this will not be the mixed community that makes Falls Creek South such a great area to live in. I live in Creekview Co-op, which me and my 12-year-old son son are very thankful for. Before that, I had a very stressful time finding affordable housing in Vancouver. I am for new housing. I think there should be more homes on this land, but not at the cost of the affordable housing that already exists here. And just to finish off, just um, I've got a story, just a little story about my son, because in the co-op, we have to help out. We have to do something towards the co-op and I help out in the garden. And during the summer, I had to go down and sand a couple of chairs in the garden, which is, you know, you can imagine not the best jobs, but especially not for a 12-year-old boy who um, offered to help me, which is my son, come down and help me sand the, the chairs over a Saturday and a Sunday in the summer. And when we went down the second day to do it, I was quite surprised that he, he wanted to do it, to be honest, because we was down there for two hours each day, I think. But when I looked at him, he was actually smiling. And when I asked him why he's smiling, you know, because you're standing in the chair, you, you're not really smiling when you're doing that. He said, because he just felt good inside that he was helping out his home and his community. So that means not just when you walk through your front door, that means your actual surroundings, the gardens, the, the, the old area. So, that's it, really. So that's why I want to phone in. And I thank you for your time for letting me speak. Um, and thank you for your time. Um, very much appreciated by council. There's um, no questions for you. So have a good evening. Okay. Thank you. Thanks. Good night. Uh, council speakers, twen uh, 92, Susan uh, Denel and 93, John Paul Perron have both withdrawn. Um, so we are on to speaker 94, Peter Fisher. Thank you, Mayor and City Council and all of the speakers. My name is Peter Fisher of Alder Bay Co-op. As a resident of False Creek South for more than 20 years in both strata leasehold and co-op housing, I implore you to please take the real estate division's vision of our neighborhood as information. And begin collaboration with the city planning department and most importantly, the community of False Creek South itself. The speed with which this plan was brought to motion after its release is alarming. After years and years of the community requesting to have integral input and a seat at the planning table, this quite honestly feels dishonest, rushed, and honestly like a fait accompli. But it's not too late. There are some good things about this plan. The campus of care feature is commendable, necessary, and appreciated. Adding density to accommodate a growing population is also important. What I am most concerned about is how this plan segregates our community, starkly dividing an integrated and diverse neighborhood into a two sides of the tracks kind of place. What makes our current community the talk of the world and a model to follow 
is the side-by-side-by-side integration of market, co-op, and rental housing with a mixture of all socioeconomic status, even and often within the same enclave. I raised a family in this context, and I'm very proud of how our two boys grew into young men who value and embody inclusivity, diversity, and empathy with all people. The community indelibly nurtured this outlook in them through lived experience. It is the air they breathe here. The real estate division's vision of our community pollutes this fresh air and segregates people. The purple people, rental and co-op of their proposal will be displaced from their homes and pushed to the periphery. Not quite on the other side of the tracks, but on the rails and on the margins, certainly not in the midst, side by side, at the table of this wonderful neighborhood as they are now. While those with the means to purchase new strata lots will have a prime place in this restructured community that might become a model for maximizing profits for real estate boards and developers around the world, but no longer for those who champion diversity inclusion, sustainability, and holistic placemaking. The ecological costs of bulldozing buildings that may be nearing the end of their leases, but nowhere near the end of their life expectancy is also a huge concern, particularly for a city that aspires to be the greenest metropolis in the world. Again, I ask you to please take this purple people eater plan back to the drawing board and view it anew through the valued lenses your constituents expect you to view these matters with. Inclusivity, sustainability, affordability, collaboration, empathy, compassion, and dare I say, love. Love for our neighbors, our neighborhood, and a city that can become something all her citizens can be proud of and call home. Let's create a progressive vision for False Creek South, not an aggressive one, nor a regressive one that divides and conquers with a chief aim to line the pockets of those whose vision is focused primarily on profit. We are better than this. You are better than this. Thank you for your time and your careful deliberation. I wish you and all of us Vancouverites a bright, sustainable, and equitable future. May it be so. May it be soon. Thank you. Thank you very much for um, for such a passionate. Uh, oh, before you go, don't leave the line. You actually have questions um, from Councillor okay. Hardwick. Go ahead, Councillor Hardwick. Up to three minutes. I just wonder if you could repeat that line for me, it was to take a progressive vision, not an, yeah. not an oppressive vision, not a regret. Not Could you a, repeat that? Not, yes. Let's create a progressive vision, dear councillors, for False Creek South, not an aggressive one, nor a regressive one that divides and conquers with a chief aim to line the pockets of those whose vision is focused primarily on profit. Beautiful. Thank you very much. Thank you, Con Councillor Hardwick, very thank much. You. Thanks, wow. Councillor Hardwick, and thank you, um, Paul uh, Peter Fisher, um, for your presentation. Have a good You're very evening. welcome. Good night. Good night. Good night. Um, Council Speaker ninety five has withdrawn. Speaker ninety six, Chelsea Durant. Hello. Hello. We can, can hear you, you clearly. Okay? Yep. Go ahead. Thank you. Thank you. My name is Chelsea Durant, and I live in Creekview Co-op in South Creek with my husband and my two-year-old daughter. I am not in support of this plan as it is currently proposed. I do not believe that the plan for co-op will be realistic for the majority of those who currently live in them, and there is too much left unexplained, creating extreme uncertainty for the future of established, well-run, and well-maintained co-op communities. Only hearing from 28% of the community is not taking proper consideration of the needs of the people who built this community and make it what it is. This plan will fundamentally impact the beautiful quality of life that families have here and will actually displace many of its residents. 
My husband and I moved into Kuku Co-op when our daughter was five days old, and the community, friends, and support we have found here has been irreplaceable. I dream of a future where I can walk my daughter to school with her best friend, who lives in our building, who she's known since she was three months old. I dream of more summer spent in our communal yard with our friends and our neighbors, sharing a drink and watching our children play and grow together. I dream of a future that maintains a community that ensures that the senior residents in our building aren't isolated and they have people who want to chat with them and be a part of their life. And I dream of a future that is financially stable where we can afford to save for our daughter's future. This proposal has the potential to take all of this away. I urge you to consider the implications of this plan. It is rushed, and despite what's being said today, or on um, Thursday of last week, it could result in perfectly good housing being destroyed before its time, which will also have environmental implications. While I do not oppose change and growth in False Creek, I believe this plan is extremely misguided and the wrong kind of change. I urge the council and the mayor, Mr. Stewart, to take into consideration that the plan for False Creek should be created for the betterment of the people in this community and not just to capitalize on land values. I voted for Mr. Stewart because I believed you when you said creating affordable housing was your goal for our city. Your previous expressed support of this plan is concerning to me, given this plan has too many unknowns, provides an uncertain future for co-ops and affordable housing in the False Creek area, and could potentially result in a decrease of affordable housing and the loss of large, much needed three and four bedroom family units. This plan as currently proposed, bluntly put, feels like a potential bait and switch, and I feel it will ensure the demise of this community as we know it. This community is beautiful and diverse, and it needs to stay that way. Thank you very much for your time. And thank you for your time. There are, uh, there are no questions for you. That was um, very clear. Thank you very much for coming to speak to council tonight. Speaker 97, Wanda Yip. Thank you for the opportunity to speak. My name is Wanda Yip, and I have lived in Pacific Cove, a freehold building, for 30 years. Salt Creek South has been a world-class best practice model for decades. It is a rare, special, and wonderful community. The residents here want to preserve it that way. Basically, we don't want anything to mess with what works or to have our ideal place to live destroyed. I am opposed to the conceptual plan because of the following reasons. In business, projects are managed in a professional manner, starting with a high level scope and outline of what the major phases will be. Ballpark estimates of time and cost are provided as time goes on, all these aspects are worked out in more detail. Everyone is kept in the loop as things evolve. What happens here instead in Falls Creek South feels like, well, you just wait and wait and wait and wait, and then you'll see. And then surprise, guess what I decided your fate will be? It seems for decades, despite leaseholders ask for clarity on what happens upon lease expiry, the city did not manage expectations well. They seemed to be kept in the dark. If leases were not going to be renewed and existing buildings were going to be demolished permanently, I think that should have been communicated decades ago, not at the 11th hour just before the lease expired. The city delayed the decision for decades just saying we're working on it and developed this plan behind closed doors in the last few years. Did not provide transparency as a public body should and basically did not act in good faith with this community. They could have engaged them as trusted partners because their lives depend on the outcome. The proposed three times the density is excessively high to me. That's not a moderate increase. It's 300%, not 30%. It will uh, destroy our ideal community design. The spaciousness that we currently treasure and our enjoyment of the precious seawall and will turn a well-designed, low-rise living area into a dense cluster of tall towers. Imagine what the impact of three times the density in your own current living space would be. Three times as many people in every single room, every one on top of each other, with no privacy or tranquility. Nobody would want that. The only increased density I support is filling in vacant land with low-rise buildings 
similar to what exists in the neighborhood now. The greatest need would probably be for senior housing, such as assisted living or complex care, as the aging population here is increasing and facilities to age in place would be kindly appreciated. The seawall traffic would increase by three times. Just as the pandemic has started to cause it to be on the weekends and the weeknights, and it makes it way too congested, not enjoyable, and downright dangerous. So three times, three times is like nine times, which is like the Lionsgate Bridge during rush hour, basically a parking lot. Even now, electric bikes, especially, they zoom by at recklessly high speeds like a motorized scooter and can potentially injure slow-moving seniors and toddlers. Frankly, I don't think they belong on the seawall because these speeding hazards are just accidents waiting to happen. And an injury for a senior, that could be long-term or a lifetime of pain and suffering. The proposed skyscrapers, that's what I term anything taller than our existing buildings now, are out of character for this neighborhood and no one wants them. Our legacy design and our current density should be preserved and protected just like any heritage homes are. Skyscrapers are market rate, high cost uh, rentals or uh, freehold um, buildings. They will bring in foreign owners who, as you know, have kept on inflating real estate prices, which are already too high and keep making Vancouver more and more unaffordable for locals. Every year it gets harder to live here. So many people have either moved away to every corner of BC or turned into the homeless. Personally, I also think that in case of an earthquake, skyscrapers could pose a potential threat to block the adjacent bridges because parts of a building might fall off onto the bridge, thereby cutting off a major transportation route during an emergency crisis. The ramifications are huge, blocking a major artery for communities north of Vancouver. This plan negatively impacts low-income people the most. It feels like a bomb going off in your neighborhood, demolishing buildings and forcing people to move out of the only home that they've known for decades. That's a devastating disruption and a traumatizing source of stress to people's finances and their well-being. And um, actually, you've, uh, sorry, if I could just um, interrupt you, uh, Wanda, you've, um, just, you've run out of time. You're, you're quite over your five minutes. Thank you very much for um, for speaking to us and um, uh, making a, a number of, of, of very cogent points. Thank you. Um, that moves us to speaker 98, Peter Prohoda, his uh, speaker in here in person. Okay, you, the person's not available or not here. Um, speaker 99, Larry Green. Uh, speaker 99 is not on the line. Thank you. Speaker 100 has withdrawn. Uh, speaker 101, Sean Conway. Hi, are you able to hear me okay? Yes, we can hear you just perfectly. Go ahead, up to five minutes. Hey, thank you, Mayor and Councillors, for the opportunity to speak with you in opposition to this conceptual development plan. My name is Sean Conway, and I live in Falls Creek South in the Falls Creek Co-op with my wife and our two children. So like the vast majority of residents, I welcome the increase in density and the opportunity to provide more affordable housing in Falls Creek. However, I'm asking you to simply accept this report as information and to engage in a more thorough and meaningful planning process that better tries to retain the current ratio of non-market to market housing that preserves existing affordable housing and ensures that the final design will truly build community, preserve equity, and honor the successful legacy of this important neighborhood. As I've listened to the speakers so far, and it's, it's been amazing to hear so many people talk so movingly about what this neighborhood means to them. And who really have firsthand experience of what makes it such a loved and unique community. I think of the work of researcher Richard Wilkinson at Equality Trust, who wrote the book, The Spirit Level, Why Equality is Better for Everyone. His research has found that even in affluent societies, if there are huge economic disparities between people in cities, regions, or countries, then there are enormous costs to that in terms of social trust and social cohesion, violence, mental health, and drug addiction, and social mobility. 
When I read this research, I think immediately of Vancouver, a city with both enormous and growing wealth and increasing crime and seemingly intractable social problems. But I also think of the success of False Creek South, a neighborhood where these economic divisions are not so sharp and where equity is more deliberately interwoven into the fabric of the community and where there are a wide range, where a wide range of residents feel at home connected to and respected by each other who work together and have a commitment for the common good. This neighborhood is a living example of how equality is better for everyone and all residents, including upper income residents, not to mention middle and lower income residents, benefit from living in societies with a more equal distribution of incomes. But despite all this, I can't help but feel that the plan presented to you has been a failure process. I don't wanna say it's an abusive process, but it feels honestly to many of us that the process here has been gamed. Here are a group of residents who have you as heard, as you have heard, welcome density, development, diversity, change, greater affordability in a Vancouver that is better for everyone, but who are now afraid, frustrated, and quite simply exhausted by a process that is not meaningfully engaged with them, but that is instead largely largely just surveyed them, and which has resulted in a plan that arrives in very short notice and that is very nearly a worst case scenario after so many years of uncertainty and anxiety already. While you're told that this plan is just a starting point, it is actually an end point. Even though, as it is said, the blocks may move and the blocks may change in size, you're being asked to approve a plan that ultimately, in the end, will reverse the central pillar of the successful design of this community, the equitable socioeconomic breakdown, not to mention not to mention demolishing people's homes, perhaps unnecessarily. I'm sure you do not think that this plan is the best option for False Creek. However, are you fully convinced that this plan is the only option for False Creek? Have the risks and the alternatives been fully considered? Have enough people been at the table to contribute to this plan? Has the right ex expertise been sought? Have the right questions been asked? Consider Councillor Hardwick's very telling question um, to staff about why the planners would not simply try to replicate the successful pattern of socioeconomic breakdown in the development of Falls Creek. That is, why not simply use the infill and underdeveloped site and simply repeat the pattern that has been so successful so far? And the response, if I understand the question, the response, the response was that this option had not been tested. That is astonishing that the least contentious and seemingly most viable option for the neighborhood was not tested. And consider speakers like Brian Palmquist, a true expert in exactly this type of project in this very area, who implied that the cost of soil remediation and construction may exceed the value of the land itself. Or experts like Tom Armstrong, who has spoken about other funding models that may not necessitate the types of changes that this plan proposes. So I ask you to simply step back for a moment from this plan, from this whole process, and ask yourself what your vision of False Creek would be. Would your dream for False Creek be what this plan proposes? Or would your vision for False Creek be a plan that does its best to preserve and replicate what has made this one of the most successful examples of urban planning in the world. Thank you. And thank you. Um, very much appreciate uh, your your comments tonight. Um, they were they were very clear. Uh, there are no questions, but really appreciate you coming and have a good evening. Speaker 102, Chris Yakimov. Uh, speaker 102 is not on the line. Thank you. Speaker 103, Spencer Durant. Speaker 103 has withdrawn. Okay, thank you. Speaker 104, Michael Talbot. Good evening. My name is Michael Talbot. Can you hear me okay? Uh, perfectly. Go ahead, up to five minutes. Ah, I'm a member of the Greater Vancouver Floating Home Co-op. Peter Prehoda is the president of our board and is unable to be here this evening. I'm going to play a recording of Peter's presentation, assisted by staff from the city clerk's office who are handling the slides. 
Pardon me? Did, you, did he have, does he have slides? Oh, sorry. Okay, I'm not seeing them myself, but. We're just waiting, speaker, to get them up on the public screen. Okay, they're up on the screen now. Go ahead. And we'll uh, reset, should we reset that timer? Thank you. Go ahead, Michael Talbot. Thank you. I mean, sorry. Yes, go ahead. Um, is the speaker still on the line? Okay. This is city moderator. The speaker is on the line. Thanks. Thank you. I apologize. I'm just going to start the presentation again. If we could please begin with slide number one. I would like to begin by acknowledging the obvious effort city staff put into this report and grateful for council's diligence and perseverance in pursuing a balanced outcome. Slide two, please. My name is Peter Perhoda and I am the current president of the Greater Vancouver Floating Home Co-op, representing the interests of over 100 co-op members who live aboard the vessels in what is referred to in the city report as the floating co-op. We live full-time on our boats, are self-governed and stewards of the environment. Slide three, please. The marina has, uh, was designed with the community in mind, built in the form of a star with a central hub for shared facilities. We know each other by name and help each other daily. Kids in our co-op at Fall Creek Elementary assist older co-op members, some in their 90s, with the chores. Membership is sought after in the Liveaboard community, so currently we have a Liveaboard membership waitlist that extends beyond 10 years. Slide four, please. As stated in the report, we have two leases. One is a provincial government water lot lease to the city. The co-op sublease is from the city. The second is a land lease for our underground parking and both end in 2036. With this date nearing, we're eager to discuss our future with city staff, how it falls within the future of Falls Creek South conceptual development plan. And the co-op has made multiple requests to discuss this further with city staff, but have been unable to get any traction at this time. Slide five, please. Our primary concern with the staff's report is that our co-op receives no mention, other than the likely relocation of our existing parking garage at the end of our lease to make room for the new school. In Appendix B, there is a summary of the Provisional Resident Protection and Retention Plan for Falls Creek South, approved by Council in 2018. Here, the support to be given for six different categories of tenure are laid out from the non-market social housing through to, uh, to community care units. However, in the 2018 plan itself, there's a seventh category, Liveaboard Co-op. I quote the city's provisional policy from the table on page 10, quote, intention to support retention of these residents, specific assistance to be determined prior to the finalizing the RPRP, end quote. Some of our members have lived in our co-op for over 40 years and others like myself are raising families here. We feel reassured that in the recent past, Council has seen fit to support our continued residents in Falls Creek. We request this Council put forward an amendment that Appendix B of the staff's report include the provisions made for the Greater Vancouver Floating Home Co-op under the Provisional Resident Protection and Retention Plan. Another concern is the future of Falls Creek South report addressing land use only. The report section on addressing current lease ends states, quote, upon lease end, the parking lot associated with the Liverboard Co-op would be transferred to the city. And it is anticipated that the site would be redeveloped as part of phase one, end quote. The land and water lot leases are inextricably linked, however, and to consider the future of one without discussing the future of the other is detrimental to our co-op's existence. Has city staff anticipated the future of our water lot lease? Have there been any conversations with the provincial government in regards to the future of the water lot lease? Staff refers to this Falls Creek plan as being much like a Rubik's Cube, where moving one piece affects others and our co-ops water and land leases are a prime example. Therefore, we request council see fit to include the Greater Vancouver Floating Home Co-ops water lot lease in the future planning of this report. 
In a report of such broad scope, it is understandable that detailed before shore planning would not be undertaken at this stage, but our city comes to life because of the people who live in it. Engagement is how we can create vibrant communities. If this plan moves forward, we'd like to see a commitment to the establishment of a governance and stewardship role for the community in the future planning process. We're grateful for the opportunity to participate in a conversation with the city today and trust that we will be fully recognized as an active member of the Falls Creek South community during the planning stage. The Greater Vancouver Floating Home Co-op is such a great example of mixed income community entrepreneurship, sustainable living, environmental stewardship, and contribution to the neighborhood. It would be a loss for the community to not have it as part of the future of Vancouver. We feel we have a lot to contribute to the future and character of Falls Creek South and are excited to participate in the redevelopment planning process. As residents, we are we ask to be included in the future plans along with the other residents of Falls Creek South. Yes. I thank you very much. Okay, thank you. Um, and I, I'm just going to verify. Um, is this Peter Prohoda or Michael Talbot? Um, I'm Michael Talbot, and you've just been listening to Peter Prohoda. Okay, so the two of you were together. I, uh, uh, our clerk said that uh, Peter Prohoda wasn't on the line. I guess you were just all, both together. Thank you. I just wanted clarification on that. Uh, you have for the procedure, Excuse me. Um, <clears throat> Yes, go ahead, Councillor. Yeah, I Councilor believe that. Young. The, the, thanks. I believe the speaker said prior to that 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 was a pre-recorded message that the speakers were not together that's that's correct and i, I didn't think that that was permissible under I, the procedure by i did not realize that it was a pre-recorded message um but given uh, that it's, it's a I, I i did check with the clerk's office prior to this and they said it was in order to play a presentation okay that's great thank you um, that's that's your answer, Councillor Kirby Young. Um, and there is there are questions. So to this would be to Michael Talbot. Questions? Yes. Yes. Go ahead, Councillor Hardwick. Up to three minutes. Well, my question was really if the slides of the presentation would be made available to uh, Council. The, the clerk, the city clerk's office, have them. So I assume it's quite possible. Okay, well, great. Thank you very much. Appreciate the presentation. Thank you. Okay. And that's, that, that, that is it, it for your questions. Thank you very much, uh, Michael. Um, have a good evening. Thank you. Council uh, clerks need um, a five minute break. Uh, we are without, just so that you know, we are without the TELUS operator tonight. So um, staff internal to the city are handling the calls. There are some unidentified callers that, that we're not able to. Um, uh, to identify the system we have is different than to tell us, so they would like that opportunity to identify the unidentified callers. Five minutes um, would be enough time, and that means we will reconvene at 725.
Okay, we're reconvening um, and uh, staff have, have sorted out the list. So we are now on speaker 105, um, Louis Viegas. Speaker 105 on the line. Uh, speaker 105 is not in the chamber. Oh, yes, that's right. It was supposed to be in person. That's right. Okay. Speaker 106, Peter uh, Waldrick, Waldkirk, sorry. Oh, hi there. Can you hear me? Uh, yes, you're a little faint. Can you speak maybe a little closer to your mic? How's this? Oh, that's better. Much better. Go ahead. I'll, I'll try to speak right into it. Thank you. Go ahead. Uh, so uh, thank you, Council. I'm here to express my, my qualified support for this proposal, qualified recognizing that this is only a high-level plan that we've further developed over the coming decade. But I do want to touch on a few principles uh, I hope you will keep in mind. And the basic, I think, basic idea of this plan is good to first build on empty Peter, land. Peter, excuse me. Peter, can you hear me? Um, yeah. You're, you're fading yes, in and out a bit. Could you please um, speak more closely into your mic? Thank you. I'm trying my best. Uh, I'll start over again and hopefully uh, I'll be able to do it. No, okay, we heard the beginning of it. Work. You just faded out at the end. Just continue on. Thank you. Uh, so the basic idea of this plan is good to build first on empty land and then as the leases expire to redevelop. And I think that's because of the first big principle here I really want you to keep in mind. We're talking here about 80 acres of publicly owned land. And we are in a housing crisis. Now, I think you all have an obligation to use this land as effectively as possible. And that means you have an obligation to think, yes, of course, and importantly, of current residents, but also of future residents. Because this isn't just a plan for today. It's a plan for the 2050s and beyond. 80 acres of public land is a tremendous resource. Is there anything else in the whole city like it? I, I don't think so. People often say that public land needs to be a big part of the solution to the housing crisis, and I agree. And I think that means you must take this opportunity and the duty you owe very seriously. Right off the bat, I think it's worth comparing this plan to Sanok, which is not far away. Both call for about 6,000 homes. But Sanok is on only about 12 acres, while here you have 80. Now, I think Sanok much more accurately reflects sort of housing need that exists in Vancouver. And the first phase of this plan, which I don't think will even com be complete until the late 2030s or the 2040s, that only contemplates adding another 1,900 or so new homes. That's just not enough. Now, you have heard from many, many residents that they're not opposed to density here. I say, great, take them at their word and think big, because this is an opportunity to build substantial amounts of publicly owned housing, which I think is a great objective. Because if you do think big here and think beyond low and mid-rise housing, that height and density could unlock tremendous value, public value, for the city that it could use to equitably and justly create a lot of affordable housing. Because personally, I'm concerned more about absolute numbers, how much housing and how much below market and affordable housing can actually be created as opposed to only percentages. Because, for example, you've heard a lot about the inequity of putting uh, the plan supposedly puts all the co-ops and below market housing only along six. And I mean, I agree with that. I think it's important to legalize housing off materials. And I think it should be a priority to ensure that there is a lot of below market and co-op housing on the waterfront as part of this plan as it moves forward. Now, I note that the alternative proposal only seems to suggest housing along six or around the bridges, which I don't think is a very satisfactory alternative. And I will also note what is the obvious reality here. The only way to get more below market housing on the waterfront is to eventually redevelop that land with higher density housing as the current leases expire. Otherwise, you're committed to putting most new residents onto the arterials, and I don't think that's fair either. So as you move forward with this, I urge you to be realistic about leveraging what tools the city has available to it. You 
don't have the sort of cash that senior levels of government can provide, and I, of course, urge you to pursue as much funding as possible, what you do have here is land, a lot of it. And it's a public resource, so I urge you to please don't squander it. And those are my comments. That's great. Thank you so much for those comments. That was very clear. And there are no questions for, oh, wait, there are questions for you. Um, Councillor Weeb, go ahead with up to three minutes of questions. Yeah, thanks for coming to speak today. Um, we continue to hear that all the co-ops are along 6th Avenue. Um, however, when you do look at the graph, it is a mixture. Can you talk a little bit more about what you're seeing um, in the kind of report here? And because I do see kind of closer to Alder Bay, there's a good mixture and over by the east side of Charleston Park. So I'm just wondering, is it just the kind of main section there that's kind of the biggest concern or what is the main concern? Well, I agree. I've heard uh, a lot that, um, you know, the the plan um, proposes to put all of the below market and co-op housing along 6th. I don't really see that in the plan. I know it's in particular phase 1.3 quite specifically includes below market seniors housing and co-ops uh, as close to the waterfront as you can get, uh, given the existence of the current buildings. Um, and so uh, I don't quite see some of those fears in the report, I, it's entirely possible I'm missing something. Um, and as I understand the report, it's basically saying, you know, there's this land right along the water that's currently, you know, does have buildings occupying it. Um, uh, the, those won't be developed, I think, until, as I read the plan, until phase two, which isn't until the 2040s and beyond, really. Um, and so I think the basic sort of reality of how space works is that if we want to increase the amount of below market housing uh, that's off six, that's off the arterials, the only way to do that is to eventually um, sort of uh, redevelop uh, uh, the land. Because I agree it would be unjust to sort of put only below market housing, uh, put all of the below market housing along six and preserve the waterfront only for sort of luxury housing. I agree that would be a terrible outcome. I don't really see that in the plan. Um, uh, so that's my reading of it at least. Okay, but you agree that we should have a mixture of tenure so that people don't know which door is which and it's just a community um, as seen today. Oh, absolutely. Uh, very strongly. Absolutely. Yes. Okay. Thank you very much. Appreciate it. Okay, thank you. Great. Um, thank you uh, very much. That was clear. Councillor Weeb, thanks for your questions. Um, so have a good evening, Peter. Uh, Speaker 107, Valerie Dolgan. Just want to make sure that everyone can hear me. Yes, we can hear you clearly. Go ahead for five oh, minutes. Okay. Okay, lovely. Um, yes, so good evening, Chair and Councillors. Thanks for this opportunity to speak. My name is Valerie Dolgan, and I grew up in Falls Creek Co-op at 893 Sawyers Lane, where my, my parents continue to live. And I am I'm phoning in today again to voice my concern about the latest plan to redevelop the Falls Creek lands. I'm sure that what I'm saying this evening will, will echo what a lot of other people have said, but I do want to add the weight of yet another voice to the argument of, about um, wanting to ensure that there will be a full consultation with the current residents of the, of the co-ops and residents of the area at this uh, who live there at this time. I was very happy to hear last week that there will be a consultation plan and I uh, really advocate for that to be a robust conversation that really takes the time to pay attention to what current residents are saying. And uh, in addition, I wanted to just um, again lend my voice to those who have come before me and said that that the demolishing of the co-op housing in the next 15 years would be a mistake. These these buildings are uh, are in very good condition now. They've been meticulously maintained by the co-op since their their construction, and they will be viable far into the future. And to tear them down now before they are at the end of their life would be a, a waste of taxpayer funds, and not to mention the amount of environmental damage and waste that would be created from tearing down buildings that are in perfectly good condition. And um, as the, the previous caller stated, you know, there, there are 80 acres of land here and they're, they are in very good use. This is a valuable piece of land, not, not 
as a place for building and developing, but as a place where people come to walk their dogs, spend their time, have picnics in the park, look out over the water, look out over the park. There is more to this space than simply looking at it as the next place for high rises or Yale Town North. And um, I think that we need to think as in terms of whole communities when we think about land because it is incredibly valuable. And uh, again, in terms of the, the co-op itself and having a conversation with the people who live there, the importance of that is of understanding that these co-ops, as many people have said before me, are self-sustaining, they're self-governing, what um, is sometimes called affordable housing in the community is run by a rental company. And that's where you start to see that the buildings are not always maintained to the level of where uh, residents would want them. And so these co-ops are self-sustaining. They are important parts of the lives of the residents, and they are so much more than just um, a, value piece of, a valuable piece of land to be redeveloped. And I'm sure that the city, with all of its creativity, and city, uh, city staff with all of their creativity, can find a, uh, a solution that will allow for the maintenance of these communities to go on and uh, for children uh, you know, like me to grow up in a beautiful part of town where um, they can know their neighbors and understand what community means. And uh, I, I really urge you to go back to the drawing table um, with, uh, with this plan. Thank you very much. Um, and thank you uh, very much for your presentation. Very clear and uh, well-timed. Uh, there are no questions for you. Have a, have a wonderful evening, though. Thank you so much. Thank you very much. Uh, speaker 108, Ann Duke. Good evening, Mayor and Council. My name is Ann Duke. I am a member of Alder Bay Cooperative in Southeast Falls, South Falls Creek. My husband, Lawrence, our two young daughters, and myself moved here from East Vancouver in 1998. We had been on a wait list for four years for this particular co-op. We have lived here now for 23 years. Lawrence worked at Emily Carr on Granville Island, so his commute was a two minute walk to work. Our children went to Falls Creek Elementary School, a safe walk or bike ride of five minutes. Most everything in our life was a walk away, a sustainable way of life. It was with fear, anger, and uncertainty about the future that I read the recent news of development plans for South Falls Creek. I read about the possible demolition of our home through the news. Think for a minute of how that might make you feel personally. We care about our home. We are active members of our cooperative. We volunteer on committees and have been board members at different times. Together with other members, we have worked actively to ensure that our buildings are well maintained and updated so that they will last for a long time. We embrace this wonderful life of working together with our neighbours and having people close by for support in so many different ways. Through the pandemic, it has been especially valuable. We feel so fortunate to be part of this cooperative in this neighbourhood of South Falls Creek. It was designed so creatively many years ago as a model for a livable, mixed income and diverse neighbourhood. As the saying goes, why fix what ain't broke? I know you have heard a lot of these thoughts from others, so I will focus on two things that are a priority for me. They are children and green space. Our girls, Olivia and Sophie, would tell you that they were lucky to grow up here. No worry about cars, they could go outside safely to play in the abundant green space. At their neighborhood school, they made friends for life. As they reached their teenage years, they were part of a youth program at the community center where they widened their circle and learned life leadership skills. They both got jobs at the water park and then went on to leading summer programs for kids. They felt valued growing up here and had good mentorship from many adults in their lives. The youth were referred to the youth have referred to themselves as creakers and they still do to this day. Now about the green space, we have watched the trees and gardens mature over these 23 years. I think the walkways and paths through the complexes here are so lovely. At Alder Bay Cooperative, we have two courtyards with much of the gardens maintained by our members. Every summer, we have a community potluck picnic in the East Courtyard with games for the kids and entertainment by the members in the later evening. 
It is a highlight of the summer. I invite you to come and take a walk around our courtyards and experience their beauty. It is a haven for all, including the birds. I can sit and watch in my living room and watch birds all day from our two windows. There are many nests in the trees next to our living room windows. We see red-winged blackbirds, robins, chickadees, woodpeckers, and many more. There are a couple of hummingbirds who declare their territory daily and feed at the fuchsias on our deck and at our hummingbird feeder. What happens to all of them when the wrecking ball comes in? What happens to all of our treasured gardens? It is my hope that you will not consider this plan before you. It will not be the same kind of home for future children if they are in a six-story building along the highway that is Sixth Avenue. They will not have the freedom to play in our beautiful green spaces. The demolition that this plan suggests is not necessary when so many of these buildings are in good shape. Density can be increased and replan has been looking at ways to do that for years. Let's do it in a way that makes this community sustainable with the mixed and diverse population that was intended so many years ago. Segregation does not work and it is not what Vancouver is all about. Let's put people living together in sustainable and healthy communities before profit. Thank you very much for your time. Um, and thank you for your time and, uh, and your presentation, very clear. Um, there are no questions to you, so thank you very much for coming and have a good evening. Um, and we are now moving on to speaker 109, Mary McDonald. Hi, uh, Chair Carr, uh, Mayor and Council, can you hear me okay? Yes, we can hear you perfectly, go okay. ahead. Great. Um, my name is Mary McDonald. I'm a resident of, um, sorry, I'm a False Creek South Strata lease owner, taxpayer, and resident of the city of Vancouver. I'm speaking today because it is a privilege to have a voice. 15 years ago, we were just starting out in our careers and family life, and we could find no better place in our price range to envision raising our kids. I am fortunate to own my home. But rest assured, buying a strata leasehold property in False Creek has been the worst financial decision of our lives. We are now priced out of a city that continues to build more and more, yet gets less and less affordable. It's very hard to decide what to say in a forum like this. I'm not an expert and I have no answers. There have been more eloquent, eloquent and knowledgeable speakers um, but what I would like to express is this. We are scared and we've lost trust. I first spoke to city council on the topic of lease end and lease extension when I was pregnant with my second child, who's now 14 years old. We've been living in uncertainty since then. We have seen city councillors and city staff come and go over that time. I have grown cynical and have given up hope that the city of Vancouver will negotiate and engage in good faith with us on our lease end options. Two, uh, we have invested in our buildings. Many of them are in good repair and they have many, many useful years of life left. We've maintained and updated structures to take us into the future. Our own strata just recently, while re repairing our parkades, also took the opportunity to add electric vehicle chargers. Number three, please extend our leases, both co-op and strata for the long term. Please give us that security, then let us work alongside you to find a way forward in a fair and equitable way to expand our community in the spirit of the original plan. Don't push us out of our homes and I believe we can be part of the solution. We are engaged and invested in our neighborhood because it is a unique and wonderful community. False Creekers are diverse. We come from near and far, from all walks of life, across all abilities and all ages. It will be hard to please everyone, but I hope you agree that the False Creek community does have something to offer in its design going forward. Thank you for the opportunity to be heard tonight. Thank you um, very much for speaking. And again, that was clear. Uh, there are no questions, um, but I very much appreciate 
uh, your uh, your time with us. Thank you. Um, that's moving us to one speaker one hundred and nine, Mary McDonald. Um, we're on uh, speaker one hundred and ten. Um, we just heard from one hundred and nine. And speaker, oh, I'm sorry. And speaker one hundred and ten um, is not on the line at this not time. Not on the line. Not on the line. Okay, um, Speaker 111, Lynn Garreau. Hello, can you hear me? Yes, we hear you clearly. Oh, yep. thank you. Um, dear Council and Mayor, my name is Lynn Garreau. I've been a resident of Falls Creek South for over 30 years, and I'm opposed to the plan as presented. Over those 30 years, over and over, I was hearing the city council say, we're looking for solutions to the housing crisis. And invariably, I thought to myself, but, but, but the solution already exists. Uh, look no further than the model of False Creek Co-op. It is the solution to this problem because the model works. I know, I live there. It's actually a very simple model. The co-op does not depend on government subsidies. We're independent in supporting each other. People on a higher income bracket pay a surcharge in order to help neighbors who otherwise may leave, live in difficult conditions. And because we have this model, we're also financially able to repair and upgrade our buildings over the years. Our houses are therefore well-maintained, sturdy, and will last unless, of course, torn down at the great environmental cost. Beyond the co-op about False Creek South, I love this neighborhood. It was, and it still is, diverse. It integrates a mix of income. This is so much more interesting than a bland, uniform monoculture. And the neighborhood, it's also built on a human scale. It's dense, but not overwhelmingly so. It has a lot of empty spaces already to build on to increase density. And I love the idea that this beautiful community can grow, and I support that. At this time, False Creek South is, for me, diverse, Lovely, children can play in courtyards. Neighbors from all walks of life know and help each other. It's home to wildlife and over 1,500 mature trees of urban forest. Yes, I love this neighborhood. The plan that we're discussing tonight was thoughtfully prepared according to a real estate model that works well in many contexts, but this is not real estate, it's public land. This is the place where we can dream, the place where we can solve some of the housing inequities. So let's dream. Dream of keeping the social housing that already exists. There's no need to demolish and to get money and to rebuild. It's already there. It's all done. Uh, let's dream of using the vacant land to build more rental units, more strata buildings, more affordable housing, one helping the others. And speaking of dreams, a few days ago I was on Facebook and I saw an interesting post on Mayor Stewart's Facebook page. What it was is it showed a picture of a series of townhouses that looked quite a bit like where I live, actually. And um, the caption reads, uh, I'm quoting here from Mayor Stewart, imagine a future that is more affordable, equitable, vibrant, and sustainable. I read that and I thought, wow, that's False Creek South. Um, and he continues by making an announcement for a program called Making Home, a bold plan to build up to 10,000 new homes. He talks about the middle class. Uh, he talks about investing in rental homes for working people and those without a home at all. And the whole time I read that, to me, it was the way False Creek South is and can continue to grow. Um, and if I look at his idea of 10,000 units, I think there's a lot of space in False Creek South to put at least 1,000 of those. So to finish, I understand the plan we're discussing today is a starting point. I hope that councillors will vote to receive it only as information 
and that now the expertise of the planning department will be called upon and the citizens involved consulted. The city has a unique opportunity to dream, to be creative, to use imagination, to help citizens that elected them, to go beyond what's ordinary and happening everywhere else, to expand on the dream of their predecessors rather than ruin it. Thank you for listening. And thank you for taking the time um, to, uh, to be with us and present your thoughts very clear. Um, so there's no questions. Have a good evening. Speaker, Council Speaker 112 is withdrawn. That moves us to Speaker 113, Janelle, uh, Janelle Perron. Janelle Perron on the line? Yes. Oh, can you hear me? Yes, we can hear you. Go ahead, up to Thank five you. minutes. Hello, Mayor and City Council. My name is Jonelle Perrin. I am a member of Alder Bay Co-op in South Falls Creek. I've lived in Alder Bay Co-op for 21 years. I am a retired single woman in my 70s, living alone in a one-bedroom unit. I immigrated to Canada 51 years ago and have embraced Vancouver as my home ever since. When I first moved to Alder Bay, I was working as a cashier at Safeway and going to school at Emily Carr University of Art and Design. It was then situated on Granville Island. My walk to school after getting home from work were wonderful years of my life from one community to another. My life in these 21 years has gone through many changes, all within my community. I retired and found new adventures of interest going through this pandemic and living alone in isolation that we are just slowly emerging from. My community has been my rock of sanity. It may not sound like a lot to others, but included in this time has been my garden, which is my mainstay of refuge, solace, and safety. I tend to it and watch it change through the seasons. I don't walk out my door into a hallway of neutrality. I walk out my door into nature and friendly faces. As an aging person living on my own, I greatly value living in a community. It is of utmost importance to me that I can call on a group of neighbors any time of the day or night, should I need help or have an emergency. And I am there to do the same. Not only do I have friendship living communally, I have that help, that sense of security and safety, and a sense of pride that I can be of help to my city. Everyone needs a sense of purpose, and I am no exception. Since joining Alder Bay, I served on the Maintenance Committee, the Emergency Committee, and the Sustainability Committee. I currently am an active working member of the Sustainability Committee. The intent of my committee is recycling and reducing waste. I believe that is a paramount concern to City Hall sustainability. Why then tear down well-maintained buildings, the estimate being 374 homes units? shortening the useful life of the buildings and uprooting an estimate of 700 to 1,000, 750 to 1,000 people, 50% of whom have incomes under $60,000, with 40 to 50% being seniors. This has a huge impact on each co-op organization in each co-op community, not to mention or ignore the huge impact this creates on the environment and issue of waste, an important part of the health of our city. Close to my heart, along with these facts, is the effect displacement has on families, on children. As for myself, my three grandsons call my home their home. My boys at 13 years, 11 years, and 7 years run in and out of my doors in complete safety and security whenever they visit with no busy streets of cars to worry about. That very same safety is a great benefit to me as well. As an aging person, I count myself lucky to be fit and healthy. Living in the benefit of nature along Falls Creek, I am able to walk for groceries and supplies for my health with my doctor and hospital nearby. I walk for fresh air and peace of mind. And Dirty, up most whenever of they visit with no busy streets of cars to worry about. That just, very same safety is a great benefit to sorry, me as just, well. Just one second, nature. speaker. Hello? Hello, can yes, you hear me? Yes, yes, we can. That yes, was... something, something happened. <laughs> I, I, that, <laughs> yes, yes, indeed. We heard you repeat yourself, <laughs> uh, but it wasn't you. It was it was a recording. Sorry about that. Uh, but go ahead now. 
Okay. Um, Okay, I'm able to walk for groceries and supplies for my health with my doctor and hospital nearby. I walk for fresh air and peace of mind and utmost benefit in community. This gives my two children peace of mind in their lives as well. They know I am taken care of where I live and that I am safe where I live. I walk out my front door and into an aviary filled with bird song. False Creek is a haven for nature and animals. I see and experience that all around me every day. What will happen to that with our home swept away? It is home to animal as well. I won the lottery moving into a co-op, into Alder Bay Co-op, 21 years ago. And as I age, I count my blessings each and every day. I would not be able to live in this expensive city that is Vancouver if I did not live in a co-op. I can't imagine that possibility. Please don't make it a possibility. In closing, I quote Margaret Mead, never doubt that a small group of thoughtful, committed citizens can change the world. Indeed, it's the only thing that ever has. With respect, I thank you. Great, thank you. I love that quote. Um, thank you very much, and uh, there are no questions to you. You're very clear, appreciate you coming. So, uh, speaker 114 is in person, is that? Yes, okay, Tamara Hurtado. Go ahead. I, well, I'll let the clerk give you instructions. Oh, nice. <laughs> Welcome. Good evening. We are living through an important historical moment which will have an impact into the future for Vancouver for decades and potentially into the next century. What we do today, this year, and over the next 15 years will determine the community we live in, the lifestyle and quality of life for many, many residents of Vancouver. Whether we are councillors, developers, city staff, or residents of Falls Creek South, we all understand and support the need for higher density housing. It is not the what that needs to be done that is problematic and divisive. It is the how and how we are going to do it. Let us build on the legacy we inherited from the 70s, and that legacy is the legacy of trust that we had in each other to build community together. Now is the time for us to rebuild that trust and come together to share ideas and to share in the planning. I've come here today to put a spotlight on four important aspects, which I think have been overlooked or underestimated. They are trust. I've spoken a little bit about it. Diversity, visualizing redevelopment through the lens of diversity and becoming aware of the risk of undoing decades of social inclusion and integration work by enclaving, segregating, grouping residents by income, type of housing, or support requirements based on age or disability. I've come here today to ask the question, where are the Indigenous voices in the discussion on how we are to develop this land? We have the Squamish Nation at this moment, creating a new neighbourhood called Sinaqua, consisting of 11 towers, 6,000 units for 10,000 residents, adjacent to Falls Creek South, next to the Burrard Street Bridge. Please. Let us invite them into the discussion as partners and neighbors who have experience and knowledge to share. Let us learn from our neighbors about the perspective of Indigenous culture, architecture, and values. Let us be good neighbors and build community together. The berm. Let's talk about how critical it is to the biodiversity and how it contributes to the health of residents of Vancouver and should be protected and managed as an important asset for all residents of Vancouver. I'm starting with trust because without it, we are nowhere. We are meeting in silos, becoming echo chambers of ourselves. But we have precedent in the development of False Creek South in the 70s which gives us confidence to know that we can trust each other and that this is a model of collaboration which leads to good things and better communities. Many of those partners from the 70s are still with us and have valuable experience to share. We can build on the legacy and experience that we have inherited. 
and the integrated communities that have been created. These are the higher order questions of social and community development and city planning that take place before and then alongside real estate planning, not afterwards. Not to say that real estate planning is not important, but it is putting the horse before the cart to have them to lay down the parameters of the discussion. We want to honor and respect diversity over efficiency. The current path of redevelopment risks establishing segregated enclaves of residents with support needs, enclaves of seniors, enclaves of low income, enclaves of high income residents. We can do a lot better. The berm. I think many people who do not know it well think of it as an interesting mound of dirt with, forest, with a forest of trees offering protection from the noise and sounds of 6th Avenue. It is so much more than that. It is a microcosm of biodiversity that is protecting the residents of False Creek South in so many different ways. During the heat dome of this summer, many of those residents sought refuge in the forest, many with their pets. This is because it was several degrees cooler and much more bearable than being in the, their overheated homes. Climate is the issue of our time and having a place of refuge from the heat is an important asset to protect. Over the last 40, almost 50 years, half a century, a huge biodiversity has thrived in the berm. It has become a forest of multiple species of trees functioning as a living lung for the city of Vancouver absorbing pollutants and restoring oxygen. It hosts many species of animals, trees, and other vegetation. At least 30 species of birds built nests there, including multiple generations of Cooper Hawks. Other I would love to have you continue, but you are over time. Um, and I, it, the list it was wonderful. Um, Can I just give my summary statement, which is let us come together to prioritize being together in trust and in collaboration to build a vibrant community in which we can all share in the pride of, the legacy, of a new legacy for Vancouver. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much. Um, you do have questions, so if you want to just stay there, go ahead, Councillor Fry. Yeah, thanks, Chair. And uh, thanks for coming to join us today. Um, no, it's over. I'm over here. If you're looking for who's okay. looking, <laughs> uh, you, you brought up the berm a couple of times, obviously, and I appreciate you bringing it up. Um, you know, I've obviously we've heard from some of the folks at Replan and stuff about how there's an opportunity to to build out and do some of the phasing at the berm. Are you saying just leave the berm alone? Absolutely. Once you start eroding it, you're going to have a huge impact on the trees, on the the animals that live there on um, the fact that it's an ecosystem that is providing shielding from the heat. And even in the winter, we walk through there with our pets and we are shielded even from the rain okay. and from the wind. It is a very protective environment. And it's also an environment that is giving back to the city through the, through the oxygen provided by the trees. You know, you know, it's, it's built up from, I, and I, I'm not, Discounting the what it is today, but it underneath it is toxic soil and that kind of thing. It's protecting us from that too. <laughs> okay. All right. Well, thanks for coming today. Thank you. Great. Thank you. Um, that is for your questions. I very much appreciate you coming in person and your thoughts. Thank you. Thank you. Okay, moving to one fifteen, Suzanne Butler. Speaker one sixteen has withdrawn. Okay, Speaker 116, Peter Wing. That's me, can you hear me? Yes, we can hear you clearly. Go ahead, up to five minutes. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Mayor, Chair Carr, councillors. Thank you for permitting me to join the discussion of the staff report. I appreciate the care and the hard work that's gone into the report, which I regard as an interesting start, which needs much work. I've been very moved by and honored to follow so many of my neighbors who have brought real social planning and other skills and often spoken so eloquently today and last Thursday. Much of their concerns and good suggestions call for closer involvement in the whole process. My introduction to Falls Creek was with two years in the rented apartment in Leggingwood Square, which was walking distance to work, but we sought ground level access. 
My wife and I have been living in Marine News, a 55-unit Strata leasehold residence on Ironwork Passage in Fourth Creek South for over 40 years. 20 years ago, we completely renovated our living space, as have several neighbors. All our buildings have been well-maintained at no expense to the city. In addition to basic maintenance we've had over the last couple of decades, paid $4.5 million for rain screen, outer wall replacement, and new roof. Replacement last year of the membrane over the parking garage, and most recently EV charges. I'm now 78. It's time to revisit my will, but the value of our house, a major asset, is uncertain and unpredictable because of the municipality's apparent indecision over more than a decade about how to manage the timing and end of our current lease, expiring in 2036. On the one hand, our Strata Council maintains and repairs the property to contemporary standards to conserve its utility and value. And on the other hand, the existence of nearing lease end dates with no simple plan or any agreements yet in place with all council discussions being held in camera, which has caused our neighbors and us increasing concern. The Guardian's columnist, George Monbiot, talks about the need for us as individuals to have enough and for our community to be rich in facilities. Part of our neighborhood and our strata success lies in the fact that our properties are modest in the 800 to 1200 square foot range. The walls are a bit thin, so it helps if we share our neighbor's musical taste. The courtyard complex, however, invites an open door approach to our neighbors dropping by. This is balanced by the community's riches, open space, trees, waterfront access, playgrounds, libraries, transit. South Falls Creek does not bring the gated community-like, socially isolated environment of a high rise, but the open and inviting warmth of a lovely village. People walk by or through our strata and bicycle along the seawall. We were without a car for 25 years, and cars here are kept away from people. Let's keep it this way. In fact, let's replicate it in other parts of our lovely city. Our climate emergency demands enhanced density. South Falls Creek's current density is about 102 people per hectare, somewhere between Marpole at 42 per hectare, Kitsilano at 78 people per hectare, and Yale Town at 131 people per hectare, but not yet as dense as the West End at 231 per hectare. So yes, of course there is room for more people here, and we welcome folks from all backgrounds to join this wonderful and successful social experiment, still thriving after many decades. But I ask you, please maintain the same proportions of affordable housing and ensure that housing here remains affordable for all. I have several asks for the community and for people in my situation. Let's start with the community. One, this report is a carefully considered start but should not be accepted as is. Please encourage staff to work with the neighborhood residents to mold it to our situation. Two, the plan for 6th Avenue is as yet vague but describes opening up more streets into the neighborhood Please, please keep vehicles away from people and let us share all the benefits of this pedestrian and bike-oriented neighborhood. Let's involve transit planning early rather than later. Three, please maintain our affordability mix of non-market rental, co-op and strata housing, whether with stairs or featuring universal design, which allows us to age in place regardless of disability. Stress social needs over financial gain, low rise over high rise. Don't begin the process if funding for affordable housing is not in hand. Four, as UBC Prof Patrick Condon has identified, building vertically loses the social benefits of small courtyards, neighbors with open front doors, etc. Please ask the staff to examine closely the important social implications of these critical planning and design issues. Five, for my strata neighbors and for me, recognizing the, admission, the emissions advantage of built housing. Please advise staff to quickly and corporately negotiate lease extensions of our perfectly viable housing to realize its many remaining years of useful life, which the SLS members, including myself, believe warrants a 39-year lease extension to take it to 99 years. Please set a completion date for completion of these negotiations of not more than maybe three months, not another 10 years. And please demand a clear lease end value assessment mechanism, which is still so vague. I thank you for your, for your time spent on these meetings, which have really impressed me with the, with the level of conversation that has happened and the level of questioning you have given. Thank you very much. That was perfectly timed. Um, thank you very much. There aren't any questions. You were very clear. Okay. Um, so moving on now, a council to Speaker 117, uh, Eleanor Janet Waldman. 
Yeah, can you hear me? Yes, we can. Go ahead. Wonderful. Wonderful. Thank you for the opportunity to speak. My name is Ellie Waldman. I'm a retired high school and elementary school counselor. I've lived in the Falls Creek Co-op for 40 years. I'm speaking in opposition to the proposal before you. I grew up in the Bronx in New York City in a six-story apartment building in a neighborhood of other six- and 12-story apartment buildings. And despite having loving parents, friends, and a good education, it didn't feel good. I felt alienated, isolated, and distant from people. There was no community. We never knew our neighbors. At 25, I realized I had to leave. I came to Vancouver looking for a better way of living. And I found it when I was so lucky to move into the False Creek Co-op. I brought up my daughter here as a single parent, and she is now 46. And she's told me many times how grateful she is to have grown up in the safe, village-like community of our co-op. In our community, we are neighbors who know each other. We care about each other. Sorry. And we often help each other. We work together on communities to maintain the co-op, and we have social gatherings and celebrations before COVID, of course. Our children play together in a protected area outside under our watchful eyes. And with each new generation, I see children of all ages, backgrounds, colors, religions, and income levels play together daily and form strong and healthy bonds. The friends my daughter made as a child are now like brothers and sisters to her, there for each other whenever they need the, each other. I tell you all this because co-ops are not only an affordable way of life, they're also a healthy way to live. We grow great kids, kind, cooperative, confident, and civic-minded people, good citizens. But now with the proposed plan for Falls Creek South, our community is in serious jeopardy. First, our longstanding lease agreement with the city, which is set to expire in 2036, has suddenly gone. It appears the city decided not to follow through on this longstanding agreement. And frankly, I gotta say, I find this shocking and I wonder how that could even happen. Is it legal? And with this proposed plan, we were removed from the planning process. Even the city's planning, urban design, and sustainability department that has been globally acclaimed for their visionary work in creating False Creek South model that we live in today, even they were not involved in the planning process. They have not reviewed, considered, or approved this plan. This entire plan has been developed by the real estate department. According to the schedule for this plan, next year building will begin on the structure that, will be move, that we will be moved into in six years. They've made these plans, but they haven't even determined what the building structures are going to be. And there is no money as yet to pay for any of it. But the schedule starts next year, and we are being rushed into it nonetheless. The proposal itself will create an entirely different community from what we have today. Today we have inclusion and equity of access. Units of different incomes are integrated with each other, not separated. In the new plan, the high income wealthy will be grouped along the water and the six story co-op buildings will be moved to the outer edge of the park and grouped in what is already being called a poor wall all lined up on sixth avenue which is a fast moving loud heavy traffic artery i sent the plan to my daughter and with no comment from me she wrote back the following the current plan that we live in has families in homes Homes that blend in with market town homes and feel like they are part of one big community. The new plan seems to put poorer families in Bronx-like apartment buildings. 
I seriously don't understand why there aren't more co-ops in the city. They are not subsidized. They pay for themselves. They provide families with the opportunity to live and work in the city without going broke. They create community. Our co-op buildings have been kept in great condition and have many, many good years left in them. We welcome higher density, has been, which has been said many times before in this, in this conversation. But please, let's keep the highly successful communities that we already have and expand and grow Falls Creek South on unused land slowly and thoughtfully. Please renew our leases. The stress for many has been extremely difficult. And lastly, please let's work toward a future plan by accepting the real estate department proposal and keeping it as information only, and then turning the planning process back to Vancouver's planning department where it belongs, and use well-established processes of open community planning. Thank you very much for your time. Oh, and thank you for your time. Um, very well stated, and uh, there, there are no questions, but um, thank, thank you for coming uh, to speak, and have a very good evening. Council, we're now to Speaker 118, Hugh Davies. Speaker 118 has withdrawn. Okay, Speaker 119, Grace Pestine. Uh, Speaker 119 has also withdrawn. Okay, Speaker 120, um, Marie-Claude Collins. Hello. Hello. Yes, we can hear you clearly. Go ahead to council. From thank Defy. you. Thank you very much. Good evening, and thank you all of you for taking all this time to listen to us. My name is uh, Marie Claude Collins. I'm a strata lease holder in Fort Street South. I've lived here for 11 years, and I love my community where I know all my neighbors. I appreciate the work that went into this plan, the willingness to look in the future. And I agree that we need more density in Fall Street, but I cannot support the whole plan as it is because it's not compatible with the stated goals of the city of Vancouver. It's actually misguided. It's not environmentally sensitive. It does not honor the 1970s vision of a mixed income neighborhood and does not encourage affordable housing. And it does not even address the concerns of strata leaseholders like me who are asking for clarity regarding less expiries other than proposing that negotiations might start in a few weeks. The proposed vision is not environmentally sensitive. A green building is one that already exists. But this report proposes to demolish a school and hundreds of housing units in order to build new ones. Demolition means more waste in landfill, air, and water pollution. Maintaining and upgrading is always preferable and cheaper, too, than demolishing and rebuilding. The current landscaping in Fort Creek South is beautiful, a little forest in the city, a city which talks a lot about the need to plant more trees, and yet they might take a lot of them away. Unfortunately, a lot of this landscaping is likely to be destroyed if this plan goes ahead. It doesn't really honor the 70s vision of a mixed income neighborhood. The future envisaged here is not inclusive. The Falls Creek neighborhood was created in the mid 70s with a vision of an inclusive society with one third low income, one third moderate income, and one third higher income, thus making sure that lower income families, seniors, people with disabilities, nonprofits uh, would not be pushed to the margins. But the plan presented now aims to alter those proportions dramatically. The proportion of market housing would double, with one-third market strata and one-third market rentals. Lower and moderate income families will be pushed out. Market and non-market housing will be segregated. This plan does not focus on affordable housing. We all know that market housing is not affordable housing. Only people with high income can buy new condos in market strata, and market rentals are not affordable for middle-income earners, for the workforce, for teachers, for nurses, um, 
any, any other worker in the city. Housing units and co-ops have been fully paid for by the residents and provide affordable housing that's already existing. It's well-maintained buildings. Demolishing them prematurely to replace them with new ones will certainly cost Vancouver rights more and will not add to the affordable housing stock. The now reduced down to one-third potential non-market and co-op housing depends entirely on senior government funding, which might or might not materialize, in which case the plan acknowledges that the city would need to consider alternative strategies. Would that mean more market housing? But the demolition of current affordable units will proceed. And as to start a leasehold leases, those leases and their extensions have been the topic of discussion with the city for years. And in spite of many meetings, motions, agreed upon, uh, principles also agreed upon, <clears throat> no formal negotiations have ever taken place in spite of promises. The negotiations proposed in the plan do not afford any details or recommendations. And only in phase two, after 2040, Will the future of existing strata be considered? This does not bring us the clarity we so need if we are going to be able to maintain our buildings. Mayor and councillors, I'm asking you to receive this conceptual plan for information until it can be reviewed with a broader perspective. It's important not to delay the lease extensions so that there can be transparent community-based planning with city planners and not one seen only through the lens of real estate developers. Thank you again for listening to me. Yes. Good evening. Good evening, and thank you very, very much. That was well-timed. Um, and very much appreciate you speaking to Council. Okay, Council, um, we have um, another unidentified person on the line, and because we don't have the TELUS operator, our staff need to check into that, so we're going to take another five-minute break. Um, just before I start it, I just want to draw your attention to the fact that there um, has been a video sent to all of us. Um, it was not submitted in time to be able to, sh to be shown tonight um, to accompany um, Speaker 153, Carol Evans, but some of you may want to take, it's, it is out in all of your inboxes, and you might want to take this break um, time to take a look at it. Um, of course, this also can be a bio break and having a glass of water and whatever. So, um, but five minutes and that'll bring us back at um, 8.31.
Welcome back, everyone. And so we are um, now on uh, 121, Zoe Mabry. Uh, speaker 20, uh, 121 is not on the line. Okay, thank you. Speaker 122, Fern Logan. Hello. Yep, go ahead. We can hear you. Okay, I'm Fern Logan. I live at Twin Rainbows Co-op in Falls Creek South. I'm a senior and I'm looking forward to aging here in my co-op. 45 or so years ago, the co-founder of my co-op asked his wife her opinion on building a co-op near the Granville Street Bridge, to which she responded, who'd want to live there? Now, 40 years later, that industrial wasteland is considered the best neighborhood in all of Canada and prized for its diversity and livability. It has been built with a vision for people. I see this disappearing. My neighborhood is now considered prime real estate. When city realtors look at Falls Creek South, it seems the question is how much money can we get from it? People have been left out. Right now, we have a mix that allows co-ops to have water views and a school that is safely away from traffic. The new plan takes that away and places the market housing to the waterfront and many co-ops back along 6th Avenue. That's discrimination at work. That's dollar signs in place of people. The one-third representation should include equal representation along the waterfront as well. Rather than placing the school or replacing the school, why not enlarge on what is already there? Less environmental in impact and continued safety for the kids. I want to acknowledge and thank speaker number 58 for counting all the trees that will be cut down to accommodate this plan, as well as his research on the mandates of the city. There are environmental concerns when all the well cared for and well loved homes around the creek are demolished. If you agree to tear our homes down, you're causing negative environmental impact and crushing many communities. When you build an expensive, shiny new building and offer us first choice to then uh, and then offer us first choice to move in, uh, now I can't afford to live there because the housing charges will have gone up beyond my affordability because it's a shiny new building. Please leave our homes in place. These homes are already affordable and have been maintained throughout their lives. They still have 40 or more years in them. I love my home and my community. Living in a shiny new place isn't in my interest or most everyone else's who lives in these co-ops. So please leave me my home and also consider the environment and the trees. The berm is one of my favorite walks when I go to shop along Camby Street. And I'd just like to say thank you for all this time that you're taking to listen to everyone. Good night. Thank you. Thank you for coming to speak and, um, uh, and offering us your thoughts. Uh, very important. Um, um, so there are no questions for you and have a good evening too. Speaker 123, Mark Heal Simpson. Speaker 123 is not on the line. Great. Speaker 124, Malcolm Ferrier. Hi, just want to confirm that you can hear me? Yes, we can very clearly. Go ahead, up to five minutes. Great. Thank you very much. Uh, my name is uh, Malcolm Ferrier. I'm a member of the False Creek Co-op uh, with my wife, two kids, and a brand new puppy for the past dozen years, although the uh, puppy much less than that. Um, there's been a number of excellent, point, uh, excellent points raised. Uh, for example, there should be more co-ops, not less, so that more can enjoy this brilliant system of affordable housing. Existing housing is the least expensive form of housing stock. The current plan was developed behind closed doors by the real estate department. A department has never done this in this way for any other part of the city. And the, the current council does not want to be the one that increases the disparity between the rich and the poor. Given that there is a lot of popular disagreement with the current plan in the news and social media, I don't need to reiterate these points. Uh, instead, I'd like to be specific. The current documents indicate that my current home 
and the one that I will have lived in for nearly 30 years is slated to be demolished to extend Charleston Park by a few hundred meters, a park that is already beautiful and sizable. This means my home will be destroyed for a blank space on a map. This alone indicates a substantial lack of common sense, reason, and compassion with the current plan. The uh, representatives have indicated that the current housing was going to be removed in order to create better housing. This is, as I said before, a blank space on a map, which seems punitive. I hear the phrase, the co-ops knew what they were getting into a lot, and that's true. We were getting into a visionary agreement with a city that had its eye on the future. And this was 19, the 1970s. You'd think things were getting better. My wife studied the False Creek South neighborhood as an ideal stewardship of resources in her university geography textbook. If we go forward with the current plan, we're not just throwing out the baby with the bathwater, we're throwing out the rest of the family and the elderly. Puppies too. I highly encourage council to reassess this plan and suggest that the planning process be moved from the real estate profit department to the planning department, which was the precedent for neighborhood development for every other part of the city. This seems a reasonable and just decision, which should also align with popular sentiment. Thank you very much for the time today. Um, thanks again. And um, thank you very much. Um, Great. Uh, no questions, but that was that was very succinct. So, speaker. Great. Thank you. Yeah. Thank you, speaker. Um, speaker number of one twenty five, Chester Grant. And councillors, my name is uh, Chester Grant. My wife Danielle and I live in a strata on uh, in uh, Marine Muse on city leased land in False Creek, to which we downsized five years ago. We'd lived in an old house on an extremely busy arterial street for 37 years in which we'd come to know exactly two people on the opposite side of our street slash freeway. On the day we visited an open house at our current location, neighbors poured out of their units to welcome us in case we bought and moved in. So that told us a lot about the False Creek neighborhood. We knew there was much uncertainty over leases, and we certainly didn't buy as an investment. Our unit is all but unsellable under current conditions, nor could we obtain a mortgage if we needed it for unforeseen strata expenses, but it was an invitation to join an amazing community which we couldn't turn down. On to today. Over three days of listening to most speakers on this topic, I heard no nimbyism. Nobody said, stay out of my backyard. Instead, I heard impassioned appeals to increase density, but without spoiling its nature or wasting current resources. Uh, by resources, uh, I mean not just the well-maintained present buildings and open spaces, but also the well-intentioned and often well-researched observations of the speakers you've been hearing. I ask you to please simply receive the proposal by property, not as a starting point, but as one contribution to the process from a particular perspective. I especially urge you to keep the present proportion of co-op and low-income housing, or better yet, increase it. Um, your callers from these communities have vastly increased my appreciation for this type of housing as a, a social benefit to the city as a whole. Please consider how you can be today's equivalent of the visionary council that chose to create this neighborhood that works for every resident and every visitor. Please accept as soon as possible replans, simple plan for lease extensions. Please do not add to the city's current stock of unaffordable housing. Uh, I wish you well in your endeavors. You have a, a huge and responsible task ahead. Thank you for listening. Um, and thank you for taking the time to present to us. Um, very welcomed, and uh, but there's no questions. It was very clear. Um, thank you. 
Great. Uh, so uh, Speaker 126 has withdrawn. Speaker 127, Tim Kennelly. Hi, my name is Tim Kennelly. I'm a, actually, I'm a resident of South Burnaby. I live with my parents and I have multiple disabilities for which I'm currently, I'm currently on a wait list for BC housing, but I'm also a member of a group called the Democratic Socialists of Vancouver, and it's through that group that I heard about this development plan for South Burns Creek South, and when I was looking into it, I found an article on the Georgia Strait website by someone by the name of Jason Forsyth, which implies in he is of the belief that, in fact, the previous city council decided to put a pause on the South Forest Creek, Forest Creek South development plan back in mid-2018. And then, according to that, basically, the city of Vancouver's real estate department has been essentially in violation of that order to pause the planning process. And as such, this report really, in my view, has no reason why it should even exist. But being that, the report does, to me, seem to be a major shift towards market housing and this major focus on getting the maximum return for the city's investment on the land, which I think is a really bad shift away from the concept of the neighborhood as it was originally proposed in the developed in the 1970s as a mixed income neighborhood. And I would urge councilors to oppose this plan as it is currently put forward and to instead re simply acknowledge it as a report that exists for informational purposes only, but not go forward with it, and to have this plan be done, for the planning for it be done in consultation with the replan folks from the South Park Creek neighborhood, but also the city of Vancouver planning commission and the other thing I would say is I'm hearing in the other quotes that I've heard when I've been listening in to city council about there's a lot of anxiety from the residents. I think there's no amount of amendments you can make to this plan that will allay those, that anxiety from those residents. So I really am urging you to oppose this plan as it is now. Thanks. Great. Speaker, uh, you're finished? Yep. Okay, thank you very much. Um, there are no questions for you, so uh, but very much appreciate you taking the time to uh, speak to us on this issue. Thank you. Speaker 128A, Ryan Schwartz. Uh, Speaker 128A is not on the line. Thank you. Speaker 128B, Kelly Schwartz. Uh, not on the line. Okay, Speaker 129, Seth Elza. No, not on the line. Speaker 130, Gordon Watson. Not on the line. Speaker 131, Flamur hmm, Pakshadija. Speaker 131 is not on the line. Okay, Speaker 132 has withdrawn. Speaker 133, Janice Clements. Uh, no, not on the line. Speaker 134, Tom Bunting. Hello? Yes, Tom Bunting, we can, can hear you. Yes, okay. go ahead. Okay, thank you. Uh, good evening, uh, Mayor and uh, Chairperson Carr and members of Council. <clears throat> thank you for this opportunity to speak to this very important issue. Uh, I thank uh, you all and to staff and to the team of consultants for their, I think, very valuable and hard work. Um, I'm a resident of Falls Creek South. Uh, I'm a Strata leaseholder for almost 10 years now. <clears throat> um, my connection to this, uh, to Falls Creek, um, goes back to my, in the early 80s. Uh, I was an architecture student at UBC. Uh, and uh, little did we know it when we were at school, we were being taught um, basically uh, principles of design and community design based on this model called Falls Creek South that was uh, right below our feet. Um, and 
We didn't really know it, um, but we were taught as we uh, grew up, um, and this is pretty special for around the world, uh, that we designed communities, not square footage. Um, and that, that kind of stuck with me. And many, many years later, uh, after living in many areas of Vancouver, I was in Kitsilano, North Shore, uh, trying to land, um, I had the opportunity to buy a strata leasehold unit. Uh, as a strata leasehold uh, owner, I understood the reduced value, uh, the reduced depreciation that would happen. But um, basically, we chose a home over real estate. Um, and, you know, t and, and the reason we did that was um, because we uh, lived many places, as you, can, as you heard, um, and never always felt this emptiness of community. Um, but many times, uh, being a, a kind of lifetime runner, would run the seawall, would go through all the packs and the uh, courtyards of False Creek South right from the very beginning and during construction. And, uh, and moving into this community uh, for the first time in my life, uh, and my one son who was with me, uh, we found neighbors. Um, we found neighbors that uh, immediately greeted us. Um, we had a party. Uh, we, you know, in the in a typical kind of uh, down home feel, we, you know, would water people's gardens when they were away. We would tilt a glass, share a meal. Um, all this actually happens at Falls Creek South. Um, I'm I, I'm not as eloquently going to speak uh, as as previous speakers about the housing mix, and I think we've gone over that quite a bit. Uh, totally support the uh, one third, one third, one third, or more for the uh, for the low income. I'm here really to to talk about the plan that came forward from real estate uh, when I first saw it and opened the first um, two slides. I thought, oh my gosh, they're listening. Um, Phase one one is very very much uh, in keeping with uh, replans plan, um, of which I've sat in on some of those meetings, and um, and I'm talking about really the filling uh, the the vacant spaces. And there was a lot of time looked at where vacant um, spaces could be filled. There are the obvious ones around. Uh, the uh, Olympic Village Skytrain Station uh, around the bridgehead at uh, Camby um, and along Six, notwithstanding the berm. Um, I think uh, the mix, uh, the heights, and all that, as I'll say at the end, should be uh, placed in the hands of planning going forward. But, but I think it very much does echo what the community had come up with in many ways, not always. Then I moved to the next slide, and that's where the trouble began. That's where the kind of destruction began. And the um, first the co-ops get demolished and moved out. Uh, and then, and, and it's very vague, as a lot of the plan is, uh, the stratas will be demolished. And, and it's just a big question mark of when and how and what will come then. Um, this, this, as I kind of started um, talking about the specialness of the plan here, uh, that is Falls Creek South, very much depends on those core buildings, and, and it's almost all of the buildings that exist. The filling and the backfilling um, of the site, I think, will increase the uh, 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 the neighborhood by having new members to the neighborhood by adding um, some more vitality to the neighborhood. Uh, I totally agree and with the uh, speakers Tom, who say why. Tom, you are running over yep. time. If you could. Um, oh, am I? Yes. Please, I always do that. <laughs> um, okay, but you, you have questions, if you could see in the line. Um, Councillor Hardwick, go okay. ahead. Thank you very much. And, and thank you for, uh, first of all, recalling your architectural education. That yeah. resonates. Um, We've talked about the legacy that Falls Creek represents and what would what would be involved in replicating its its DNA into the surrounding areas in Falls Creek South and in fact 
and other parts of the city. You've touched upon that, um, but it, I mean, how have you tried to calculate how many units that you think could be created, keeping up the same housing typologies and infilling those lands? Uh, no, I haven't. Um, we do that regularly, like in my practice. Uh, it, you know, it wouldn't take long. Um, but but I think it I think it needs to be kind of hand in hand with with planning. Um, you know, with other uh, parts of the city, uh, and and really understand um, what what w was really shown to us. Because you can't tell from these these drawings, and I'm not saying they were duplicitous or anything. I think it's just not there yet. So I think I think the the good thing is that it's something that the community has already thought about, notwithstanding going beyond uh, what is called phase one, step one. I think it's it's a clear path in my mind forward. And and what it says is that without knowing it, they had they had worked with the community um, in absentee. And I guess this gives me an opportunity to say the next part is that really it's time to say thank you, city staff and and consultants, and finally get the process out of the shadows and have a true consultation, public consultation. And it, and it has it has begun now, finally. And and I think in, as other people have said, and I won't I won't belabor it, is uh, get on with the lease uh, extensions. Um, people are. Are really anxious, and you know, some people can't afford to lose this. Not that any of us really can. Um, but I think the core of the plan is um, moving back from the waterfront uh, to the sort of different levels of buildings as we move back. And I think there is room for more density along six. Uh, I think there's a lot of discussion that has to happen. I, I'm not talking about which uses go there. I think there's lots of room for. More co-ops, rental, whatever. I think there's a there's a big, big discussion that has to happen, in uh, in relation to that. I've probably gone over the three minutes. Sorry about that. Well, that's uh, just coming up to that now. I appreciate that, and oh, I know you've oh, got other okay. questions, so uh, hang in there. Thank you. Yeah. Okay. Uh, you do have more Thanks. questions, though. Thank you, Councillor Hardwick. Okay. Councillor Weeb. Yeah, um, I have a question. You brought up phase one a lot um, and recognizing that you're in a strata lease. Can you talk about what your um, view is from a architectural standpoint on phase two? Recognizing that there isn't a drawing really showcasing phase two. So can you talk about where you think that uh, 2,800 units would go from your standpoint? Phase two is beyond what is shown. Is that correct? I don't have the document. In front That's of me. correct. I got, yeah, I got you guys in front of me, and I got yeah. So phase yeah. Here. So phase one is the document shown, uh, 1,900 extra units, and then phase two is an extra 2,800 units. And understanding that area I, and the architecture. You know, I think again, I go back to the original principles. The the stratas. Um, Mostly, I mean, a lot of them exist to the far east and to the far west side of the site. Yeah. Uh, they seem integral to, like, take like, take Lake and Boot Square. You've actual um, um, stratas, you know, some stratas, some uh, lots of co-op, lots of, you know, all sorts of different social housing there. Uh, it, it would it would actually help, uh, you know, energize the area. The number of units I I wouldn't I can't talk off the top of my head. We have not sat down and taken a look at it. I think that's the next step to understand really what we're dealing with. We don't know the the, the you know the plan has just come out of the closet and we're you know we're struggling with it. And I think there has to be an open discussion, Q and A's to deal with this. I, I was on the design panel during the Olympic Village. And I think I was the chair of the design panel, and and we had workshops with the teams that were building um, that at the time. It's it's a different animal. It was a pretty big um, public process that we went through, <clears throat> and there's been zero here. Okay, that's helpful. Thank you. I, I'm sorry I didn't answer your question, but I, I think it can be answered. 
And but but I think what I'm saying is the core of the plan is the park, um, is the lower buildings up front, um, kind of moving back towards higher buildings that already began, say at the back of Leg and Boot Square, and some of the bigger higher um, co-ops on the on the uh, west side also. Um, so that yeah, that so the sense. bones are there. I think keep the bones. Don't throw don't throw the the concept out, um, but expand on it. I, I was going to throw in. I'm sorry to go go for 20 more seconds. Was we were talking on Thursday, the kind of uh, taglines for it, and the tagline that kind of goes through my industry right now is, uh, and I'm just trying to find it. It's it's basically build communities with communities. Right. Okay. And you have and one. That's right it, that's it. It's You're, ready and willing. Sorry, that is it for Councillor Weeb's time. Sorry. Yeah, that's it for Councillor Weeb's time. But you have more questions, so, so just hang on, please. Oh, sorry, Councillor Kirby Young. I just double moved you. So, there. You, I think the clerk and I are doing. Clerk, why don't you do it so we don't do it together? Thank you. So, Kirby Young, go ahead. Up to three minutes. Yeah. Thank you. Um. Thanks. Thanks for speaking. I had a couple of questions because I, I was really listening to what you said and and i'm paraphrasing a bit but the essence was you, know, you spoke about the importance of renewing leases and i think we've all heard the importance of that and the uncertainty that um, is causing stress to people but you also said it's time to get the process out of the shadows and begin consultation and time to engage planning i think and i'm paraphrasing one of the recommendations before council specifically is to move to a planning exercise and community consultation my question is if council did not approved this report or received it for information has been suggested, how would you envision getting the consultation going and taking it out of the shadows? I think, I think that's a, 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 that kind of puts me on the spot. I'm probably not the best process guy um, to talk about as far as with city. I mean, we go through lots of rezoning exercises and permits and all that. Um, <clears throat> but, you know, every, every, you know, big area, uh, redevelopment has been done through through planning, putting forth um, plans uh, with numbers, with um, with real with the, dealing with all the issues, coming back with uh, the sort of key motivators, um, the design principles of what's happening. Um, we didn't really get that. I think you know most people said, and I'm not being I'm not being rude. Um, this is the this is the design of a spreadsheet, and we understand that. I work for a lot of developers, and this this is. Um, I, I guess I'm asking. Know, I, I'm gonna jump, I, have, I guess I'm going to jump in just because I have limited time, and yeah. and that that yeah, please. I, my, that's help me, for help me. getting towards a planning exercise. And so I'm I'm asking the question genuinely: is how do you get to that conversation where the community could weigh in meaningfully around? Where the built, you know, refining placement of buildings, moving it around to ensure that mix, all of you know, talking about building typology, all of those types of things. If we can't get it into that, because I think part of the goal here, and it may not have turned out as intended, was to try to daylight more of the process and be more transparent about it, and get to the point where the community could weigh in. So that that's the spirit of my question. Um, uh, have you lost me? No, we can still hear no, you. Go ahead. Oh, oh, I lost the last uh, the last few words. I think. Um, that's that's okay. Maybe I can, and if you have something quick to add, then or I can move to another question if you don't have anything else to add on that. Um, no, I just think it's 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 bring it out, and uh, I think you know planning will have a process. I think uh, um, I think the consultant really that you had will have a have a process. I mean, I could just add that you know we this this um, plan that we're tinkering with right now was done by the kind of best and the brightest designers that we had at the time. I mean, Richard Enriquez was involved. Uh, there was there was lots of um, you know Peter Cardu, um, God rest his soul, uh, were, were involved, and we have some preeminent urban designers in this city and firms uh, that that you know should be brought on. And you know, I'm so sorry, but um, Councilor Kirby Young is well over her time, so um, sorry, sorry. You know, not a problem. Um, thank you very much. Uh, those are your questions. Very much appreciate you not only speaking but taking the time to answer the councillors' questions. Great. Sure. Thank Great. you. Yeah, thank you. Good night.
Yep, have a good night. Uh, speaker 135, Peter Morgan. I live in one of the healthy and affordable housing co-ops. The city's real estate department wants to tear down in South Falls Creek. Council, I understand your process and why the in-camera report is before you. I ask, however, that you clarify what part of the report is binding on staff if it does go forward. I also ask that you require a full environmental assessment of this report to be prepared and published publicly before any action is taken on the report. That's a significant hole in the report. It also, this report also proposes another environmental issue, years of noisy construction amidst hundreds of residents without dealing with the effect of all that noise on those people, in particular, those first responders and others working graveyard shifts and who need to sleep during the day. What I don't understand is how the report from one of the largest cities in our country requires some other level of the government in some vague fashion to look after a third of this neighborhood's taxpayers when the city destroys their healthy homes. We had a dream 45 years ago by we, I mean my wife and our family of what were little kids, as well as my immediate neighbors and fellow co-op members, those who were strangers at first and have now become friends for decades. I was president of our co-op back then. I was president several times since, and I was the one who signed our 60 year lease for my co-op. We were so trusting of the city back then we are less naive today. The day we moved into our eight buildings along with our neighbors was November 30th, 1979, 42 years ago. Next month, it was a rainy Friday and we carried our belongings from the long line of moving trucks on Lamy's Mill Road, carefully picking our way on narrow wooden planks over the sea of mud caused by the November rains on this almost completed construction site. Our one hectare property is now landscaped with about 170 mature trees that our grounds committee maintains at our expense on our one hectare, including a tree with a lifespan, a potential lifespan of 2,000 years, if it's not cut down because of this report. Our co-op has a, den a tree density similar to a hectare in Stanley Park. Those trees teach us what cooperation and long-term means. Shortly after we moved in, a Vancouver Sun photographer arrived to, to take a picture to illustrate a story about South Falls Creek that was to appear on the next day's front page. And there we are, my wife and I and our kids on our back steps, smiling at the readers as one does, under the big black headline, Urban Poor, I'm retired, Kids have grown, but we're still the urban poor to the real estate department. This rushed report is full of gaping ragged holes, and where is the new vision of the city? It's AWOL. It expects the city to soon destroy the co-op buildings in which I and hundreds of families live. We paid for those buildings, and how respectful is that to us? We are by far the most organized and helpful community in Vancouver. We'll, are, we are aligned with your goals to increase density and affordable housing. We've worked hard to ensure the data of our proposals are accurate. We show you how successful this community is and how it should be improved instead of destroyed. But we aren't getting anywhere, and that speaks to the difference between the city and us in attitude. The eight buildings in my co-op were originally built by the city. The city made it a condition of our lease that we residents pay back the city the five million they cost, as well as the cost of the land lease, plus financing, plus standard annual city homeowner taxes for 42 years, plus thousands in annual maintenance costs, all of which we've done even though the lease demands that we must give you the building at the end for free. Falls Creek Co-ops have never cost the city a dime, and they never will. The buildings look great. They're in great shape now. 
The buildings were built so badly by the city that we, the residents, were required in 1999 to spend another $4 million to rebuild 32 walls, this time properly designed to stop the buildings from leaking in this rainforest climate. We're going if to be you could, paying. If you could wrap it up, you're just at your time. So just um, if you could wrap, please. Thank you. Yeah, we'll be paying for that until 2040. The city did not help us with that cost. So is this your legacy, councillors? Is this your dream to be the council that started the destruction of the Vancouver neighbourhood that teaches us all daily around the world what a properly designed neighbourhood is, egalitarian, inclusive, affordable, cooperative? Why has council yeah, and your I'm, staff never duplicated? Just a moment. I'm yeah, almost saying. You, you, you really are over time. Real estate, real estate report tells you why. Be careful what you teach us. Thank you. Okay, thank you. Um, and you have no questions, but thank you for speaking to us and um, have a good evening. Council Speakers uh, 136 is withdrawn, so we're on to 137. Stephen Weens. Hi, yeah, my name is Steve Weens. Uh, thank you for the opportunity to speak to you this evening. Uh, I am a resident of South Falls Creek. I live in a condominium on a freehold property. Um, I also have the privilege of working in South Falls Creek. I work with the Broadway Group, which provides long-term care for seniors and also for adults with disabilities. As well, we operate affordable housing locations in Vancouver and Richmond. Uh, my wife and I love the neighborhood that we live in here due to several factors. Uh, one, we live close enough to our work that we can easily walk or cycle to work. Uh, the proximity to the seawall is great. We walk there pretty much every evening. And as well, the diversity of residents. Um, when we're out on our evening walks, we will, without doubt, encounter several different languages as we're walking along the seawall. So I just want to put the challenge out there. I know it was raised that there's not, you know, there's a lack of diversity in this neighborhood, and I, I would dispute that, uh, just given the, like I said, there's several different languages that we encounter every night. Um, I want to acknowledge the work that has gone into the plan. Uh, likely whatever plan is brought forward will have critics, so I understand the difficulty that it is trying to come up with a plan that satisfies everybody. I acknowledge that the city staff also have a fiduciary duty to make the best of the use of the city's resources to meet the needs of all residents of the city. Uh, I will echo the same concerns that have been echoed. It does appear that uh, the, the uh, affordable housing and whatnot is all being moved out to 6th Avenue. Um, and if that's not the case, uh, perhaps we're misreading the plan, but just the way it looks with that's the initial housing to get built, but then the demolition of the co-op units and whatnot to relocate those people there, that, that's just how it appears. If that's not the way it is, then, then I think the plan hasn't accurately represented what you're trying to get across. Um, I do also want to encourage the development of the campus of care. As I mentioned, I work for the Broadway Group, um, but I'm just pointing out that the reality is that the current facilities that we have at Broadway Lodge are at capacity, uh, where we stand right now. If we have a vacancy, we have a maximum of three days before it is filled. And in those three days, we have to do any renovations, you know, replace flooring, fixtures, paint, et cetera, um, before we have another resident in there. And that's just a sign of the demand in the Vancouver Coastal Health Authority region for uh, long-term care. That demand continues to grow. And so I do have concerns that this plan kind of gets put on hold and all those discussions carry on. Uh, we simply don't have time to wait. There's a, there's a demand there and currently we're at capacity beyond capacity really. And so I do want to encourage council to, I realize there's still work to be done here, but I will push that uh, the campus of care be considered to move forward as quickly as possible. Thank you. Thank you for those um, very succinct and straightforward comments. Really appreciate it and, uh, take, and you taking the time to, to speak to us. There are no questions, so have a good evening. Um, and, and speaker 138 is Donald Weatherall. Hello, Chair Carr and counselors and other attendees. Uh, I live in a strata in South Falls Creek, and I do not support this conceptual plan and ask that it be treated by council as information only. You've heard many testimonials stating that residents are not opposed to densification of the community, but that they want change to be evolutionary, to accommodate the people who live here and to respect the concepts that lay behind its original planning principles and that have helped frame the development of an extraordinary and unique community. I agree with those observations. However, I'd like to focus on another important issue of concern relating to the termination of leases. 
The co-ops are especially impacted by demolition and rebuilds outlined in this conceptual plan. And again, you've heard many people speak to the negative implications the co-ops face. I share those concerns. Co-ops are an important part of this community and help make it what it is. And the Strauss, on the other hand, are left in an equally unacceptable position by this conceptual plan because it does nothing to dispel the cloud of uncertainty that hangs over them. There is only a general statement that negotiations will start soon. Even so, the phase two outline on page 26 of the report sets out substantial proposed density on the strata sites after 2040, which suggests that they too face demolition. That demolition would inevitably raise questions about end of lease provisions. Some questions have been raised about whether those who purchased strata leases understood about the expiry of the lease. Well, at the outset, we of course knew that the lease had an end date, but this does not mean that we were not diligent in our assessment. And I can best explain this by using my family's case. When my wife and I took over our strata lease nearly a decade ago, we understood that the city would either extend our lease or purchase our interest as set out in the lease. And in making the decision to proceed with the purchase of a, of a, of a lease uh, a condo in, in South Falls Creek, we were influenced by a number of factors. First, the leaseor was the city of Vancouver, a democratic, reputable, and respected party. Second, the lease was affordable for us because it was on leased land. And third, the city for many years had proclaimed itself as one of the greenest cities in the world. Even then, it was commonly accepted that the preservation of existing buildings and trees is the greenest and most economically responsible choice. In other words, we would likely face infill building, not massive rebuilding. And fourth, the city had been signaling its intention to extend leases for some time. And lastly, and fifth, and perhaps most importantly, we were guided by the terms of the lease itself. Section 25.01 of Article 25 provides that at the lease's expiry, leaseholders will be paid fair market value. And the lease says that will be determined by mutual agreement or by arbitration if an agreement cannot be reached. And further, this section provides that such fair market value shall be determined by various criteria, the first of which is, and I quote, as if this lease did not terminate. The conceptual plan makes no mention of this provision in our leases, but it is a very important point and has major implications. Considering the value of a strata in terms of the provision as if the lease did not terminate is a quite different matter than limiting lease end value as this report does to improvements. In other words, our investment in our strata is protected by the lease that we and earlier leases entered into in good faith. And that is an important and concrete reason we purchased a leasehold strata in South Falls Creek. In conclusion, I would respectfully ask, first that council directs the administration to complete lease negotiations with the stratas and the co-ops before any redevelopment plan is approved. I acknowledge that this conceptual plan says that negotiations about lease and extensions will begin soon, but we've been hearing this for many years and I, for one, am losing faith in those assurances. Second, the council requires an open consultation with the community before any redevelopment plan is approved. While the concept plan offers some important start starting points, I worry that it will be too restrictive a template going forward. I think that most people in Falls Creek South community have assumed that Vancouver's long tradition and an important tradition of community planning would mean that they would have meaningful input into such changes and would be able to engage in a consultative and meaningful process. And that completes my comments, and I truly appreciate the time you've given me to, uh, to speak to you, and thank you. Great. Thank you very much. Um, if you don't mind staying on the line, you do have some questions. And Councillor Hardwick. Councillor Hardwick, go ahead. Thank you very much. I'd just like to, to clarify um, what I got from part of your uh, talk was that there are contradictory clauses in the, the language of the lease that you're holding versus what you're reading through this staff report. Is that accurate? Because um, I guess the larger question for the city is what kind of liability are, um, would be presenting itself from a legal liability standpoint? 
Well, I, I think it's a good point. I, 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 don't, I don't know if it was deliberately left out or if it is simply an assumption that, that's made. That um, uh, I, I think the uh, leases in South Falls Creek are probably unique in the city of Vancouver uh, and, and come from the history of, of the development of the area. Uh, and, and possibly other leases in Vancouver are, are dealt with differently, and maybe that's the assumption they were making. Um, but I, 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 I'm not entirely sure. I can't speak for for what the uh, uh, real estate department is is um, is asserting there. But certainly, what they're saying is that the uh, in the in the in the concept plan is that uh, it will be uh, um, paid. Uh, you know, it will, the, the the clause if the lease did not terminate is not there. Interesting. Does that answer your question? Thank you. Yeah, the devil is always in the details on these things. And, and um, so I was just interested in your interpretation of the, the language in the lease versus what was contemplated in this report. Um, yeah. So obviously guess, something guess, that needs I, more attention. Yeah, I, I, I guess that, um, I mean, I don't know uh, uh, really much about this, but one of the uh, people who spoke earlier um, who was from Harbor Terra said that they were talking about uh, lease extension on that building um, for uh, particular reasons, I guess, uh, in the last uh, year or so, and that uh, the, uh, the the real estate department wanted the uh, uh, one of the terms of an extension of that lease would be to uh, abrogate that uh, clause um, uh, if this lease did not terminate. So I guess they're aware of it, but but it. it you know, possibly didn't get translated into this concept plan. Thank you for clarifying. Thank you. Great. Thank you, Councillor Hardwick. And that is it for your questions. And um, All right. thank you very much for, for taking the time to speak to Council. Well, thank you. Okay. Good night. Good night. Speaker 139, Tim Lewis. Speaker 139 is not on the line. Speaker 140, Jeff Berner. Hello? Uh, yes, Hello? We, we can hear you clearly. Go ahead. Oh, and do you mind? Oh, Hi. I just sort of, just before you do, I, um, uh, we, we see the title and organizations of people and I um, uh, on the list here. And I didn't, what does DSOV stand for? Sorry about that. Not the, clear. The Democratic Socialists of Vancouver. Okay, that's great. Okay, go yeah. ahead. Uh, you have up to five minutes to speak to council. Hi there. Uh, good to uh, good to be chatting with you. Some of you know me, and of course you know how I feel about you deeply. And uh, but I wanted to talk about this uh, plan for South Falls Creek. Uh, I was born here. My dad. Too. I'm a second generation Vancouverite, uh, and uh, I lived. I had the privilege to live in a co-op for some years, and uh, it, it was a beautiful experience. People were, it was, there was a real family atmosphere. And, uh, but uh, I just wanted to speak to an aspect of the, the plan uh, that I don't know if it's really been as, as like in detail covered. Um, listening to the voices of the people who are, who found out that their homes were going to be bulldozed um, in the news. <laughs> um, and, you know, watching the, the uh, editorial come out from the mayor, uh, basically saying, we're definitely going to get away with this. <laughs> and, and seeing all this, there's really like the pain of the people who are being told they must go because basically, well, let's go back in history and talk about the history of Vancouver as a city, seeing as how second generation here, my family's been here since the 40s. You know, basically Vancouver, the city of Vancouver has been run as a cheap real estate hustle uh, by technocrats and uh, for most of the history of the city. And, uh, but in the seventies, there was kind of like seventies, early eighties, there was like a little bit of a break where some of the things the city did weren't out of 
just cheap real estate hucksterism. You know, then we had Expo and everything went the way things are now. Jeff, which is... Jeff Berner, um, excuse <laughs> yes. me. Yes. Yeah. I have to caution I'm just, you. I'm just speaking. I'm just getting getting on to the to the point of what I'm saying, which is that I want to just talk I have to, about. I have to caution you, um, Jeff. Mm -hmm. to uh, yeah. to not we we have a procedural bylaw that makes it very clear that speakers should um, act with um, re and use respectful language um so right. so I would ask you to please uh, uh, follow that direction Absolutely. in our bylaws good thank you for that uh, reminder thank you so yes I was speaking about the, uh, the pain in the voices of the people who found out they were going to be have their homes bulldozed in the news. And I just wanted to say, I'm not going to stay on the line much longer, um, that there is a, a moral component to this plan, and that, that component is it is an evil plan. It is evil to drive people from their homes. That's an evil thing to do. And any of you who don't reject this plan on council or mayor, we are going to try to get you fired from your job next year. You should not have a job if you approve of this plan in any way. You don't deserve to be there. Thank you very much. Thank you. Speaker 141, Wendy Hurden. Hello? Yes, is that's Wendy Hurden? Yes, I'm here. Oh, good. Okay. Um, just speak a little bit more loudly would be good or closer to your mic and um, go ahead. You have up to five minutes. Okay. Hi. Uh, thank you, Councillor Carr. My name is Wendy Hurden and I am the president of the Falls Creek South Neighborhood Association. I'd like to begin by thanking staff for the many hours they have spent working on this report. And I'd like to thank the mayor and council for this opportunity to speak about the Falls Creek South Neighborhood Association and the report. The Falls Creek South Neighborhood Association is made up of representatives elected from each of the stratas, the co-ops, and the nonprofit housing enclaves located along Falls Creek South from Canby to Burrard Street. In the late 1970s, the city encouraged the creation of the Falls Creek South Neighborhood Association with a mandate to promote the interests of the new Falls Creek neighborhood, its residents, and the community as a whole. Since its inception, all of the Falls Creek South Neighborhood Association representatives have taken very seriously the duty to protect the values that have gone into making Falls Creek South a world-class community. The current Falls Creek South community consists one-third each of low, medium, and high-income residents, but the culture in Falls Creek South is that we all live as equals. This is not only made for a welcoming adult community, it is made for a wonderful place for our kids to grow up in. If you ask any of the kids who I knew who grew up in Falls Creek, they will tell you that they were in and out of each other's homes and grew up together. They were not divided by the wealth of their parents. The kids had the support of neighbors and friends, and they became successful members of society. Falls Creek South Neighborhood Association is very concerned that the implementation of this report will result not only in the destruction of our homes, but also the destruction of the relationships with the residents, which has made Falls Creek South a true community. We are concerned that when neighborhoods are isolated in pockets, whether by rich or by poor, we will all suffer by not understanding that we live in this world together. The report calls for the destruction of our homes long before the end of their life cycle. In the first phase of redevelopment, the report calls for the destruction of the co-ops and the nonprofit housing. The co-op communities have maintained their buildings by rain screening, putting on new roofs, as well as spending countless hours volunteering to keep their homes and their lands in good repair. Experts tell us that if these buildings continue to be maintained as they have been in the past, they should provide excellent housing for years to come. The values represented by the Falls Creek South Neighborhood Association have not only made Falls Creek South a successful community, they have also resulted in initiatives made by the Falls Creek South Neighborhood Association to make Vancouver a caring city. For example, when the federal government brought in Syrian refugee families to Canada, the Falls Creek South Neighborhood Association fundraised to support two families for their first year in Canada, finding housing, furniture, clothes, toys, providing English lessons, working with parents to find employment, childcare, and education for their families. 
We embrace these families as our own to help them successfully resettle in Vancouver. These families remain a part of the Fall Street community, and a few of our residents have taken on the permanent role of honorary grandparents. Here is another example. When the City Real Estate Department approached the Fall Street South Neighborhood Association and asked for our support in establishing temporary modular housing in our community, we agreed. The city had not had much previous success with other neighborhoods and when they, had, when they had attempted to install temporary modular housing into those neighborhoods. We took this challenge very seriously. We rallied our neighborhood to participate in the temporary modular housing initiative. We worked with the city to put together a plan that would make this a successful project, providing homes to people who were in need of housing. We continue to ensure that this temporary modular housing is a welcome and respected part of our neighborhood. The residents attend and participate in the neighborhood sponsored activities. The temporary module housing is a successful and welcome part of this community. The Fall Street South neighborhood does not wish to live in the past, but to make an even more successful future with the expansion of all tenures of housing, including housing which supports seniors aging in community. When in 2010, we saw the need to work with the city to renew the leases of all our housing tenures, we established replan as the planning committee of the Falls Creek South Neighborhood Association. We recognized the city was growing, that security of tenure was required and still is for current residents. We saw that as a neighborhood, we needed to expand to meet the needs of the existing community as well as a changing city. We've hosted countless workshops within the neighborhood with, res with residents contributing ideas as who knows and understands the community better than the people who reside in it. Uh, we have requested over the years to work collaboratively with the city to address these needs and requirements and grow in a fashion retaining the original design and plan. At this time, we request the council receive this report for information only, that our leases be renewed and community planning for Falls Creek South be undertaken in public, outside the frame of confidentiality, in full collaboration with the community and others by the city, by the city planning department, using well-established techniques for the neighborhood planning and public engagement. Falls Creek South has been a model community of mixed tenure housing, consisting of integrated low, medium, and high-income families, a okay. neighborhood admired around the world. And that, I'm um, sorry, Hello? Wendy, to interrupt you, but that is well over your time. Um, so. Oh, I, I just say you, we love our neighborhood and take pride in its success. Thank you. Great. Okay. Thank you very much for wrapping that quickly. Um, and uh, there are no questions. Let's thank you very much for taking the for your community work and for taking the time to speak to us tonight. Thank you. Uh, speaker 142, Joan Dublanco. Yes, I'm here. Can you hear me? Yes, very clearly. Go ahead. Up to five minutes. Okay. Yes, thank you, um, uh, Mayor and Council, um, for your service and your concern for the sustainability of the Falls Creek South community. I'm Joan DeBlanco, and after 40 years in Tofino, I moved to Falls Creek South seven years ago to help care for my new grandson, now in grade two. I was so impressed when the group of co-op neighbors and the neighbors from my Marine Muse Strata came out and welcomed me to the neighborhood. And soon I realized I was actually part of another village as supportive as the one that I left in Tofino. What a shock. I'm impressed and concur with the speakers who have articulated so well the strong, integrated, inclusive, and engaged community and their intelligent response to this proposal concept before council. It's a testament to the success of the 1970s process and planning and their vision. I think that the Fault South Creek conceptual plan is flawed in many ways and mostly because it does not have the benefit of all the stakeholders input. 30 years ago, I was a tourism rep for the Clackwood Sound land use planning process in Tofino. To be sustainable, the process included all other values than the traditional economic model of resource extraction from the land. All the stakeholders were at the table. We worked very hard, community, environment, indigenous leadership, which taught us to plan for the next seven generations. Economic development, tourism, parks, and government were all there. The hard work led to a balanced use and plan and vision that shaped the area and what Tofino is today. 
I see similar opportunities for the city to move ahead with an inclusive planning process to build a sustainable vision for the future of Fault South Creek. Of the many interests at the table, I would like to branch out and speak about the importance of the value in open space, low density, mature gardens, and nature to the many thousands who use our neighborhood as their go-to space. I'm outside a lot, especially with my grandson, and meet people from all through the Fault Creek South Basin and city at large. It's a diverse group with multiple uses of the Fault Creek South neighborhood. Many families and children are in the park in the berm. Many groups hang out on the, on the blanket for a picnic. And there are daily visitors and walkers, and they all value the open space, the less densified scale, the quiet, the garden, the friendly neighborhoods. The berm is a sound buffer, a playground in the woods. My grandson and his friends love it. Mature trees from the berm in our courtyards provide nesting grounds for many birds. Because I can talk to anyone, I've met people that use Fault South Creek on their long walk circuit. This city is full of walkers and nature lovers. It's a reprieve and an oasis nestled within an urban city core that is planned for extensive densification uh, with the Broadway line, the Molson property, and the Musqueam development. If this neighborhood is densified according to the proposed concept plan, there will be no modest scale historical community left. There will be no access for the residents of the Fault South Creek Basin and urban core to spend quality time outdoors in a friendly, quiet neighborhood. It will be flanked by six stories of concrete and glass apartments and the income mix and tenure that is a legacy is completely gone. It will be an unrecognizable area in 20 years with this plan, a great loss to the thousands who value its current vision and spaces to enjoy and relax in. The city can never produce more open space with the legacy of this community for all in the larger area to access and enjoy. I've also noticed different people um, <clears throat> coming to the community on tours, walking tours, this is a growing ecotourism attraction in the city. Vancouver could become the destination, not a jumping off point for cruise lines. The city needs to diversify the attractions and activities for the city and uh, its tourism activities. And communities like Fault Creek are a valuable asset to showcase the unique experiences in the neighborhoods of this city. I encourage council to reject motion A and B and bring planning into the many years of work already done by the neighborhood and the city. And they should, you should create a process including the information from the current conceptual plan along with replans simple plan and renew our leases. The long-term success of a plan is its inclusion of all the stakeholders and values balanced to secure a healthy and sustainable future for the South Fault Creek community. Thank you very much for listening and I really appreciate your dedication and uh, determination to work with us for a, a very valuable solution. Good night. Thank you very much for taking the time to speak to us. Um, there are no questions. That was very clear. So have a good night, too. Uh, Council, I've been informed by the clerks that we have four speakers um, on the line right now. Um, you can choose to uh, make a decision now to extend uh, to hear the remaining speakers or, oh, sorry, there's now seven. Okay. Uh, so uh, I will leave you to contemplate that. I'll go on to speakers. Uh, sorry, um, just put your mic, uh, put out. Sorry. Just a point of procedure. How many speakers total have not been heard, including if we were to go over the list one more time? 
Uh, knowing that anyone could join at any time. Last count was something like 40, but his clerk. Now there are 58 remaining who have not been heard. They either we've gone over them, they went there at the time, or still to go. They may come back. Yes. Okay. Thank you. <laughs> You're welcome. Okay, moving right along. Um, speaker 142, Joan Dublanco. Oh, I'm sorry. Yes, you're absolutely right. We just heard. Okay. Um, sorry. 143, Doug Zini. Yeah, hi there. Oh, great. We can, can you hear, hear you me? clearly. Yep, go ahead. Okay, great. Thank you. Thank you for the opportunity to address Council on this issue. I speak in opposition of the plan. My name is Doug Laney. I'm the President of the Board of Directors at Twin Rainbows Co-op. We're located in the False Creek South area near Granville Island and reside with gratitude on the unceded territories of the Musqueam, Tsleil-Waututh and Squamish people. At Twin Rainbows, we provide housing for more than 150 members within two seven-story tall buildings. It was pointed out earlier in the discussion by city staff that co-ops are required to keep our buildings in good condition as a condition of our lease with the city. At Twin Rainbows, we take our responsibility seriously and we've just completed an upgrade to the building envelopes at a cost of more than four and a half million dollars. With the many speakers that have come before me, I know you've heard my comment regarding the deficits contained in this plan. The lack of consideration for redeveloping existing housing prior to new development which is more affordable and has a lower environmental impact. Growth is inevitable. However, that growth should be managed by public policy that is established with civic participation and community collaboration, and not in secrecy by in-camera discussion. The renewal or extension of long-term leases should be completed immediately, as was determined by approved public policy 10 years ago, and should be informed by community plans. The co-op community has been personally impacted by the uncertainty and the anxiety that has been created as a result. Many of our members are seniors, low income and families of limited income who are vulnerable to inflated housing market conditions. I was born and raised in Langley and I've lived in the greater Vancouver area all of my life. My family and I have lived in our co-op for five years now. My wife and I have two daughters, ages eight and 12. Like most of our members, we have a limited income. I have no doubt in my mind that if we did not live in a co-op, we would have to leave Vancouver to live elsewhere. We simply could not afford to stay. For eight years, I lived in a tower in Yale Town. After all that time, when I moved on, I'd established a relationship with only a single other occupant. Co-op living, on the other hand, provides an experience of strong community, pride of place, and mutual responsibility for each other that is unique to any other housing circumstance. Both my daughters have their best friends living doors away. Living here is more affordable and accessible within a housing market that has become out of reach for most. Co-op living is a self-sustaining model that the city should be embracing, should support and be expanded upon. City Council has a great opportunity before you to take a successful award-winning design and make it better. To do so will require vision. This plan in its current form totally lacks that vision. I urge you to take this opportunity by rejecting this plan and replacing it with an open community planning process. Thank you. Uh, you do have questions? I do have questions. Um, Councillor DiGenova, go ahead with your questions. Oh, no, that was for my point of procedure. I can't take myself off. Uh, okay, no problem. Um, that's it. You, uh, there aren't any questions, but you're very clear, so thank you very much. Have a good evening. Um, speaker 144, Anne Grant. Oh, hello. Yes, we can hear can you. Can you hear me? Yes, very Yes, very okay, good. good. Okay, so my name is Anne Grant. Thank you for allowing me to speak to you. I'm speaking in opposition to the plan under consideration today. I'm over 80 years old. I've had the great good fortune to live in a housing co-op in Vancouver for over 40 years. For many of these years, I lived in this co-op with my husband and two children. Our children had the great good fortune to live in the security and companionship of the co-op from the time the oldest was seven years old. 
At present, I'm able to age safely in place. I have been and am still an active member in the co-op community and have had a number of different roles over the years. I have appreciated the companionship and challenges of community life and the efforts to live peacefully in a democratic and respectful situation. I want to underline that the co-op I live in is not in the False Creek, South Falls Creek area or part of the plan under consideration today. I'm not speaking today as a representative of my co-op, but as a private citizen. I feel very discouraged with what I've heard and read about this plan. I've listened to quite a few of the speakers who've come forward to speak to you last week and a lot today. I have Some have been very knowledgeable about the details of the plan and have spoken against the plan as professionals in the housing field. Many have talked very passionately and emotionally in opposition to the plan. I've heard this from young speakers who were brought up in co-ops in False Creek and from their parents and, in fact, people of all ages. I had hoped that our municipal government would take to heart the frequently voiced talk over the COVID months that we would build back better. I'm also very aware of the global threat of climate emergency that we are all living under. I believe, along with a great many others worldwide, that we must radically change how we do things if people are to survive with some decency worldwide. I also believe that housing is a fundamental human right. For all these reasons, I had hoped that at every level of government, we would act very quickly to do things differently. The present situation with housing in Canada and in Vancouver in particular is dire and unfair and does not respect housing as a human right. I truly hope that you have been who have been elected and have the power to make a difference now will have the courage to act outside the box and to take the power to make a real system change. We're lucky to live in one of the wealthiest countries in the world. We need to move beyond the old ways of doing things and the old emphasis and dependence on money and the market, the old economic system. We need to have the courage to change now before it's too late, both for those alive today and those yet to come. I feel I've been very lucky in my life and my housing, and all I can say is that what I have for myself, I wish for all. Thanks for listening. And uh, thank you very much. That was um, uh, very succinct and uh, well-spoken. Uh, there are no questions for you, but appreciate you coming to speak to us. So have a good evening. And that's moving on to one uh, one forty five, Sandy Dorkin. Uh, speaker one forty five is not on the line. Okay, Speaker one forty six, Andrea uh, Baxendale, uh, not on the line. Speaker 147, Evan um, Gensbauer. No, not on the line. 148 has withdrawn. Speaker 149, Nick Rogerman. Yes, I'm here. Can you hear me? Yes, we hear you clearly. Okay. Um, my wife and I are one of 669 leaseholders in Falls Creek South that is anxiously awaiting resolution of our lease extension so we can continue to live in a diverse, welcoming community. Residents of Vancouver since 1974, my wife and I raised three kids in Kitsilano and we downsized from a small house there to become owners at the Lagoons five years ago. We loved this community from afar, but once we moved in, it was even better than we had imagined. We walked the seawall or ride bikes daily and love the community vibe. We love our strata enclave and neighbors, have made fast friends, and love our gardens and lagoons, which are much photographed by tourists. One problem is that our condos are currently not being considered by young families as they are unable to get a mortgage because there's only 25 years left on our lease. And that's uh, the maximum of any um, lease uh, in 
current Falls Creek, as you're aware. If our leases could be extended, as has been promised now, young families would be able to get that mortgage and move into one of our 89 units when one of us sells or has to move into a care home. As a member of council at the Lagoons, I can assure you that we have a very active maintenance committee that stays on top of ongoing maintenance issues and refurbishment. At our strata, we are now getting to the point where a few major projects like new roofs and elevators are necessary. Owners are willing to fund these investments, but it would be more palatable if our leases got extended beyond uh, their current end. I believe that significant densification at Falls Creek South can be accomplished by filling in the empty green spaces with reasonable height buildings and by creating a mix of market housing and a wide range of affordable co-op and rental housing. We're very pleased to see that lease negotiations are promised to begin next month. Revenues generated from lease extensions could be used to help pay for some of the new non-market housing. We're very impressed with the vision and direction that replan presented to council in 2018. It was based on retaining the character of the originally planned model community. We look forward to transparent engagement and collaboration between replan and the city's planning department to develop a more dense but livable human scale community. Thank you for your time. Um, thank you for coming to speak to council. Um, that's uh, the, it, very important to obviously this whole process. You were very articulate um, and, and no questions. So uh, council, we probably have time for one more speaker um, unless there is a motion to extend. And oh, okay, Councillor Dominato, go ahead. Uh, thanks chair, I would move to extend to hear the remaining speakers on the line. Okay, is there a sec? Oh, you don't need a seconder. Um, so, uh, go ahead, Councillor Di Genova. Sorry, let me just let me just advance you. There we go. Go ahead. So right now, there's one speaker on the line, so we would I hear can, the one speaker. Um, no, I, I said there's only time for one more. Um, uh, clerk, Councillor, uh, just a second. I'm just going to check and answer your question, Clerk. How many are on the line? Um. Currently, we have five speakers on the line. Six. six speakers on the line. Yeah, six. That's, that's your that's your point. I'm sorry. That's parliamentary. I'm and, and I have another point of procedure. Go ahead. So the motion, as I understood it, and this is a question, was to hear the remaining speakers on the line. So that would be at the time of the motion, because I'm I'm not sure there could be 50, 60. We could be here until three in the morning. Um, depending on how many that's speakers fine. come you're, on, you're, so now, you're, now you're speaking yes. to him. Just this, so, so no that's my question. Procedure. How do we interpret um, that? So, Councillor Dominato, um, I'm just going to advance you and just mm, um, perhaps you can um, clarify. I, I didn't hear on the line. Was it the speakers on the line? I just heard remaining speakers. Uh, I said the remaining speakers on the line. Oh, you did on the line. Okay. Um, Clerk, is there any way to actually hold to the number of speakers? I mean, to just hear the remaining six speakers? Yep, we can. Okay, that's in order then. Um, so, council, um, staff do have a note of those six speakers. So, uh, I'm just going to put it to a vote. I'll start verbal. Um, we need a two-thirds vote to extend the meeting to listen to the speakers. Uh, those in favor, say aye. 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 Any opposed say nay? Nay. Okay, that's one, and that is um, not, I guess I could, I should probably go to an actual vote. Um, look, if you could take us to a vote for this, thank you. I don't have a voting screen.
Yes, got it. Hmm. Clerk, could you determine if that's... Oh, um, could I vote this, please, uh, Chair, uh, in favor? Okay. Thank you. Um, are you going to mark the clerk? Are you going to mark the mayor in favor, or do you want me to? Okay, so uh, that is that meets the threshold. So we are extending to hear those speakers. So I'm sorry, um, those in favor, that vote passes with three in opposition, Councillor Swanson, Hardwick, and Weave. Okay. Just one more point of procedure, Chair. I guess just a second. Go ahead. I'm thinking this information may not just benefit <coughs> myself, but also others who may be calling in because they missed their turn. Question? Yep. yep. Okay. Yes. Oh, okay. I, Point I just of didn't know if you had something else to say. Let me no, know when I can no, ask so you. The, I, I, was, I was trying <coughs> to ask a question, and last time you said I didn't explain it properly, so I'm trying to explain it okay. first. Okay, go um, ahead. My, my question is, is the speakers who uh, are on the rest of the list and where we pick up, pick up, we will come back to that and call through the list. Is that correct? Absolutely. Uh, it is required under our procedure bylaw that I call through the whole list again. Just wanted to make sure and thought it Anybody might be beneficial for the public. Yeah, Thank yeah. you. No problem. Okay. So we have Point a um, procedure, I guess, to the chair. The, um, yes. Go. So that's Councillor Weave, just one second. Yeah, I'm just wondering process-wise, some of those speakers might be waiting and so they won't be in proper order because they might have waited until their turn to call in. And so I'm just wondering, are we going to miss speakers that are now going to have to wait to the end of the conversation because they were going to call in to be on the list? Okay. If, I was a, if I was a caller, I would wait until I was a couple speakers away and then call in. And so I feel like we are There's only a by Kelsey, cutting it off. Yeah, Councilor Weave. Oh, I'm yeah. sorry. Okay, I will keep going. Yeah, Councilor Councilor Weave, the um, the clerks have informed me that there are six speakers mm -hmm. on the line. Um, they know who those six and they're not accepting any more speakers on the line. So we have we are just dealing with those six. Okay, I guess my question is, they're not this next six in a row, are they? There's probably a gap. No, there, there, there will be gaps, but that happens under normal process anyway, and I would pick up where the last speaker is, and then I would go to the end of the list, and then I would go back and read all of the names of speakers who were not present at the in, time that we went through. Yeah, but in normal process, someone would be able to call in once the speakers before them were able to speak. That's just my concern that we're not. But yeah. we'll keep going today. It, it, it sort of is the same, so that um, uh, under normal circumstances, when I move on to another speaker, and we're, we just keep going down the list from that. Sorry, I'm just going to confer with the clerk for one second. Okay, the clerks also informed me that um, they are going to be informing all of the speakers who missed their turn to speak to call in tomorrow. So um, we are now on, I'll go through the list as I'm going down, or, or actually if you've just got the six and that's all we're going to deal with, why don't you tell me what the numbers are, clerk? Um, the next speaker we have is speaker number um, 153. Great. Okay, that's Carol Evans. Hi, can you hear me? Yes, we hear you clearly. Go ahead to speak to council okay. for five minutes. Okay, um, I'm, I'm very disappointed, but anyway, my name is Carol Evans and I've been given the honor and privilege to introduce to you a video in which the children of the Fault Creek Co-op gathered together um, and on their own initiative, filmed interviews, then edited them and produced the video that you should have been seeing tonight. There was a mix up in getting it to you on time. Uh, I didn't have my number, whatever. And so the children really put their whole effort into it. And I wanna make that perfectly clear that they um, were, were amazing. Um, 
so the counselors, I believe, are going to be able to view that, but other people will not be able to. Uh, the children of Fault Creek are clearly illustrating their creative drive and their amazing determination to voice their own opposition to the city's report and recommendations. Again, I'm honored to present the video that was prepared uh, for you by the Children of Fault Creek Co-op. And um, so there's some minutes left and I'll, I, I just want to approach this from the point of view from my mind's eye as a third generation Vancouverite uh, the, where the family, my extended family, um, was from West Bend, North Bend, Point Grey, Marple, uh, many, 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 many drives back and forth across the city as a child in the back of the station wagon with two uh, other siblings. Uh, my parents were very young when they married, they eloped, and um, the drives across town were always filled with excitement for all of us because it meant that my mom and my dad shared stories about their parents, uh, other relatives and things about, you know, third beach, second beach, pitch beats, uh, taking the, the uh, train or the cable car, I forget what it was called, all, all the way out to New West and back and things like this, uh, going through Stanley Park and seeing the ferry castle on the top of a tree which was really just a big hole but um every there were stories all the way there and all the way back and i have to say that coming down canby street was one of my favorite times because we'd hit city hall and it'd be lit up and it'd be back by the view of vancouver and behind that you could actually see the mountain uh sable black gorgeous and the city of the lights sparkling at night and as a child i was so proud to be growing up there to be a Vancouverite. I, I can remember that feeling as a child, really being proud to, to of oh, Vancouver, of the city of Vancouver, skating on the Lost Lagoon, Beaver. It was, a, it was great. Um, city, you know, climate warming is changing all of that. Things are changing. A lot more people will be coming to Vancouver. Uh, but I live in Fault Creek. I'm in a co-op and I, we raised our children here and we couldn't have afforded to live in Vancouver. We were in family housing out at UBC. Uh, my husband got a job straight out of uh, architectural school. And um, thank goodness, because we got into a co-op or else we would have had to have left town and he wouldn't have been able to land that job. Uh, it meant I had to go back um, and do my degree in order to get into the co-op, which took another five years. But we did get in, and I'm really, really proud of being a co-op member. And I think there's a misconception by most Vancouverites about what co-ops really do for people. And I don't want to get into all of that right here because I think it's been explained over and over and over again. But low-income housing was started here. Uh, the, the, the land was nothing but a mud hole. I can remember driving along 6th Avenue in that station wagon. A big long fence all the way across Sixth Avenue. What's behind that, Dad? Oh, that's where uh, you know all the industrial land is and stuff. But on each corner, it was questionable about industrial land because there were people. It was not. It was not a good community. It was dangerous, it seemed, and uh, it scared me as a kid. So along comes the co-op, and a lot of people building down here on land that nobody else wanted to take on. And they've taken it on and they've done amazing work and I'm proud of that. And now what's happening? It's falling apart and it, it should not do that. It, it, you've got to really think this through. You've got to see that you don't just, where's the humanity in people putting 40 to 50 years of their lives into this community, into the properties, money well spent because they cared and because they're here as, as members of a really strong community. Yes, and that is it for your time, although you do have questions. Okay. So if you wouldn't mind staying okay. on the line. Um, I, okay. I am going to advance myself. I was on the, the list first. And um, 
I uh, just wanted to thank you, um, not only for coming, but um, for, for actually um, sending the video uh, to, mm -hmm. um, to all of us at council. I did in a break view it. Um, so oh, if, you could, if you could pass on my admiration and thanks to, I don't know if I've said these names right, but Orif, Frankie, Eleanor, mm -hmm. Rupert, Elise, Danny, Zoe. <laughs> they were pretty delightful. Yeah. Thank you. I'll tell them. Great. Thank you. Councillor Boyle. Thank you. Uh, yes, thanks. I also had a question about that. I haven't had a chance to watch the video, but as Count, as Chair Carr said, it was circulated and I have it open. I just was wondering um, to, for the uh, question for the speaker you mentioned, um, and I can appreciate the missed opportunity that the public won't see it. I, and I see on the YouTube link that it's unlisted. So I just wanted to check if it's helpful uh -huh. for it to be shared online so the public could yeah. find it uh, or yeah, it, I, I know there are always questions around um, video sharing video and images of children online. So I just wanted to check around those permissions with parents. And if so, I'm certainly happy to to share it so people could find it, but only with that uh, permission. That's a, that's a great suggestion and I'll completely follow that up. And find okay, out everything. happy. For, yeah. for you to let us know. In the meantime, we can okay. certainly watch it. Thank you. Okay. <laughs> Great. And that's those, it for you. Those your, are all of my questions. Thank, thanks, uh, Councillor Boyle. That's, that's it for your questions. And thank you for uh, staying up so late to, to present and getting that video to okay. us. Very much appreciate it. I appreciate it as well. Thank you and have a great evening. Yeah. Thank you. You too. Um, Bye. As, Good night. Um, speaker 154 is on the line. Matthew Ling. Hello. Hello. Matthew Ling, we heard you momentarily, but I can't hear you now. I'm here. Ah, okay. Hello, hello. Yes, there you, okay. Good. I'm there? Yes, I can hear you now. Go ahead to speak okay, to council. Great, thanks. Thank you guys. I'm going to speak kind of quick because I'm very grateful for the opportunity, but I appreciate it. So my name is Matthew Lang. I'm a father of three young children, a Vancouver healthcare provider and a resident board director and current treasurer of the False Creek Co-op. I am speaking in opposition to the real estate department's report on the future of False Creek South. In 1988, Crosby, Stills, Nash and Young wrote, this old house of ours is built on dreams and a businessman don't know what that means. There's a swing outside the kids play on every day and tomorrow morning a man from the bank is going to come and take it all away. Well, there isn't a bank in this story, but I think you get the idea. And I haven't told my children that you're coming. Unfortunately, the well-intentioned and forward-thinking actions taken by yourselves on July 8th to approve the revised lease renewal framework for co-ops did nothing to relieve the pervasive anxiety for the large group who represented False Creek South at those meetings. Instead, the anxiety has been compounded exponentially by Real Estate's report on the future of False Creek South. We are cut out of that lease renewal framework as we are targeted. Our homes, our lives, our histories are somewhat inconveniently placed on a prime piece of revenue generating real estate, the future of which has been hanging in the balance for over a year's worth of in-camera meetings and biased external industry consultations. I haven't told my children that you're coming to level our homes. Contrary to the damaging rhetoric put forward by city staff in early reports related to False Creek South co-ops and asset management, co-ops in the creek have worked hard to maintain our housing to high level of function and living standard. Our own co-op has undertaken three rounds of remediation with major capital costs totaling $21 million over the course of tenure, including a current $3 million envelope project. We contribute generous amounts annually to our replacement and capital reserves and have spent $2.3 million in the last 15 years on regular replacements. We have current building condition assessment and maintain our buildings, extending their duration of livability as any responsible homeowners would. They have a lot of time left. Tearing down buildings before the end of their natural useful life is not only an insult to the people who saved and paid for the maintenance of these assets, buildings that are more than just buildings, but also to the environment, future generations who depend on the prudent decisions we make today. An argument of timing and convenience for the demolition of the most affordable housing, which is that already built, isn't consistent with the greenest city in the world. It smacks of prioritizing the much higher proportion of money-making market housing that would be filling in the middle of the neighborhood in this report, as non-market housing is ghettoized to the periphery. I haven't told my children that you're coming to fracture our community. We have been here for over four decades, and our roots run deep. The current constellations of our homes and our existing footprints are an integral part of the makeup of our communities. It's part of how we build relationships, how we connect, how we support each other in times of crisis, and how we celebrate in times of joy. You cannot simply pick that up and move us around like pawns in a real-life version of Monopoly. My wife and I are frontline health care providers employed in the downtown east side. 
As such, I cannot overstate the critical nature of secure housing, mutual support, and interconnectivity as social determinants of health. We know from public health literature that societies and communities purposely designed to integrate across socioeconomic class, cultural background, familial constellation, and ability status fare better. There are fewer health disparities, higher quality of life, and ultimately greater savings of social and economic costs with a decreased requirement for acute health care interventions, criminal justice spending, and formal social support programming. False Creek South was designed this way on purpose with vision, sustainability, and intent. In contrast, a literal segregation of the neighborhood in order to maximize revenue above human well-being runs the risk of causing great harm. A poor wall set up along busy 6th Avenue says everything it needs to about the value of those with lower incomes, of those who prioritize housing as community over investment, and it quite literally can make people sick, increasing risk of respiratory and cardiovascular disease, elevated incidence of diabetes and cancers, accelerating neurologic and cognitive decline, and compromising mental health. In 2019, in the Canadian Journal of Public Health, Wick and Kazatsky wrote, housing models such as cooperative housing promote social inclusion and increase the perceived well-being and mental physical health of residents, particularly of seniors, and that studies of health impacts of co-ops show both mental and physical health benefits, including avoiding or delaying need for medical care through neighbour support, increasing mental stimulation through community involvement, and increasing feelings of advocacy and self-esteem that come with helping other community members. Since the 90s, in conversations with the City of Vancouver, co-ops and False Creek Self have expressed our clear and emphatic desire desire to welcome more people into our neighborhoods. We've held innumerable internal and community workshops to begin the visioning process. We have offered to share our early visions to welcome true, meaningful partnership with the city and other stakeholders in planning the next phase of the future of Falls Creek South. We have tremendous capacity and boundless energy. Take this report as information only. Establish prompt lease extensions that allow for material financing for ongoing asset management for leasees so that they can be fulsome public and transparent community planning processes by the rightful stewards in the planning department. And I implore you, be bold, be visionaries, set precedent for North America, trust the work we have done in False Creek South for decades to deliver highly secure, socially cohesive and deeply affordable housing, establish 99-year rolling leases with non-market housing in False Creek South, support the existing co-op and non-market housing community to grow beyond our current proportions and invest now in the future of Vancouver's affordability beyond the bounds of this neighbourhood alone. Help us protect the neighbourhood as we grow together. I haven't told my children that you're coming to take it all away. Please don't make me. Hey, thank you very much. I, I see you spoke very quickly and got done. <laughs> that was a very, very um, succinct and, and uh, um, a good statement. Thank you. Um, and uh, no questions for you. Speaker 155 is on the line, I believe. Vladimir um, Milnikov. Yes, hello. Yes, we can hear hello. you. We can hear you. Go hello, ahead. Hello, you can hear Hello, my name is Vladimir Melnikov. I live in False Creek Housing Co-op, and I'm a member of Financial Committee for the past 20 years of this co-op. I've been living in the co-op for past 20 years. So, what is False Creek Housing Co-op? Is it a low-income housing project? Nope. Is it a middle-income housing project? Yes, I would say so. Is it a mixed income project? Yes. Is it a nice place to live? Yes. Is it a not-for-profit enterprise incorporated according to the Co-op uh, Act of British Columbia and self-sustainable? Yes, for sure. But are those the reasons why I've been living here for 20 years? Not really. So what is the reason? The reason is the old English phrase. You need a village to raise the child. And this is what our Co-op is. It is the village. Me and my family moved in that co-op for 20, 20 years ago. Our daughter was six years old. She was grown up in this six months, sorry, six months old. She was, she was grown in this co-op. We didn't grow her. The co-op grew it. And when we talk about parents here, well, I was, after several years, I was telling them, no, nah, you know, that's not my daughter. That's not your children. That's all our children. We grow them together. And we have formal, informal, and formal child care. Moreover, our false Creek co-op parents and kids provide formal and informal child care for the whole South False Creek area. What does that mean? That means it's a very family-oriented community, of course. So the word out is the False Creek co-op is a very nice place to grow the children, thus it is very attractive to young families. Who are those families or who are those parents? The parents work 
a lot of those parents work in Broadway medical districts, nurses at Vancouver General Hospital, lab technicians, x-ray technicians, physiotherapists, and always have one or two resident, young resident doctors, maybe emergency or physicians with young families, maybe three children, lots of student deaths, and they are very well, and they're very welcome, and they're very happy to have that place because otherwise, they might not get the chance to be a resident at the JH. And now what is happening? Now I'm speaking against your proposal, this place, because the village is going to be destroyed. It's going to be erased, and the villages are to be moved to building. Well, there will be no village then, because it never happens like that. So according to the plan, there is a building. That will be building, and that's probably what I will call a housing project, which is not really child-oriented because the unique design of our co-op, low-rise townhouses forming a circle or a square with nice courtyard inside. So that's a very, this are probably a 2,000-year-old design for family-oriented community. You can call it a tribe. You can call it a family. And thus, uh, those families would not like to live here. And the previous speaker, which is our president and a healthcare worker, also our treasurer, also expressed very much concern. So I wouldn't like to live in this building, uh, in, in this building, if I may have a young family 14 years ago. So that's what does that mean? That means a loss of essential workers, all those medical health professionals who have police officers. And again, X-ray technicians, maybe 100 essential workers will be lost for the city of Vancouver. Is it important? It's up to the council to decide. But those are not only those middle or you know, maybe higher income essential health workers. You go to Granville Island, you have all, uh, you, you go to the butcher. The butcher is my neighbor. You go to donuts. The very famous Lee Donuts shop is now what famous. Big secret. Those donuts made by Kitsilana Secondary High School students. They live in hope because, excuse me, you cannot afford living in the city and working around the store for even if you make what more than more than minimum wage, like eighteen dollars per hour, with those cents. So, <clears throat> what is really important? But that's all. Even if this building will new building will be built, so as the member of finance committee, I have a great concern that even this new building for co-op housing will not be built. It's very expensive, a lot of money. You need to find an uh, agency who will develop that stuff, build it, build it, and who will maintain it. Usually also an agency. The agency will be BC Housing. That's a money-losing project because our co-op is self-sustainable all the time. Now, BC Housing projects are, uh, uh, have operational deficits, so they always have to be maintained at taxpayer expenses. So I really encourage the council to consider and take us as partners. Again, you will give us the lease. We'll give you housing for essential workers. That's my five minutes. Thank you. That was absolutely bang on five minutes. <laughs> Good timing. Um, thank you very much for your presentation and, and uh, the you know, care you've taken to speak to council tonight. Um, we are moving on to speaker 156, Sarah Stevens. Sarah Stevens, are you on the line? I am. Can you hear me? Yeah, we can hear you just just perfectly. Go ahead. Up to five minutes. Great. Thank you. Uh, first, I want to begin by saying saying thank you to the staff, to council, and the mayor. I uh, admire the stamina of all of you. Uh, my name is Sarah Stevens. I am a historian. I have a PhD in architectural and urban design history, and I am an associate professor at UBC in the School of Architecture and Landscape Architecture, and the former chair of its urban design program. I've studied cities all over North America and beyond, and I can't think of another case of a community with such, such a successful and powerful legacy of using good urban design to weave together market and non-market housing to reach a true mix of low, middle, and upper income folks as at False Creek South. This is also my neighborhood. I chose to move here because I know its legacy and its importance in the history. I'm a member of the Strata Leaseholders Association. And since moving here, I have really come to love this place because of the people who make it a community. The legacy of this neighborhood is in jeopardy if this conceptual development plan becomes the basis for future replanning of the neighborhood. I think that the physical planning in this report does not live up to its original vision. Currently, the neighborhood delicately weaves clusters of housing at different income, le income levels into a cohesive quilt. It balances built space with green space, 
encourages walking and cycling and transit over cars. The plan in the report divides the non-market housing from the market rate housing so that those of higher incomes get, to lo get the lovely water views and those in the non-market housing are shunted along a busy and unpleasant arterial. But let's say this is not about the physical planning and instead about the process and the bottom line. The process too, I think has been problematic. First, by putting the real estate department in charge and not those with expertise in city planning. And second, by excluding the residents of this neighborhood from the in-camera discussions of the future of their home. And discussions of the bottom line for the future here have been limited to a private market mindset about how much capital can be extracted from the site rather than thinking holistically about what benefits this place offers to current and future generations of residents. However, just because I see doom in this report, I am not a NIMBY, I am a YIMBY. I believe that this neighborhood has the potential to add density and to move into a future that can help reduce economic inequality, push back against the affordability crisis, and do so in a way that honors the original vision for this place. In fact, students at UBC's urban design program presented these ideas, their ideas on this future to council in November of 2019 and showed a variety of ways to achieve greater density while maintaining that original vision. So tonight I'm here to request that the council receive the report for information while not delaying the lease, ne lease uh, negotiation extensions. This way there can be a full and more transparent community planning process that it's framing is, and that it's framing is not led by the perspective of a consultant or real estate services. All the heart and the passion that you've heard from so many of the speakers, I think, calls for this. The report as it stands presents a vision for the future of the neighborhood that I think is driven too narrowly by a measure of return on investment that follows standard development pro formas to copy and paste what I think is bad and highly inequitable urbanism here. I believe that a co-design process needs to be led by the planning department. This is not to shirk the city's important fiduciary responsibilities, but to recognize that the challenges facing our city and its future for coming generations will depend on this council enabling community members and planners to create the equitable, inclusive, and sustainable city that we deserve. The future of co-op and non-market housing is key to the neighborhood's future. Let's build more housing here, but let's consider a future marked by climate change and growing inequality and use this neighborhood to protect the affordable housing we have and to build on its success. Thank you all for your time today. Uh, thank you. And you, if you don't mind staying on the line, you do have um, uh, questions from Councillor Hardwick. Go ahead, Councillor Hardwick. Thank you uh, for recognizing the legacy as you've described. You said at the end of your comments to build more housing here. To build more housing here, how? I think that there needs to be more uh, non-market housing. Um, as far as how, I think that it needs to be led by a community uh, co-design planning process that the, that the planning department leads. So I don't think that we're at the point that we can decide exactly what that's going to be, but I think it needs to go through the right process, which is going to take time. In keeping with the legacy. Definitely in keeping with the legacy. I think that the mix of low, middle, and upper income that the original vision called for, and it's one-third, 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 is the piece that we really need to keep. Thank you very much. Great. Thank and you. Thank you, Councillor Hardwick. Um, and that is it for your questions. Thank you very much for staying up and uh, speaking to us tonight. Very much appreciated. So we're moving on to speaker uh, 157, Sue Harvey. Sue Harvey, are you on the line? Yes, I am. Can you hear me? Yeah, we can hear you just fine. Go ahead up to five minutes. Okay, thank you very much, Chair Carr, Mayor and Council. My name is Sue Harvey, and I, along with my husband, Bert Taylor, are two of your Strata leaseholders. Thank you for the opportunity to speak to Council this evening, and I also wanted to acknowledge the work done by staff and the consultants in setting out the challenges of this Rubik's Cube. And the report certainly highlights quite a number of these challenges. I'll start with a concept plan, which we believe prematurely sets out a single option for the future of South Falls Creek, done without the benefit of the city's normal planning process, Instead of the concept plan informing the planning process as set out in recommendation A, we respectfully suggest the planning process should inform real estate's concept plan. We believe the plan for the future of South Falls Creek should be done as it is in every other community through a collaborative community process led by the planning department and culminating in a renewed official development plan. Please receive the concept plan for information to be considered and refined in the context of that process. 
Secondly, I'd like to speak to the strata lease extensions. We believe council needs to set a clear and significant renewal term, 39 years as recommended in the simple plan. The concept plan before you today shows strata buildings being replaced starting after 2040. If you accept this plan and that premise, then the strata lease extensions contemplated must be pretty short indeed as our current lease end is 2040. This implied short lease extension will do nothing to stabilize the market, to enable stratas to finance repairs, to give security to your leaseholders. It will continue the graying of our community as younger people and families who need a mortgage will continue to be shut out of what could and should be affordable home ownership, which is a pretty rare opportunity in Vancouver. In fact, ongoing lease and uncertainty could actually undermine the future development in South Falls Creek. You have before you a concept plan predicated on selling strata leasehold properties in order to pay for the affordable housing sites for the infrastructure and amenities. And if this and the model, if negotiated in a timely manner and in good faith, could well be as successful as it was in the 70s. But if new strata units come on sale while current leaseholders are still living with lease and uncertainty, or worse, are in a protracted legal dispute with the city, then one needs to wonder who's going to purchase a new strata leasehold from the city. But let's not go there. Instead, let's just get on with the 39-year strata lease extension and get it settled now. The Strata Leaseholders Society have invested countless hours preparing to negotiate with the city. They're ready, willing, and able to get it done. And we're heartened to learn that after nearly 10 years of waiting and hoping, a first meeting has just been scheduled. Although we're Strata Leaseholders, we're even more distressed by what the concept plan would mean for our non-market and co-op neighbours. Last week, a neighbour asked me to explain the concept plan. And looking out her window, she said, which of the buildings I see now will still be here in 2040? Sadly and shockingly, my answer was nothing. All our neighbours gone. And in their place, after many years of demolition, soil remediation and construction, will be new, much denser buildings. And like all our neighbours you've heard tonight and in previous days, we're not against densification. However, we believe where, how much and how it's phased in is more appropriately decided through the community planning process. What we are against is the wholesale demolition and replacement of most, if not all, of the existing co-op and non-market buildings. Prematurely bulldozing sites is wasteful, and many speakers before me have spoken eloquently, eloquently to the cost and the waste. I do want to talk about the very real human cost to very real people, my neighbours. Over the decades, your co-op and non-market tenants have honoured their side of their lease agreements, and they've contributed enormously to this community. Surely they deserve the same opportunity as we strata leaseholders, the opportunity to renew their leases. At the very least, the community deserves the opportunity to work towards that goal, to work with city staff, the co-op federation, BC non-market housing, senior governments, to find a viable solution, to explore the potential for the revitalization of their existing buildings before their homes are targeted for demolition and replacement. This is a community with smart and dedicated people. Please give them a chance. Please don't make them the collateral damage to the city's opportunity cost. In summary, we urge council to amend the motions before you in order to address these key issues and to set the framework for productive processes going forward. Please direct staff to restart the planning process. Please receive the concept plan for information to be considered in the context of that planning process. Direct staff to negotiate a 39-year strata lease extension. Reject plans to demolish, relocate, and replace current co-ops and non-market housing and allowing for viable in-situ options to be developed. And commit to a transparent, timely, and collaborative process with clear milestones for progress. Thank you for your time and consideration. And thank you for um, staying up and, uh, and presenting to us. We really appreciate it. There are no questions. It was all very clear. Um, so have a good evening. Thank you. You too. And finally, um, Speaker 159, Nathan Edelson. Thank you, Councillor, uh, for this opportunity to speak on the unceded land of the Coast Salish people. As some of you may know, I was on city staff for 25 years. Prior to that, I was the founding executive director of Little Mountain Neighborhood House. This was a project initiated by a young planner named Larry Beasley. We shared a storefront that was crowded almost every day with residents, business people, and service providers from all different interests. I learned that if done properly and patiently, the community planning can be a base for community building. At the city, I led the team for what evolved to become Collingwood Village, and went on to lead the implementation of the Yale Town Plan. I was also the senior planner for the downtown east side, where historic areas were given incentives to retain their lower densities immediately adjacent to the central business district. I'm saying this because I've had experience with high density development, but I know, as you do, 
that it needs to be done for the right reasons at the right time and in the right way. This plan covers none of that. Falls Creek South has been an internationally recognized model as a highly livable mixed income community. It is an amazing achievement of the three levels of government, imagine that, working together with the private sector and with broad community engagement. As you have heard from speaker after speaker, the details of design make it challenging to distinguish condos from co-ops, and parking, courtyards, and entrances were designed to make it easy for neighbors to meet and help one another. The city also required the formation of a neighborhood association with elected representatives. And as you have witnessed, this association very much still embodies the spirit of community building. Unfortunately, not enough thought was given to what would take place toward the end of leases. It is becoming increasingly challenging, as you've heard, for housing enclaves to plan and borrow funds for ongoing building renovations, for moderate income workers to purchase homes, and lease end value uh, due to, that is due to stratas remains uncertain. In addition, staff have produced several reports, and I'm just gonna list two of them, that have been what might be termed evidence challenged. To quote the former city manager, if it's okay to quote him, the building condition study was, quote, a misstep. It underestimated by many decades the amount of time existing buildings could be maintained in a cost-effective and environmentally sustainable way. And the demographic data presented to the public and council, even in a citywide survey as well as in the reports, combined the higher income and older freehold residents with the people leasing on city lands. The Falls Creek South Neighborhood Association has worked for more than a decade, as you've heard, not only to secure leases for existing residents, but to plan for the, ch for the changes that are needed to address some of the important local and citywide issues for today. This could be a model for many neighborhoods as we enter into city plan. Their plan calls for new development that begins on vacant lands, redeveloping existing housing over time, a major project for aging and community, a 200-bed modern care facility, and seniors housing offering an array of services, freeing up house, homes of empty nesters for young families with children, affordable workforce housing near the SkyTrain station, permanent housing and services for the homeless, housing designed with and for recent immigrants, refugees, and indigenous people. This was what we were on the verge of, of initiating in 2018 when we agreed by mutual, in a public setting by mutual agreement to put the plan on hold so we could address the leases. Not one lease has been signed. And to design new development in ways that enhance rather than fundamentally change the neighbor's highly livable and socially integrated character. And a point of clarification, the community's plan does not call for demolishing the berm. It considers an option of using a small portion of the eastern edge to expand affordable housing where Heather Street might cross 6th Avenue. But the starting point must be security of tenure for existing residents. This is not an abstraction, it's an urgent need. One co-op has a lease that expires at the end of this year. No enclaves can qualify for long-term affordable mortgages for renovations or for purchasing stratas. And I'm gonna wrap up, but I just wanna mention some people. Tom Armstrong, Jill Atke, Larry Beasley, Trish French, now Sue Harvey, Scott Hine, Jeanette Lavach, Rhonda Howard, and by implication, Burke Taylor, and many others have spoken out publicly recommending council receive the consultant report for information and to use well-established techniques so the planning department can carry out a community plan in partnership with a stewardship committee, ideally including at least one and possibly two members of council. This is an important project. All departments, including real estate, can provide relevant information to help ensure the plan is financially viable and meets an array of city objectives. In doing this, you will be continuing and enhancing traditions that have made False Creek South and planning in Vancouver world models for which we can all be proud. Thank you very much. Yes, uh, thank you. And uh, you do have questions, if you wouldn't mind staying on the line. Councillor Hardwick, go ahead for up to three minutes. Hi, Nathan. I wish we weren't doing this at 10.34, uh, but rather tomorrow, since we're here. Um, in the plan that you were working with up until 2018, the simple plan, uh, how many uh, units or how, how 
I, I, we've heard about tripling the density with this current plant. How many more units would have been uh, added in that scenario? Uh, this would have called for between a million and two million more square feet. And of course, it's a negotiation. If you go into a negotiation of this sort, we're not going to say we can put in 10, you know, 10 million square feet. We're going to work it out and make sure that the that essential features, and this includes the courtyards, like if you, we take it for granted, but look at the courtyards on some of the co-ops and the uh, other housing that's right near one of the busiest tourist attractions in the world, and certainly in ca Canada, right within a few feet of that, we have children playing under the watchful eyes of parents and neighbors. That's an incredible achievement, and unless we can change the angle of the sun, we can only go up so high and keep that high level of, of, of livability for, for families. But the community and the community leaders, we have a number of people with a lot of planning expertise uh, to answer uh, um, Councillor Kirby Young's question, and they work really well uh, with, with the planning department staff. As a matter of fact, it was almost a tearful uh, moment for everybody when we said, let's put this on hold so we can get the leases done. We figured about a year later we'd be back at the plan because everybody was raring to go, including engineering staff, park staff, and others who really wanted to see how can we pr improve on the perfection that we've inherited that is Folks Creek South. What do you think, you know, your recommendation again was uh, receive the report. What can receive you just bullet the, point it really quick? Ideas in there, uh, but it should never be the basis of a plan. A plan emerges from the soil. It emerges from the residents who've lived there, from their neighbors, from some of the citywide organizations. And I would suggest that uh, some of the, you have an incredible council actually. I, I know it's controversial to say that. But we have a lot of experience on this council for one or two councillors to roll up their sleeves and become partners in this, not to drive it, but to witness it and to share ideas and to get ideas back and forth between council and emerging community. To me, that would make much more sense given how outstanding the original development is and that it, they still left us some significant opportunities to improve on perfection. I think it's pretty telling that the uh, development, the, uh, the, the long-term planning community is still very much behind this. Yes, and you are out of time, Councillor Hardwick. Great. Thank you. Councillor Kirby Young. Yeah, thank you. I, I have a, here's, here's a question. This is what we're hearing a lot of. Do you think that if this had not come forward from real estate, and had come forward as a planning exercise with the community engagement process, which is recommends the next step. But if we had started there, that we'd be having a really different conversation right now. Oh, absolutely. And and this is the part, you know, I I've looked over. I, I honestly think that some of the councillors would get excited about some parts of the process and should be part of it, even just to witness it, because the the level of excitement when you have. I've never quite seen this before. When uh, uh, about a year into after we stopped working with the planning department, we held uh, Graham McGarva and Scott Hine, the former senior urban designer at the planning, led programs where we had 200 people attending, and there were questions and energy in the room. And at the end of the day, we, we made a few changes, but basically the community was supporting the first steps in a plan. This is not going to be a hard uh, a, a hard process. Can I jump in with another question? I mean, would you agree also that it's more complex and that there was more latitude to when you were creating and basically transforming something from industrial to create a new community than when you have an existing community, that it does provide a different context? It does, but I, I was telling one, one of the counselors, it almost seems to me, and I'll, I'll say this with respect, but a bit of humor, if I were going to do a parody of a plan, I would put up something like, let's tear down all the existing uh, affordable housing decades uh, before they need to be and before we have funds to replace them. That's not the way we do a plan. We do a plan by really surveying what people enjoy about the neighborhood, what they need, and also looking at citywide issues and how can this continue to be a model where we could be developing similar medium density uh, I, yeah. neighborhoods. 
Yeah, I'm so, and I'm sorry to be quick. I just want to get a few questions in and we're so limited for time. The other question that I have that I don't think we spent any time on, and I actually really stands out for me as a former park board commissioner, and we had a speaker earlier who said they were involved with the Olympic Village and the design. And one thing that stands out for me is the lack of green space in that community. Because even the space that was slated for school is going to be transformed and the community had used it. And a lot of people thought that was green space, even though it was in the plan. I actually, do you think that it's actually a really important part that Charleston Park has protected and it's a positive that there's a proposed expansion of the park, like just conceptually in terms of protecting green space for livability? You have about 13 seconds, Nathan. Okay. The answer is yes and no. <laughs> uh, that we need to really look at where do we actually need green space that would be used by different parts of the community. I'm not sure expanding Charleston Park is the best use of that limited resource, but I, uh, but, but I think that that's part of what a community dis d discusses and reviews options and reviews it with the park board and uh, and uh, and council. And that's it for your time, Councillor Kirby Young. And um, thank you for your questions. And thank you very much, Nathan, for staying up late um, and uh, presenting to us and answering all those questions. Really appreciate it. If I can thank Council, because I know that a lot of hard work has gone into this, but I think you would really benefit from allowing the community to work with your staff in planning and in other departments. And yeah, okay. Thank <laughs> I really have to be fair to all speakers, Nathan, but thank you very much. Okay, Council, that is the end of the list. I want to thank the speakers um, uh, and definitely thank all of you for your patience and being here and thank the staff. I, I do want to give a special thanks to David Yim, who is a city staff person who we didn't have Talos on board and he managed the speakers on this and I think um, congratulations to him. He did a good job on on that. Um, so this standing committee is now recessed. It will reconvene tomorrow, Wednesday, October 27th, 2021 at 3 p.m. Thanks everyone. Have a good night. Thanks everyone. Thanks, Chair.